minds of Corman's monograph of the poetry of Russian realism because it doesn't say that. All right, we're not going to, we, we, we will probably circle back to time away from the woman poet to discuss his paper. I'd be very offended. <laughs> not going to do that. We're definitely not going to go there. On that note, Sibyl and Horn, we'll start us off. Um, and we have two papers today. Welcome, everybody. Welcome back. Thank you very much. I, of course, uh, want to thank Kathy and Stephanie and Luba for the invitation to participate in this anthology. When I uh, applied to Swarthmore College for the position I now hold. The advertisement wanted someone who worked on women writers in poetry. And I thought, this is perfect. I wrote my dissertation on Swarthmore. I have, a, I have once gotten to teach a course on women writers the whole time I've been there. And I do all kinds of other things I love to do, but it's such a pleasure to be able to return to the thing I actually made a focused study of. But I do want to apologize for the typos for the rough state of my draft. I had COVID in July, which is long enough ago that I should have been perfectly normal, but uh, suffered from having done all my reading and taken notes and not started writing. And, uh, and the semester began and you can all imagine. So uh, the good thing about this is that because the paper is so rough, I will not be offended by major suggestions. And in, indeed the second part where things fall apart, um, in the Soviet period and then the post-Soviet period is, is open wide to taking a golf club and just knocking out any poets who seem inappropriate for what's going on there. I was surprised at first to see the woman poet listed among the acts or performances since sex is one of the things that until recently at least we least got to choose and the assumption that um, a woman writing poetry in Russian was this special very marked thing. And yet I think the choice to write as a woman and the choice to be a poet are both acts in their own way. And a lot of the discussion yesterday focused on what happens when you read a poem out loud, what happens when you publish a poem, and it becomes in a way like a reading out loud. So in that sense, I think quite appropriate that for a woman even to write poetry and have it get out becomes much more of a performance, um, even in periods where poetry is the favorite genre. So, um, I want to work in the fact, and I have a tiny bit, that hardly anyone was game to say that they were a specifically woman poet or to nod to feminism until very recently. Is it because feminism still, after the Soviet period, is regarded as bourgeois? Is it because it seems like too much of a political stance to take when, in fact, you're writing poetry and you don't feel that politics are what you want to do? Is it that, indeed, Soviets disapproved and denigrated um, feminism as something that wasn't necessary any longer. And it's definitely true that when you get to the Soviet period, many more women are writing poetry, many more women without the same sense of violating taboos. I didn't quote Bilinsky in this because I quoted Bilinsky um, in a little introduction I did to a translation of um uneven marriage, unequal marriage. But he states very clearly that for a woman to be broadcasting her feelings through publishing is making her a kind of public woman. Right? But um, I think also the post-Soviet feeling that gender equality has been a cheat. And so that's something that I think needs to be addressed more clearly than I have done so. And also telling that there's a huge choice of women poets in the later Soviet period, even more now. I think it's not just that the past has been winnowed for us already by criticism and by how the later poets have chosen their influences and choosing their influences very commonly choosing precisely the women poets. So Tsvetaeva writes about how she learns some things from Tatiana's speech in Yevgenia Nyevian, Pushkin's tremendously important to her, but so is Ostapshila at a certain period. You get a certain passionate, um, overdoing that is typical of reception as well and gets folded into the mature Tsvetaeva linked to a sense that by writing poetry she's somehow violating taboos and then on the other hand admitting all along putting forward the fact that she reads Pablo and that Pablo is important to her. So um, Mikhail Makiev's chapter makes clear and I hadn't had time to read his chapter until like two days ago makes clear that I need to foreground the role of the salon in the 19th century, as well as in the early 20th century. So the idea that the salon, which in transformed ways, even in the Soviet period where you're reading for friends, you know that if you go to a certain person's apartment, it can't be a real salon because there's not enough room. 
but you can be there and we hear people reading for friends. And often we discover the reading for friends when somebody from that group of friends uh, denounces the person who read the poem. But the fact that the salon is kind of a semi-public place and a semi-private place, a place where somewhat it was okay for a woman poet to read her work out loud, even though they're constantly being attacked for doing so or denigrated in memoirs for, for uh, greeting an arrival who was respected and, and much awaited with the show of erudition that was ridiculous in a woman. Um, I also think I need to emphasize the role of Western scholars, and this is clear in my bibliography, but Anglo-American, French, Finnish, German, to a lesser extent, but somewhat Eastern European scholars who have been looking at women poets on purpose since they had been written out consciously or not on purpose. But again, I think, why should we have to argue for their importance in terms of the Soviet and then Russian poetry canon and poetry scholarship canon, when the later women poets, in fact, are the ones who are connecting them to the mainstream. And finally, uh, again, Mikhail Makiev, I, I wrote this below, so I didn't get to it. I need to mention Kwasinskaya, who wrote and published poetry, but concentrated on prose to make money, and who is quite parallel to some of the figures he was discussing, except that she doesn't get counted because she wasn't considered part of their circle by them, by later critics, by herself. Not so sure. I stayed in the provinces for too long. So those were the things I wanted to open with. But I look forward to suggestions and comments. Great. <laughs> also, this is just damned well going to be a political paper. <laughs> One of the things I was thinking about when I read your paper similar was how we had been talking about the volume and why do it right now? Well, of course, right now and then, <laughs> COVID before. Mm -hmm. But um, we were just thinking about how it might be interesting to look back at the tradition from this moment of you know a very rich emergent poetic culture. Mm -hmm. And within that poetic culture, women are extremely active, if not, you know, the most significant figure. So it occurred to me, similar that it might actually shift the whole discussion and the tone of it as well. Although it's it's your tone, and I'm you know open for us to comment on, but to look at the tradition from this moment of unbelievable achievement and, and excitement in the area of work by women poets. Mm -hmm. um, that, that was just a thought I had reading it. It's not at all. Yeah, yeah. One thing I could respond is comments from uh, scholars who worked on the 18 late 1830s and 1840s, that it was possible for us to get the kind of cachet that she did, kind of surprisingly for us reading now, I have to say, I, I share with many other people who've read a Subchina a puzzlement that she had such a renome as a poet. Mm -hmm. It's not bad stuff, but it's definitely not. But that, that happened because poetry was losing its status. Is this happening today because poetry has lost much of its status. That was argued in the 90s, at least, that everybody's looking for economic benefit. The intelligentsia has fallen apart. It's embarrassing to say you're into the young. Therefore, there's no, hmm, I'm overstating to say there's no benefit to chasing the women out of the field of poetry because what's to gain by being in it? So that's very polemical and overstated, but it kind of explains the tone that I need to it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> But it might still be, um, I have I'm so glad yeah. Kathy remembered that we had this conversation since I've totally forgotten, but I think it still might be a really interesting strategy to foreground the present moment mm -hmm. as your point of departure. Mm -hmm. um, I, I mean, I think we all meant to writing these essays with a different sort of mindset of maybe we had a conversation yesterday about who's the intended audience, but mm -hmm. I think we all have different set of expectations about what a handbook essay should be and how much should be information, how much should be setting the record straight. And it seemed to me that your essay in particular was really invested in, let's, let's get this stuff out. Who are these people? That, and 
and the, having seen it like that, it makes me wonder if that kind of chronological movement actually serves the goal um, as well as something else. So that the same kind of argument that we want to make might be actually strengthened, not by here's the sequence, here's what could be and should be in the canon, uh, but how does the how does this whole thing look if we look from a point of view where women have this position of strength? And, and I would want to um, argue, I think, a little bit with the way you just characterize the presence as, you know, poetry doesn't matter, so why not let the women in? It, it, on the contrary, it feels like, I mean, each of, <laughs> what happens on Facebook, the stakes couldn't be higher. Um, and I think to their credit, women poets have simply taken the space. Mm -hmm. They have occupied the mm -hmm. space. And an, a large number of their male peers have acknowledged mm -hmm. the significance of that and the strength of the contribution. So I don't know. I, I think have these ideas. Mm -hmm. I, I'm sorry to go on. I, mean, I, I wonder, I mean, it's a, <clears throat> an issue in several of the papers people we'll talked about today, including mine, but um, there, there are no examples of poetry in this mm -hmm. chapter. Yes. And it seems to me maybe one could go a little less on the sort of encyclopedic quality mm -hmm. that yes. might produce actual mm -hmm. examples of poetry that might be, um, mm -hmm. you know, one can't talk about them at great length, obviously, but it would, um, I think, yeah. I think be a, a useful position rather than speaking. No, just absolutely. Completely yeah. I meant to, them. I meant to add. Yeah. But to, presumably to, to do that, it's something that's going to have to be taken out. Yeah. There are chapters that think it's very difficult to publish a quote of poetry right now. You have to receive permission for a single line. It's, it's getting really crazy. Well, I but think if you're quite the rest of Chilma, you know. No, yeah, it's going to come after you. But well, yeah. well, more, more than right of you. So I think not, it's not very hard to get permission from the person. Yeah, yeah the person. The person but also just give the link to that. <laughs> we, want, yeah. we want examples. I'm glad yeah. Michael made that. Yes. Yeah, I wanted to just agree with, with, with what Stephanie uh, is saying about contemporary female poets and the kind of, I, I just seeing bits and pieces on Facebook, but I remember having a conversation with somebody uh, a month ago and asking, do we even talk about male poets anymore? I mean, the experts do, but as a non-expert in 21st century Russian poetry, just reader of Facebook, the only poet names I hear and talk about are, are uh, females. And just to making this transition from the poetic field as such to, poly to broader politics, which is also where kind of uh, the, this overlaps with, with uh, the conversation about my essay is that the, the female poets uh, currently, right, are not just female poets, right? It's also mm -hmm. that we also have the feminist anti sopротивление, which is the only anti-war movement in Russia, right? Mm -hmm. And people like Dasha Serenka, part of that, Daria Serenka, are part of that. Um, uh, and it is, it is really, it's immediately political. And I'm also thinking about a poem Serenka wrote um, a couple of months ago, which was in rhymed yambic tetrameters or something, which was a parody of a Soviet, so, some kind of a Soviet poem. And it was meant as not as good poetry, but as agitation piece uh, against the war. And she commented in it, well, seems she posted it and then it spread over Facebook. And she says, well, yeah, no, it's bad poetry, but if it works against the war, I, I can do this, right? And it was very, and kind of its difference from the other pieces was that it was really rhymed and metered and, and that sort of thing, right? So there is very interesting ways in which, in which this is immediately political and tied into, uh, into the anti-war agenda, but also the whole idea of FAS as a feminist as a horizontal anarchist feminist structure with directly linked probably to Judith Butler's visions of uh, feminist organizations and, and that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. That's a great suggestion. Yeah. I, I did take to heart the suggestion yesterday that we shouldn't be writing for this moment. And, and had done much of the work on the shape of it before the war started. So, so adding adding examples is a good idea. And I think um, to to your point that that um, 
for the contemporary stuff, putting the URL and footnote would at least open to the reader immediately because of, it's all online. Mm -hmm. And interesting that Russian is, I also work on Serbian poetry and Serbian poetry is not all online. It's very hard to find some things where it is. Somebody has taken the time to, to make sure that the Russian poetry is getting up online, which I think is another reason why women have this immediate kind of unmediated access to this kind of publication. URLs are not permanent in my experience. No, no, so that's no, what they yeah, do. Yeah, but I, um, I you mentioned creating a website for them. Yeah, and we'll explore that. And so that, that indeed might be the first to publish this article even before the completion of the project. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. And then I want to also end the ball. Oh, sorry. I, I'm sorry. Can, I just want to clarify one thing, though, Sibylin, because you, uh, we want people to take to heart not writing too much at this moment. As in mm -hmm. 2022, these last 15 minutes. Mm -hmm. But our handbook is very much conceived with a sense of where are we generally. Mm -hmm. And so having that kind of present orientation, in fact, is very consonant with I mean, present orientation as the framework, the point mm -hmm. of departure, mm -hmm. not just mm -hmm. focus on the present, but that snapshot from the present and the way in which that recasts our sense of the whole. I think that is actually something that we would want to endorse. And maybe I was reading your mind. My point was but... exactly mm. to that, that writing from the present moment is, um, I think, a, a real opportunity mm. to write from the point of enfranchisement, where we no longer have to start every discussion of women poets mm. as victims of the oppressive publishing environment, which they, they have been, right? But um, I think it's important to imagine a world where we don't have to say that and um, be in a position of fighting. I mean, I, I know that might be going against the grain of, the, you know, the kind of the political position that you are, are, are coming from. Well, because and, you're coming and from well, I didn't see it quite like yeah. that, but... Um, but but I think it's it's a real opportunity for us to read these poems mm -hmm. and to um, to come to these women poets not as their tragic biographies mm -hmm. first and foremost, right? So that that I thought for me was maybe the mm -hmm. greatest opportunity for revision was mm -hmm. to go you know come kind of um, leave the biography without without leaving it behind entirely. Of course, right? Because we are interested in performing gender, performing certain identities. And, and I, I really appreciated what you said at the beginning of your comments, right? How you arrived in the process of these discussions to performance mm -hmm. as a as a as a meaningful category. But I think in addition to uh, performing these various roles, what this current moment allows us to do is to really read these poets. Um, and so I, I think I think that would be great. It's it's true that that kind of reading requires a um, sort of like re, re, reshuffling. You can't read all of the poets mm -hmm. you have in there, right? You can't right. have examples from all. So that would then necessitate some kind of step where where selections are are, are made and maybe some of that um, right. kind of inclusive. Um, an in, 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 in inclusive um, impulse that your piece very much has um, would be compromised, but it doesn't have to be right? if, if those selections uh, are done. You know, mm, no, absolutely. That that whole last part with poet after poet is designed to be able to throw out the ones who aren't working. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Oh uh, yeah, well, I just sort of on the point of examples, I wondered if um, and thinking about this kind of uh, development or whatever it is, uh, when you begin by speaking about this kind of like gender, you know, like gender is obvious mm -hmm. voice, but then maybe kind of um, thinking about more contemporary poets like Stefanova, Vostova, right? Like the more the other things they do with voice and kind of how that feminine voice develops and changes and that could be one sort of thread of examples maybe mm -hmm. that um because obviously that gendered thing is so obvious yeah, to start and 
um, it's in which, and also that kind of speaks to this different kinds of public roles that women are playing, right, in salons or um, then was part of it kind of like it's this other sort of publishing. Um, yeah, so that might be one. Because you said someone besides Stephen Hanover and I think Barcelona, Barcelona. Well, she has a point. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Martin. Um, thank, thank you, Mr. Uh, I think a little bit, sorry, it was so far as you suggested to focus, that, that it is very important to emphasize the difference between them and uh, sort of to delineate uh, women's poetry in the center space and in the underground, mm -hmm. because it's, it's quite different, uh, I believe. Um, and uh, for instance, even, even Barkova's Renshin, when, when, when we read it, it's the polemical time, because yes, I'm Renshin, but first of all, I'm a proletarian, mm -hmm. and uh, they have the proletarian, so, so, so the, the gendered aspect is, is pushed into the background, while any other aspect is, is foreshadowed, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so, so this this uh, Soviet women's poetry until maybe the sixties is sort of involuntary gender. It's sort of something that we can unearth, but but it is it is not the the, the position of the um, lyrical subjects, so to speak. Mm -hmm. While of course in the in the underground and of course on the other hand in Svetlana etc., uh, it is it is probably Gender, gender identity it is the identity of the of the poet, uh, and uh, this, this of course leads to the post-Soviet period about which uh, we were talking already about, about, about the gender position and queer position. The word queer has to grow into this chapter. I believe uh, is is the political position. So, mm -hmm. This transformation is not something that we see in some uh, poetry at all. And also, I would suggest to sort of look differently at the distribution of names. Certainly, of course, Schwartz uh, and Sidakova uh, lived well uh, into post-Soviet period, but uh, Schwartz belongs, as Schwartz is, is a part and parcel of the underground mm -hmm. in the late Soviet, so she should be there, I guess. As to Sidakova, it's, it, it, we, we have more prominent efforts in this poet in terms of, uh, I just place a question mark over her name. I'm not sure where she should be placed, but definitely not, not entirely in the experiences. And, and you you refer to her as sort of mainly, uh, you discuss her through the Vindic Terefeev, which is, of course. Well, I mentioned that in passing, that she saved as manuscript. That's it, 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 it basically is everything that you're saying to me. Yeah. That she protected his screen. Now, Mark, let me explode. <laughs> That's true. I did say that she protected his screen. And I'm going to put that as anybody who's written about her extensively. I didn't know it. Yeah. I didn't know yeah. it. Um, and I did too. Yeah, poet, translator, and philosopher. Her poetry includes rich Christian content, meaning she couldn't publish in the USSR until the late years of Glasnost, but not at all a standard rah rah orthodox. Approach. She was friends with Yerofiev and set, takes the poet's moral authority seriously and is the object of serious scholarly study. So you're right that maybe Yerofiev stands out, but it, it, it does. It's, I'm sure. it's okay. okay, it's one third. I'm sure. But, 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 I <laughs> but, but, but I think if, if, if um, the chronological scheme is rethought in general, right, the biographical chronological scheme is rethought, then we don't have to yeah. deal with this problem of fitting these poets yeah, into one yeah. 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 right. which is not me. Really, yeah, right. I agree. I know, I, but I actually wanted to, I'm sorry to interrupt, but when Isabel mentioned about Stefana Vashkova and talking about Maria Stefanova as a public intellectual figure, it seems to me that might be the way to loop back to uh, Sudakova in an interesting way because in the post Soviet period, she's, she basically hasn't been writing poetry, mm -hmm. but she's an incredibly important figure in a, in a kind of, uh, in a version of orthodoxy, which is not alive in the state. That's the best way to. to mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes, and I think that the, forgive me, the chronological aspect can be 
compressed into looking at particular poets who are looking back. So what strikes me until yeah. uh, until that generation born in the 30s is that they are looking back constantly and mm -hmm. Isabel Akhmadova become this multiply cited threat. Yeah, How can I manage when I'm not doing what they did or I'm, I'm barely managing to thread the needle between them? Whereas I think later, they, because the poets have so many more choices for reading, including not feeling that they have to look at a woman poet in order to get yeah. points. That's great. So, uh, I see Mila's hand is up, and Ilya, you yeah, also. So, Mila? Uh, yeah, Sibyl, and um, uh, I really like how you started off with linguistics and how gender in the language forces you to think about what it is. And it just occurred to me that there is research and there is a famous name that is associated with that, and that's Lera Baraditsky, um, who gave TED Talks on this and published articles on this on kind of cognitive effects on having gender. Um, so that probably since you start with that, I think that might be kind of a nice linguistic reference. And she cited various uh, research studies, including a very early one by Jakobsen in 1915, where people were asked to personify days of the week. Yeah. And um, they personified according to um, grammatical gender and also folklore. When you drop a knife, uh, the superstition is that a man will come to your house. If you drop a fork, the superstition is that the woman will come to your house. Um, so I was just thinking like maybe throwing in some names that um, looked at that may be useful. It didn't occur to me to use that Jakobson article, thank you. Yeah, yeah. I mean, if you like kind of relativism, right? Not everyone likes Baraditsky. Uh, generatives certainly don't like her. But I think that for your purposes and what for your you were trying to say, I think she kind of resonates. Great. Thank you, Neil. Thank you. Uh, yes, uh, I also made the uh, grammar introduction. Uh, the uh, historical uh, discussion, and I have a couple of uh, probably unnecessary um, uh, uh, suggestions. Uh, you mentioned the uh, the South uh, um, uh, in the uh, beginning in the 18th century. They translated South and they created a kind of pattern uh, mm -hmm. for the female uh, voice. It turned out uh, that uh, the poems were fabricated by a certain mm -hmm. uh, French uh, male uh, author, but they were immensely popular and they served as an equivalent uh, for uh, mm -hmm. female uh, uh, voice. So uh, maybe just a little bit uh, about the historical uh, background and some fabrications, mystifications. You mentioned uh, Gabriel, but they were early uh, in the sentimental period uh, when they created uh, for sentimental journals uh, pictures uh, to female authors and uh, uh, just to fill the gap because they looked at the Western tradition mm -hmm. and they realized that we do not have this very important ingredient and quite cynically or not, uh, they created uh, the quasi-female um, author. It happened in Serbian literature, I wrote about uh, this um, as well, uh, but uh, this is a characteristic feature, I believe, uh, of this neoclassical and sentimental romantic uh, uh, period uh, when they uh, worked with um, mystifications to uh, resolve certain uh, goals, which brings out uh, 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 the second point, um, right. uh, the context. If you could add uh, possibly, uh, uh, maybe a paragraph, maybe just a sentence or two uh, regarding other uh, Slavic or Western uh, in general uh, tradition and the role of a uh, woman poet, uh, I'd say in French literature, in English literature, uh, um, in Polish li uh, uh, literature, which you know better than anyone. Uh, also, maybe in this case, we could see the difference uh, what actually uh, uh, So it's, it's not enough to say mm -hmm. people looked and saw that there were, but I should mention. Uh, yeah, well, uh, at, at least just some yeah. delicious, uh, st uh, some, some facts or numbers or anything which would uh, strengthen the uh, argument uh, that how unusual, how strange um, it, uh, it was. And two more names, uh, which 
Well, you mentioned uh, Bilinski. Bilinski wrote a really strange uh, review of uh, Sofia Talskaya uh, uh, poems, which were written in several European languages, uh, in French, actually. Uh, and she died very, very young. And this is a typical romantic uh, image of a Sibyl, uh, of uh, the prophetess, uh, who uh, uh, composed uh, poetry uh, in an act of, uh, uh, well, as a, uh, in the state of trance. Uh, and, uh, very interesting because he, uh, I'm not sure if he read uh, these poems in, uh, in French, uh, but uh, most likely, most likely he followed uh, some uh, rumors, whatever, of a special uh, group of poets which came to fashion uh, in Europe, in France, and especially in Germany, are who were like seers. So they uh, produced poetry, uh, in, uh, the act of uh, trance, and which uh, reaching some hidden truth. That's very romantic, ultra romantic um, account. There was another poet of this um, uh, type, uh, which uh, Ed and Wenner wrote eloquently recently in his book on translation. Mm -hmm. And this is uh, Elisabetta mm -hmm. Kulman, Kulma, who composed poetry in several languages uh, at uh, basically at the same time. So they also read up. Supposedly. Well, there was debate about that. Yeah. yeah. Well, we had a very uh, friendly and very intense debate with him. Uh, I chose the radical position that uh, she was a uh, product of her teacher's um, imagination and uh, Etienne had recently insisted on her authenticity. Uh, but uh, it's also in line with it. what they needed, they created. The question is what they created, whether it is the real voice or they put in the mouth um, what they wanted to hear uh, as male authors or representing certain poetic, uh, poetic traditions. So, uh, Maybe that too, like a minuscule uh, people like uh, Elisabetta Kuhlmann uh, and Sofia Natalstai, but uh, this is the Romantic uh, age and they're interesting. And I also think that uh, uh, quotation or more uh, from uh, poems would really, really make it. Yeah. Uh, because then it's uh, the handbook of poetry. And if we don't have poetry, for example, so poetry and fine translations of uh, uh, Russian uh, uh, poetry, it will not, it will just, will benefit from it. No, uh, absolutely. Uh, uh, I think, and this is a good chance for us uh, to introduce the text, which we consider as authors of these uh, uh, chapters as most eloquent, interesting, unusual, presented, interesting uh, problem, including the uh, translator's problem, how to render them uh, yeah. in, uh, uh, in English. It will be just, Aesthetically pleasing as well mm -hmm. uh, to have uh, the to, so to sum up uh, the um, uh, sentence or two about the context and in compa comparison with Western tradition uh, on Belinsky's uh, uh, review, I can send you the uh, link. Uh, all Belinsky's works are online. Mm -hmm. Actually, uh, the complete works are uh, digitized. Uh, and uh, again, that's uh, was not my uh, uh, the um, mystification issue. Mm -hmm. Uh, something which happened before uh, the Gabriel, uh, uh, which uh, served the purpose of putting in the uh, mouth of uh, a woman poet certain ideas which may or may not be alien uh, uh, to uh, like we imagine the real poet uh, in its you know, uh, replace of this fabrication. Um, I think everyone wanted to take in that. No, I, I just wanted to, to repeat that I absolutely intend to include some poetry. Yeah, yeah, of course. Yeah. So I, I want to just twist what Ilya said in one slight direction, which is because I love this idea of doing more with mystifications. I think that's terrific. And those are great examples. Stop but, it, mystification, stop but it almost makes me want to see if you would be willing to ask the question, not just of how women perform femininity in their poetry, but who gets to perform femininity? Mm -hmm. And what does it mean when men or teachers or you know various people are fabricating that, that sort of filling in the gap? It feels like from the performance angle, that could be a really productive, um, bigger question to have. Yeah. Maybe what occupies I kind of skip people. over it and mentioning videos of some but Exactly. Mm -hmm. So Nelly would, would sit there and this gives me the opportunity to make this a, a plea for more Gipius mm -hmm. because it seems yeah. to me that that's the place where Gipius really becomes interesting. Mm -hmm. And it's the person who, yeah, I think, really changed the, the, the ground rules of, of how you get to perform, what you perform, 
um, and the, the choice there, you know, everything from the way she dressed to uh, But is it true that she's not, uh, as far as I understood, the Longa chapter is not familiar for most of Anglophone. Oh, absolutely. 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 Despite of Bachmus, Timira Bachmus uh, oh, research. Quite, and, quite Western. The non so the, yeah. the non Slavist has no idea, that, but it's absolutely true that anyone who studies yeah. Russian yeah. probably past second year is going to see something. Uh -huh. Right. But, but yes, so Mark's hand was up, Irina, but mine was just like yeah. a tiny um, condition on mystification. So um, there are different kinds of mystification, and it seems like a very rich and point into um, the problem of performance or one of the different points. Because, of course, so you're, you're mystified by creating this figure. But also, what kind of performance in the end of is making up mm -hmm. uh, the dead side, mm -hmm. right? This is this is clearly some kind of agenda mm -hmm. uh, performance, a certain performance of voice. I, I, I think I think that could work yeah. well and then kind of make a more complex mystification scene. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. That would go very well with my point about people trashing to I ever for letting her daughter die. Yes. Yeah, right. yes. The children, uh, you know, the, the Sirioja, um, Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, my, my two tiny points also connected to what Stephen has said. First of all, there is, could be another twist with this mystification because there is always this doubt, when the quotes, often the doubt whether it's mystified or real, whether Kuhlman was real quote or just you know made up. This is so that, that also probably is interesting. They're still uh, not sure whether they existed or not. As poets. And the, the other one that um, uh, should be in the Gabriak uh, um, case is particularly, I think, interesting that Vitiva was a poet in, mm -hmm. in a real. <laughs> so that, that also, I think, should be. And, and it, she, she, she knew about the mystification and agreed to it to do way more of it. So how, how is she different in relation to the that is a real poet? And there was. Who, 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 who was it that who somebody who met her was it Tsitaeva that was disappointed that so well, Tsitaeva wrote her she, she wrote back yeah right. she wrote there back at this point that she was like very plain and not well so everyone when they found out right so that that this is also I think interesting mm -hmm. Mark, yeah. Yeah. Luba said what what I tend to say about growth because I think growth is is necessary in this chapter. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, if, if we are throwing in additions of names, so, so I, I would suggest to I need to, more, I need more. to, to, to take away Ligier and replace her with Inbir, who is um, early Inbir is very interesting. Mm -hmm. And the Ligier never is interesting. <laughs> she's not in yet. She's not in yet. Why does it take another generation for Jewish women to become important <laughs> as figures in, in Russo poetry? Where, where in fact Jewish women formed modernism as critics. Mm -hmm. Why, why is it that it takes, you know, a, a good however many years? That, that was that was that should be raised as a question. Yes. Yeah. And and another suggestion, sort of uh, speaking about transgressive uh, women's poetry, Nina Habeas. Yeah. Uh, uh, which yeah. nobody raised. Nobody about. Right. Then well, more attention. I don't even know that. You will enjoy it. Uh, yes. Could you repeat it? Ah, yes. Ah, yes. Ah, yes. She took it from a uh, mystery fairy tale, uh, which is really, really weird. Uh, she she has obscene poetry using uh, all less uh, vocabulary. Very fun. <laughs> Um, on the Jewish women point, no, but I said, but on the Jewish women point, if you get to this, which I don't think is quite interesting. Um, several people have the theory that some of the negative reaction to Stepanovas, Kavi Stepanichi, is based on a, a little current of anti Semitism. Mm -hmm. um, and that but so be. is the father there, it's based on the philosophy. Right. <laughs> yeah. And I don't mean this <laughs> sort of I don't think yeah. she made it onto the scene. Yeah. Betty, yeah. 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 Yes, well, I um, thank you very much. A very interesting discussion. I just have uh, a few um, 
points going back maybe to Mark and Neil's points. But first, um, it's very well known that the Russian internet is kind of a out of proportion, the second largest root network, mm -hmm. second largest in the world. So out of proportion to the number of speakers. So that's the reason why the Russian it might be something relevant more generally to kind of a modern Russian coach and how it is mm -hmm. accessible. Was it the first? American. American. English language. English language. And yeah. Russian is the second language. So it's, it's, it's absurd yeah, like, in terms of uh, number of speakers. It's it's extremely. Uh, but there there is reach of the research on that, and mm -hmm. it's very easy to find this information. Mm -hmm. But uh, I I had a kind of radical proposal also, um, uh, building on what what Mark uh, has said, and kind of against what uh, uh, Neil was suggesting on kind of branding gender on these figures. Because uh, there is this distinction between marked and unmarked in Rule Six, yes. and there is such a thing as unmarked gender. Yes. So uh, it's when I grew up, it sort of it was. Uh, I was told again and again that I should never ever say that Ahmadova with the It's absolutely impossible. It's an insult. It's an insult. Right. Because she actually. Because right, because right, because, because she, uh, Nobody, she yeah. wants to be remembered as a great poet, not, right. not as a great female poet. So when you mentioned Panayila was a uh, uh, um, kind of a um, negative reaction to the idea of a, gen uh, of a gendered anthology. So yes. does it mean that you have to perform unmarked gender mm -hmm. in a way that say a male poet wouldn't need to perform? Mm -hmm. Um, uh, yeah, I think that's an interesting uh, kind of theoretical problem. And uh, occasionally I felt that you are kind of um, doing this extra work of, of imposing a particular kind of a gender role, say on Svitaeva, when you say Svitaeva was clearly very upset when her daughter died. Well, because I'm finishing the thought about people attacking her in, yeah, but how in do... scholarly works for not having saved her daughter's son. But why should we think that she was very upset? Because we read her work and she says she is. She says, well, I, I, re I read a lot of her collected you, works, every page of it. And as you then say, just not upset the way these later readers want her to be mm -hmm. as they read her private journals and personal correspondence. Is, is there not a risk of kind of a saying, well, that I have a, because she's a woman, she must be a good mother and therefore really must have been upset. No, no, no. She no? said she was upset. She said, "Am I? What does Siriaja need with me that I don't have Irina?" I mean, there, there are places in the well, work that that, uh, that was the point of that. Now, with all of these ideas, I think I could probably cut that snarky right, comment right. about well, critics who don't like the way she raised her children. Well, just her femininity is a kind of well, maybe not exactly what we would like in some cases. No, mm. not not a kind of a model of femininity. Uh, and also with Ahmatova. Um, so that, uh, um, also one small point in Ahmatova, when you say that she became more um, kind of a less experimental with age. No, less experimental. Less experimental with age. Um, I think Paima Paima with Geroy is really uh, a kind of an important poem mm -hmm. for you then as what does it mean to perform? So mm -hmm. certain yes, kind of yeah. roles and gender roles, and it's a very experimental poem. Yes, it's and, an obsession for her, right? A poem that she was trying to uh, recall that uh, mm -hmm. she lost most of it, and that she was kind of trying to recall her youth yeah. and what she wrote about her youth. For oh, very very good. Thank you. That's yeah. a super yeah. That's a terrific suggestion, especially because as we think broadly across the volume, Requiem gets a lot of play. And probably there was for early up Mark was thinking about, but kind of Skiroy is this great problem text that mm -hmm. to help to yeah. and I think it's perfect. Mm -hmm. Just a very, very small follow up question about Payat by Tess and what about Payat? That's the yeah. very last thing. Yeah. Right. Uh, At the very end, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. No, that, that, but no, I mean, Payat, yeah. Payat, yeah, but do they, they re rejected Payat, but invented Payat, right? Yeah. Well, took from, yeah, they had Stikatoritsa in the beginning, right, and then Potessa because it was imposed, it kept being imposed. I yeah, I wrote a nice poem to Baris Kersonitsky after translating some of his work in August, and he put it on Facebook and said Potessa. Yeah, that's so, you know, 
Yes. I have been persuaded over time that Russian dictionaries, Russian grammars insist that the masculine form is the original form, except for the word dura. And I'm not sure that's true. I think that nouns and adjectives have a kind of a stem form like verbs, and the Russian mind adds the ending. So it's not the case that Baishaya is derivative from Baishoy. It's the it's bush, and you add you add your ending. So so well, it I, depends on the suffix. It depends on the suffix. So if it were eek, eek goes yeah. the, no, obviously because yeah. you don't get papadia without po. And I guess you don't get durak without dura. But you can the like stikatoriets, they're taking the roots and putting them together. It's ik, itza apparently does come from ik. I was taught by the linguists in graduate school, right? So there are cases in fact where that happens, but yetsu, hard sign, and itza, no hard sign. So it's, uh, Nila, our linguist is actually about to. Yes, yes, that is good. Yeah. Nila, tell us. Nila, enlighten us. Um, I just had this thought that you might want to add something on Svitaeva's formal influence on others. There was yeah. certainly a metrical influence on Brodsky that can yeah. be very much quantified and traced. And I think Slutsky too. Um, so, but was yeah. it and kind of this kind of his. You know what Brodsky was saying, I think, in interviews that Akhmatova was the moral influence, but Svitaeva was the actual poetic influence in terms of craft. I, I also, yeah, thank you. I think that if we compare Poetessa to Stikatoritsa, it's a striking difference. First of all, the Poetessa is the foreign term, so it's kind of taken from the idea that other cultures have this, so we should too. How many Russian words are there that end in S? It's not a particularly productive suffix. Versus Stikatoritsa, okay, I'll, I'll back off saying it's just as basic a form as Stikatoritsa. But it's definitely a native Russian form and not an imported, you know, add two more syllables to the word form. But in the case of Payet, mm -hmm. that's in fact somewhat kind of a it's, suggestive it's, of derivation. It is suggestive uh, of derivation, but I think that for the people using it, it's perceived as coming out of Polish and, mm -hmm. and therefore at least not being a Russian derivative. I don't know. I, I need to read up on it, but that was something that I. I would also kind of hear, I, I'm very much interested in this conversation, and I would uh, look at, at those different terms also from the cultural semantic perspective, right? There is a different ways of defining the, the role of the women writer, right? Uh, and Sikhatvoritsa is still confusing because uh, I haven't met that term too often before reading this paper, so I don't have anything to... to, to original to say, but thinking about Poetessa, Poet, and Poetka, it's clear that they're uh, cultural auras, right? Are they all here, right? So Poetessa, you have the kind of a salon uh, setting, right. early Akhmatova kind of vibe, right? Where uh, this is a performance of, performance of uh, um, uh, female poetic performance as a performance of uh, some kind of associated with uh, 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 specific uh, female topics, right? And you have that that kind of gendered 
uh, gendered or, right? And this is why you need uh, mystification because it's a particular figure in a particular kind of imagination. And then Plyatka does a very different thing. Plyatka is an activist. It's activist language. It is. It has all the implications of feminist yeah. theory, right? And the, the underscore, which can be used for uh, trans figures, right? So, and this is the this brings in a lot of uh, kind of a different kind of politics. Which yeah. goes back to what you began yeah, by yeah. saying, yeah. Right? That, that it's now a political position yeah. to have your gender marked. Over and now I figured it out. Uh, so it's Tikatorix, like it's based on another model, Prarok and Prarochis. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think this is the uh, working model uh, well, in this particular it's based case. On and it's that Prarochis are you're clearly adding the suffix. Where with yeah, Tikatorix, Tikatorix, you're adding two different suffixes. Yeah, but these are two different models of interpretation, connotations. Prarok, Prarochis, Tikatorix, Tikatorix, Payet, Payetka, Payetessa. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, but it's more locked in. Yeah. It sounds very locked in. Yeah. Yes. Well, so I clearly need to quote that part from. I think maybe it's also because, yeah. because we will have so much more poetry and so kind of discussion tools. So this might have to uh, shrink. Yes. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, this is yeah. a great finale, anyways, to, judging by our discussions. Yeah. Yeah. It's an exclamation point. Oh, this yeah. has been marvelous. I mean, I can't do everything you yeah. suggest. Oh, no, no, no. Thank, thank you. Thank, thank you so much. Patience. Thank you. Thank you. Should shift gears. Um, right. We should take a little break. Hard to take a break. How do we do? We can take till till five seven minutes. Yeah. Until take a break. Just one hour. 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 One Right. But it says coffee break 1115 to 1130. So yeah. I, I do need a micro break. Yeah, let's yeah, at least take five minutes. Stand up and close. Uh -huh. uh -huh. yeah, so that that I can shift a little bit to the next one. Yeah, so the next one will be yeah, like the next one. Yeah, the next one will be the next one. This one is hour and a half, and the next one is two hours. Yes. Blue and I think we don't need a long break. Uh, we could mm -hmm. always get yes. up for five minutes. Yeah, I'm not sharing. So that's that's 
Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, like like the the ticket scares, right? The ages. Why do you call bashing timbers? I was a bit worried about that. Why in 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 I'm always a case for this little British. I'm 
So they also actually went from outside of the tower, then it's not the tower, then they just kind of climbed out of the roof. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 So I'm uh, not going to go to Or do they have the But to put them there? The tower is facing from the garden. Uh, and then we are going to pass the whole day in the window of the window. Yeah, I forget what what um the war I think they are the they are the they are the the top of 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 the now so the he he just had a huge part with the uh, with the sign of that. So let's return to work. <laughs> the sooner to have our next question. <laughs> um, so on next to talk about orange poetry. Mm -hmm. Um yeah, and so uh, so uh thanks. I'll just kind of echo thanks to Stephanie and Kathy for organizing this and to everybody for sharing their papers. I um I apologize because this is obviously unfinished, but I guess what I I kind of got to a point where I felt it's better to come here and speak to everybody and find out um more firstly about more about what other people had written because there are places where I was kind of thinking like is this gonna cross over with the Orison poet or the cool poet or the Soviet poet and and so it's been really useful to just sort of learn more about how people envisioned it. But then also um I guess I, I, the contemporary period is one I know least about. And I think that, um, so I had some kind of issues thinking about how to structure the paper. And as you can see, I kind of went for a chronological um, structure in the end. And, and that was partly because I was thinking this essay kind of comes right at the end of the collection. That was sort of part of my thought at the beginning was whether this could be a kind of I mean, obviously, nobody's going to read it cover to cover, properly write the handbook, and yet, like, it could, you know, thinking 
how does that kind of change when you think about it in terms of how it was sort of formed and these different ways of oral circulation, which is so ubiquitous, right? And that's one of the things I found really difficult about writing this chapter is which examples to select as kind of, um, or when it's such a sort of day-to-day -day part of literary life, it, yeah, I suppose it's just sort of, it becomes difficult to um, create a narrative. And, and so I wanted to do, so I, I did kind of want to do that um, chronological coverage for that reason, but maybe, um, you'll say it's not really worth it, given that it means I had to be a bit more superficial about some things. Um, I, and, and like within that then as well as thinking, because it's such a common practice, right, it's difficult to sort of, well, having read the essays um, here, I feel that I ought to have made a more a stronger argument, right, but on the other hand, um, I didn't want to be sort of too artificial about um, sort of, pulling it all into a narrative that goes together because obviously there's like so many different practices here and different ways that it plays into things but as you but as you can see like what I did do was sort of try and think about so modernist period um then looking at like uh 40s, 50s, 60s and then at kind of underground and trying to think there about what um tendencies maybe we can detect and in modernism I suppose I was sort of thinking in terms of this play of like authenticity and artifice and like theatricalized sort of performances versus but like it's um yeah so that that's sort of a play and like liveness versus recording right yesterday uh, we talked a bit about Bernstein and I could include that because I think that's actually quite important and it was interesting yesterday as well when Nilo read out that poem, right? Because I was thinking that's one kind of performance I didn't have, but which is obviously really important and it's certainly in modernist period, right? Where um for uh like Tinyana, right at the beginning of uh, the almost guy, uh, he has several chapters that's all about this kind of sound-based analysis. So sort of I don't know with that because um that sort of made live performance as this kind of precondition for understanding what rhythm is or like how it works, right? And kind of, so that it's all tied up and I could easily, I think, fit that into that section um, and maybe then use that to make this kind of uh, liveness recorded dynamic a bit more obvious. In the next section, like 40s, 50s, 60s there, I was uh, kind of trying to highlight in a, so, so one of the things I was doing across it was maybe like thinking about these different oppositions, like binary pairs, and just, you know, highlight, which I think are at play everywhere when you're talking about performed versus, you know, so you have performed versus printed, authentic versus artificial, like theatrical, um, recorded versus live, uh, audience, poet, ask them, you know, these kinds of different um, pairs that seem to come up a lot in discussions of um performance and so so trying to so one of the things I was trying to do was sort of have them go the whole way through the essay but in different sections that will ground different ones um so modernism as I said sort of this obviously theatricalized thing in the uh, 60s space they're thinking um and maybe this is I don't know having read uh Kirill's paper I'm not sure I, you know, because obviously the orator thing is really important there, and I was trying to kind of comment politics a bit and think about this. Like, so I have radio film, um, and I need to start there and sort of think about those as uh, media, like complicating a kind of public, private, intimate, oratorical sort of set of propositions. So um, that was kind of what I was doing there and thinking more about like what poetry is poetry performance is communicating or like how it's communicating um and then in that final section where I looked at underground um I was then kind of uh, trying to think more about poetry performance and in terms of like relationships and community building and so on and so forth so um yeah so it's not kind of uh, I'm struggling a bit because it's I don't know how to sort of make it a whole piece and especially because then I am just like missing contemporary so it's partly because I didn't get around to it and um, also because it just feels impossible to um for me at least and I don't know just because 
uh, so diverse, there's so many different things going on, it's sort of harder to maybe um, create an individual story in the way that I've done in other periods. I don't know if it's retrospectively you kind of make the problematic the way that I've dealt with the other periods, but, um, I don't know. So yeah, it's just easy. Okay. I thought it was an excellent chapter. I mean, mm -hmm. The topic's really important. I, I really like the way you covered it. I think this is is interesting to someone who really knows something about uh, Russian poetry that's also would be completely accessible to students. Uh, I'm not sure you can say that about some of the other chapters you've covered. <laughs> um, so I, I do think it's it's great. I had a couple just really small things where, where I was one thing you might want to put in is just the same you know, tradition um, in the Soviet period, people reciting all of my mm -hmm. memory. It's a mm -hmm. sort of, you know, it was kind of an mm -hmm. astonishing thing that was apparently quite common. Um, mm -hmm. So that, that, that came to mind. Um, some, some things that just details that, that I just was sort of intrigued in, and I didn't know that that's the case that um, uh, this. Idea that Pushkin was um, parodying the Ujavan style of recitation. I had never come across that. I, I just um, mm -hmm. would be curious to know what, what it's about. I, I sort of had taken it at face value that he was trying to impress the Ujavan. Um, then, uh, yeah, this thing about the performance in the 18th century, I, I re remember this is, once I was discussing this with, with Mikhail Gasparov, and he told me that. An article had recently come out after my annoyance. I never sort of got the name of it. Some article was published showing that, in fact, in the 18th century, these odes were not recited. Oh, yeah. okay. oh, oh. Mm -hmm. yeah. really? that was not the one that. No, the, that's the, not the one that. No, I, he, I love, uh, no, no, it was written by just young Russian scholars. Uh, yeah. Jenny Berstein's article on, on the ode? Of course, uh, he, he talked about this, yes. But but this yeah, was this was from they perform morality, but they're but, yeah. but, so, but in any case, this wasn't that either because it was anyway, it was full of archival documents apparently showing that what actually happened was that these these booklets were published and, 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 and question, everybody got one. Question, no. I, I don't know. I just don't know. I would I wouldn't recognize the name at the time. I just remember being shocked and I remember saying, Do you mean that uh that, you know, Tinyanov could have written that whole thing, yeah. insisting it. And he said, yeah, actually, that's exactly the way Tinyanov worked. He didn't yeah. care what the actual historical <laughs> facts were, but apparently you you they, you would walk in and get like this little book left with the ode, but it was never actually pronounced. Now that doesn't mean that everything you know, it was wrong, because presumably it was based on all sorts of principles. Yeah. Yeah. But, yeah. but at least it would be nice if we could, we could put back that down. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, that's really useful. I think so. I have to admit, there is a tiny bit. Sorry. Well, well they, there's this assumption, especially coming from that famous Tiniano essay, that it was yeah. absolutely based on moving mm. your listeners and you had to do these gestures and things like that, which which they say that Maykowski actually did. So they mm -hmm. actually had an influence. But whether that actually was the way it happened in the 18th century, apparently it wasn't. But I wish I could. You know, no, it's definitely, that's absolutely true. Yeah. We did know for sure that they were not recited. Right. And Tiniano actually, is not the way I understand Tanyano, he's not claiming the word. What he says is that they're imitating a situation, right. well, so I mean, constructing it. I think you give him too much credit. <laughs> he, basically, he's certainly suggesting that that happened. But, um, but I think that Von Gerner has this idea, uh -huh. right? Because he, he titles his important piece, The Old and the Performative Genre. Mm -hmm. yeah. So as a post-art actor's thing, and yeah. I'll, I'll send it to you. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, the only advantage to this other article, which presumably exists, is that if there's actually archival uh, right, 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 right. evidence. But um, and then par pardon this final comment, but I don't know why that'd be infamous when Wednesdays. I would call it a famous <laughs> Wednesdays. Um, I put <laughs> I put that in because I was just reading this piece that said there was a lot of like newspaper, you know, like most people writing newspaper about it at the time, kind of what's yeah, going on, and, like we're kind of wondering about it. So, but maybe it's just, I mean, a different, again, there's tons of archival evidence and there, but there's not much infamous. I mean, what was infamous was the, the famous, you know, uh, blood drinking, uh, Black Sabbath thing, but, the, but that wasn't at a Wednesday. <laughs> okay, no, I, can, I, can so I would just call it famous. Yeah, yeah, pardon me for that. No, no, um, local comment. Oh, I just maybe the last thing I would just small point again was was the I, I'm 
I wouldn't necessarily read the, uh, I wouldn't like read with the, the way you do. You do. My, my understanding of that last line is that it's a complete impossibility, that you uh -huh. can't do it. But, um, it, but I mean, and there's also strange things, right? It's a nocturne, um, mm -hmm. which is a word that's marked as sort of high culture and, and the strange dream pipe, I think it's supposed to show sort of the complete incompatibility of this, that, that instrument and that genre, so to speak, but maybe that's just a person. Yeah, I mean, that reading, so I, I kind of put that in really last minute because I thought, oh, I don't have any examples. Right, it was right. great. So, um, <laughs> yeah, I'm not kind of fully attached to that reading. I guess I do sort of, um, like I, I think in terms of what my colleagues like doing in the 1910s, what the futurists are doing is sort of this very self-consciously like media campaign kind of thing. And so I like that. I'll, yeah. I'll think about it more. But the, the example is great. I totally agree. It should, it should be there. Mm -hmm. No, I think that what he does is that he says, well, yes, I can m make the street speak, mm -hmm. right? And play music and, and be music. Mm -hmm. Right. But can you? Yeah, yeah right. it's me who can that. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, that's, yeah. that's, that's yeah. it. Yeah. 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 So, Ilya, Denmark, and Ah, uh, Yes, uh, it's an excellent chapter. Thank you very much. Now, thank you for referring to Chitia's Diplomater. Yes. Kind of, uh, uh, <laughs> sentimental <laughs> value for me because my grandma was a product of this culture. I still hear her voice uh, when she recited uh, Mirzhkovsky uh, from Chitia's uh, Diplomater with this like, very emphatic, I still remember this. I have this in fact. And I still witness the period. Uh, which probably neither uh, uh, Kirill uh, nor you, but I remember, but maybe Mark, uh, and I remember when we were forced actually to read aloud poems on the chair. I was the chair. Diplomat of my school. Oh, <laughs> yeah. the same one. Bro, all the teachers. Yeah, the no, but I'm a child. <laughs> so, what we're going to uh, I understand that this is not high uh, culture, but it's a part. Uh, a, very characteristic part of modus operandi of poetry uh, uh, in Russia, in Russian intelligence uh, family. There is another parallel at school uh, where we were supposed to read poems, uh, allow some poetic uh, evenings, but we were forced to. Uh, Recited from memory. Yeah, recited, uh, recited from memory, but even at some kind of, I don't know, this. Uh, class. Yeah, in class. It was a part of our. It was a part of our. Yeah. And sometimes we uh, did it, uh, I don't know, Vakta uh, Bogzale, like in Pushkin, but uh, it was an imitation, of course. It was very uh, Soviet um, uh, alike, but it's very performative. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, still, uh, I still feel ashamed speaking of court poetry because mm -hmm. I did uh, read aloud a poem addressed to the director of Nashi Show. Oh, <laughs> and the poem started. Учитель, вдумайся в это слово, в этом слове миллион сердец. But uh, this is the part uh, which makes, uh, which just shows how do this poetry is in, in, uh, in Russian tradition. It is sincere, it is, I felt, and at the same time, it's fame, it is commissioned. Uh, it is, uh, yes, but there's absolutely no parallel to yes, the exactly. United States. So yeah, actually no that's where I'm going. Right? So uh, he would end with like a, uh, the uh, Russian method. The Russian method of uh, uh, recitation of performance uh, poetry. It may be interesting uh, for our potential readers who knows who they will be uh, <laughs> to see the uh, uh, the differences. No, definitely. I made a kind of arbitrary decision at the beginning to just focus on authorial reading because I just <laughs> felt like that otherwise it, it, it gets out of hand. But I think you're right, and um, yeah, it's also like I am. I didn't put this in because I don't know really if we want to um, eternalize it to the ages, but there's also now on like YouTube, there's tons of people yes. uploading it. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, like, and like, recommending it to school children who have to learn it, right? Here's how yeah. to learn how to memorize the Abbas Mule really and fast. fast. And it's like and super cheesy a lot of it. And I'm sure yeah. it's quite terrible, you know, and, you know, so, but I think we've quite, now it's completely included, but definitely it's so good stuff and kind of what Michael said about it. And so it's not a matter of not English. Is it British? I'm you know, no. not in my experience. Mm -hmm. But it goes well with your general argument yeah. that that perhaps uh, your piece, in fact, opens mm -hmm. up a different way of constructing a history of Russian culture, right? And a history of this kind of declamation from everywhere, yeah. right? mm -hmm. which which 
And we seem to argue is a 20th, a largely 20th century product, right? Because I was really struck by that quote, Strana Malchai. Memory of the one recitation of <laughs> Krilov's fable. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and the, my classmate forgot what the <laughs> but there's a there's scholarship on the theatricalization of reading poetry in the early 20th century. And I don't, I haven't read it, but but uh, mm -hmm. that you actually have actors coming out reading right. whoever it is. Some of them. Yeah, yeah, I mean, and I mean that as well. It's kind of I I guess like what I heard that I know best is Mondism, and I didn't mm -hmm. know whether it was a you know like I. Made a conscious decision not to make the suggestion about modernism, mm -hmm. so I left some part of it. And I don't know because I also didn't talk about like Aiken Balm or um, as we just mm -hmm. did today. And I don't, and I, you know, if I put that stuff in, then modernism will definitely sort of be the dominant flavor. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if that's okay. Um, but um, I focus on the 20th century, that's just what I do. <laughs> you could definitely argue that the 20th century. And I, I stopped before I finished your paper last night because I got trained to apologize. But in the 20th century, you begin to have recordings of the performances. I mean, you can actually hear Mayakovsky bellowing. Mm -hmm. You can't understand the words and you don't know what poem it is unless you know what poem it is. But but um, previously, performance had been recorded in, in words again. So it's this kind of recursive process, whereas you get an audio recording, you get a video recording, we can watch Ahmad oh, Lina, like a beautiful snake reading reciting and, and that that hypothesis of the poet that age of the poet remains then eternally versus you know young pushkin versus slightly older pushkin and somebody's memoirs so the glass houses which actually have not they think this yeah, is the, yeah. uh, the, 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 the the disc which this created is, yeah. this almost yeah. golden man effect of uh, like, uh the dead poets came back to life yeah well and also that's really interesting as well because um uh, he was actually involved in Kiyama at some conference last year. was talking about um, she loved when he found those records because they were really badly mm -hmm. decayed. And so then he restored them and he played them to people who had heard of Mikowski reading or whatever and said, Does it sound right? And they said, Well, no, change this stuff, change that bit. So it's this kind of like oh, record, mm -hmm. it's not a record, right? So, mm -hmm. well, yeah, I think that's, but yeah, it's uh, so that. And as you say, right, poetry, it, it, like the sound recording and poetry is an interesting one as well. It's already a kind of recording, and that's why I was trying to just think about it in terms of modernism, it's like singular, it's a multiplicity thing. And it's sort of, yeah, like being alive versus recording is um, kind of comfortable. Like they're just like very self aware about that. Mm -hmm. like, like, mm -hmm. And it resonates well with our chapter, Kirill's chapter. Because mm -hmm. like oratorial poetry and recitation of poetry, I mean, coordinate. So, uh, Neil, Mark, and Neil, and then Catherine. Oh, thank you so much for, for this chapter. I second Michael's opinion that it's very well written and very informative and tell the work. Um, I think that what you mentioned in the introduction that, that indeed the, the second half of the 20th century contemporary poetry deserves more attention. Exactly because um, I would say that performative element is becoming not not the ispalnienia but the part of the poetry, right? Um, so it is it, it, inseparable. There. And I, I think you you certainly you, you quote Mendel Spiast, and maybe looking back um, at the Vasilis uh, Nedov and his poem Kansav, which, as we know, mm -hmm. is, is the empty. Uh, Piece of paper, but the descriptions of his performance are suggesting that it was indeed a performative piece, right? Mm -hmm. Ignatiev, describing differently. Рука чертила линии направо, слева и наоборот. Второе уничтожалось первое, как плюс и минус результат минус. So that, that that is the poem. It's a sort of it, it doesn't exist without it, right? And then then, then from there, uh, 
you you mentioned uh, guitar bars, but but that that's a very important step in the performance quality because certainly their music and and uh, this 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 very as I said, amateurish musical accompaniment as in Gaelic, right, is a part of the quality. But when when you subtract it, you have something different, right? And when you have the orchestra like like in the source, you also have something different, right? Uh, so so it 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 it, it is it is sort of embedded in, in this performative aspect. And from there, of course, um, Rubinstein and Prigov are becoming very logical steps, especially um, both of them, because Rubinstein created this performative genre mm -hmm. of exhibition and, and reading and moving and gestures, so it's all together. And, and Prigov certainly performs his personas mm -hmm. uh, as, as some kind of theater. Uh, a, a good uh, sort of last drop in this process would be uh, Bonifacio German Lukomikov, whom we've seen yesterday mm -hmm. in, in, in Paris, because he is an extremely performative poet. And there was recently a pretty good article, a very good article by Mikhail Pavlovets, where he describes his performances and can, can be just mm -hmm. noted. Uh, so the, 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 this is basically poetry as a performative genre, the genre of performance. Mm -hmm. And poetry is, is like, I wouldn't say secondary. Part, but it's uh, there is a certain parity between between what he does and how he performs it and, and what he says. And it can only exist because there have there has been a hundred year old tradition exactly. of poetry mm -hmm. performance. So it's a very nice last yeah. mm -hmm. drop. Um, yeah, I mean the whole thing last night was quite very interesting. And <laughs> it was all about oh, performance. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yes. Uh, thank you. I might could you make a pass and send me a like, um, Good, Yeah, thank you for this really inspiring piece. Um, and uh, I just have a lot of questions and comments. Uh, so um, one thing that, you know, I really loved about your paper is how you not only discuss the role of performance, but the actual description of what that performance is when you were talking about modernist poetry and I just wanted to point something out how reciting at the stadium really could affect the way people wrote because when Wisniewski writes he used those illusions in like poetry that are based on speech on fast speech effects so he could say something like and skip that syllable in militsanir in a way that is different from Prigov, right? For whom this is parodic. But for Wisniewski, it's just kind of your speech from the street, right? The way you talk. But someone like Brodsky and the Leningrad poets who resisted stadiums and really criticized them. Um, if you look at Brodsky, he, like when I looked at his, illusions and how he skips syllables, it's always very abstract. It's not based on that everyday speech. So there are consequences, I think, for how you recite. And I also wanted to just point out that there is a really nice quote from Kushner in a book by David McFedian, where he actually interviewed poets and um, from the Brodsky circle and um, Ask them what performance meant for them. And um, there was this quote from him um, that he said, um, oh, this was about perceived readership. So um, I asked him whether Kushner felt the difference between Leningrad and Moscow poetry. He replied that Akhmatova told me this when I was with her in 1963, I think. She said that in Moscow, verses read for the stadium like football, and that it all reminded one of the Coliseum, which is fatal for poetry. She was not approving of Yevtushenko Vesnysensky, and rightly so. Reading in an auditorium for many thousands, that lowers the level of poetry. So anyway, you could kind of see what Kushner thought of that. Um, and, um, another point that I wanted to make is 
I think what is really interesting is what Russian poets perceived as traditional recitation. So Brodsky famously claimed that his recitation is traditional. And of course, when you listen to it, it's very, very unusual, right? And anecdotally, I remember someone telling me that when he recited, maybe it was Palo Alto JCC, I don't remember where it was, but somebody said, you sound a lot like the way they chant in a synagogue, the way the pitches are reset at the ends of stanzas. And he just denied it and insisted on that being traditional. So I think that's interesting how, you know, poets themselves perceive what they think is traditional. And the last point I want to make is I think the way you recite, whether you do it in a monotonous way like Brodsky uh, or whether you do it like Yevtushenko by emphasizing the words, in a way it defines your reader. Like, is your reader someone who will interpret what's important or will you tell the reader what is important yourself? So anyway, um, yeah, for Brodsky, there was an interesting study by Janicek and he actually shows uh, musical notes and how, how this works. So anyway, that's my couple of points. Um, yeah, thanks. That's really useful. And um, I meant to say that at the beginning, I, hadn't, I didn't include Brodsky at all, and I wanted to. So those are really helpful. And the other thing about Brodsky I was thinking about, um, and maybe it would be interesting about Yevtushenko as well as deep poetry, is thinking about like translation of poetry recitation or poetry recitation abroad and sort of how that creates. But then, it, then I stepped back from that because it was keeping me on a different direction. But, Thank you very much. Uh, I think you can add uh, just a follow up, Nila's observation. There's a very interesting uh, account of uh, Kuchone, how he uh, uh, demanded uh, to recite uh, his translational uh, poem. Uh, and translational poem does not need to be translated, actually, because it's trans uh, translational. Uh, so, a uh, certain line, which doesn't mean anything in Russian, uh, in the German and French uh, in uh, Chinese, but he showed uh, where to raise the hand and uh, how to spit on something or something like that. So it was basically the almost a like physiological act of uh, uh, performing uh, the nonsense, nonsensical, transrational uh, 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 poem. It's just one paragraph long uh, from his book, uh, and it may be a good illustration of the poet's uh, reflection on the way how to pronounce even such a liminal case as a transrational yeah. uh, uh, poem. Definitely. I can send a link because yeah. uh, it's uh, even the picture because it's in his handwriting actually yeah, that, as right. well, which is also a performative, Re -reprodu uh, reproduced. Uh, oh, that's a good point. Actually. Yeah, I think. Um, yeah, I wanted, uh, so I, I also love this. Um, and I wanted to uh, re and, and be reassure you and also think along with you about the place of modernism in this field. Because I don't think we need to be too apologetic mm -hmm. for making modernism central. It's not it's not simply because you're a specialist on it, but because there is this um, uh, confluence of recording technologies, as, as you well know, because you've written about it in your dissertation too, and now in, in your uh, upcoming book, a confluence of certain kinds of technologies and certain kinds of life-creating uh, strategies, right, that uh, foreground this problem of voice and uh, um, projection of poetic personality and so on, and make it available uh, broadly. Um, and uh, so I was thinking along with Mark and his uh, point, you know, about ending with someone like Volkovnikov and also going through, you know, Rubenstein and Pico, but, but more, more to the point of Volkovnikov and, and my earlier comment that Volkovnikov can only exist because there is a long tradition. And this made me immediately think about this um, other poet, uh, Sergei Birukov, whom I met in, in Europe and who is who is this, um, I mean, this whole project from what I could tell is to be the futurist uh, still in the 21st century, right? And so he does exactly the things that you would imagine futurists were doing back in, at the beginning of the 20th century. It, it, um, 
and, and the effect is rather jarring and, and it's hard to, I mean, Mark maybe has a more, a more precise way of describing it. I can show it. Okay. You, you can show it. You, you can do the yes. performance. Yes, it's very short. It's not long. So uh, I met him at the uh, Congress for 18th century Russian studies. And, <laughs> and, 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 he, and he, uh, he, he was in Germany. That was in Germany. He was based in Germany. And he wrote a poem for the Congress. And very short. I'm going to perform it completely. Uh, it's had three lines. So he went on to like, there was a co Congress dinner, maybe 100 participants. So he stood up and he said, Lomonosov, Somarokov, Tridiakovsky, That's it. Tridiakovsky, Poet? Oh, poet. Uh, Interpretation starts here, you know, Pushkin, <laughs> poet. Uh, Many other words. Uh, Brigov, uh, <laughs> what other words will start with, do we know, you know? And, uh, Pepsi. Pepsi, Pepsi. Yes. So, That's Pinu. <laughs> <laughs> so, but I think about the generative capacity of, of that period that you were working with. And you know, even even in something that I don't think is generative at all, and it's kind of slightly dead as Virkov's production, um, you can you can see the, you know, like something is holding him in thrall, right? Um, so it, it could be a very nice. Uh, arc. I, I'm not interested because Virkov meet me uh, there, but I think maybe it was while the poem. Um, but with Lukomikov, but I think we saw yesterday, there's also that Eurodivy mm -hmm. uh, strain, right? And, 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 and that's a kind of interesting. Um, you know, I, I don't know whether you get that in the Kuzminsky performing naked. Right. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. every time. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I don't think so. Body yeah. Oh, my God. Yeah. So that, that could be that could be good too. Um, and I also want to say that um, because of, of that, you know, this dispensation that I'm, we're giving you to, to be okay with modernism, I think it's a, it, it would then be okay to add uh, another description of voice. The, the, the thing about both is beautiful. Uh, if, if you feel that you need it. Um, but the, your other question, should I have a video with you? And that question, I, I want to say yes, please do, because everyone mentioned the video with you, but somehow, as we are seeing, right, in, in this um, selection of articles, Mikowski is everywhere and it's quite embodied, but the video are always mentioned and never um, dealt with, right? And it's, it's, it's a very, it's, it's a different mode of performance. And I and I think that would be really nice. And I think I think that would allow um, us to think about the Petersburg strain of performative mm -hmm. culture a, a little bit better as well. Mm -hmm. There, there is another example that that uh, so so for for uh, there is a New Yorker's article about Karl's the practices, but <coughs> there is a easily quotable example uh, of. Uh, uh, the theological poets also in Grad, uh, from Losif's uh, article to Lugumi, where he describes their performance uh, uh, in, in, in 1951, the historical performance, yeah. uh, which, which basically was a form of poetry, they were yeah. performing and, and reciting or singing something, as he writes, reminiscent of Klebnikov, but not quite Klebnikov. Wow. And that's 1951. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Like the original uh, performative act of mixing gesticulation and circus uh, with uh, doggerels. The pre pre yeah. yeah. And, and, and the getting rid of them, right? In the 17th century. The, the, uh, yeah. When the court was, the was established. Right, yeah. exactly. Yeah. 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 That could be really good. It's a good number for that. I will think about the penis episode in Tarkovsky's uh, day of the Exactly, exactly. Yeah. that's exactly what we are all thinking when we think about yes. it. Exactly. Uh, yes. Which may be just... We have people. no other visual report. Yeah. 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 Right, we have no report. Well, well I we have, have descriptions by uh, foreigners in uh, Moscow, by Zara. Yeah. 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 Ye
Uh, I was thinking that uh, maybe at the beginning I could just sort of um, add in a brief paragraph because I also don't really mention sort of just oral tradition of poetry, which is a bit of a mission. But, but there are equality to Skamarosha, right? Uh, maybe Zilin. Mm -hmm. uh, and the way I think we all in our home programs invite a poet if we can to read their own poetry for us. So, you know, Barskova, Stepanova, when they've been in the country, really do tours. And so there must be an awful lot of recordings of those kinds of mm -hmm, those kinds yeah. of performances. That it's one thing to teach your students, but if you can get the actual poet there to embody the reading yeah. in, in whatever style they're using. I mean, that's interesting, isn't it? Because I think that in like Anglo-American tradition, like the university reading was so important in like establishing poetry readings as a thing, right? Mm -hmm. Whereas mm -hmm. with Russian, it's sort of come along at the end and like now that's a big thing, but it wasn't necessarily so, so important in terms of mm -hmm. establishing, but that's a good point that I think that that is kind of, um, especially for English speaking audiences, that's maybe like an interesting way. If you do go there with the dog, which I think is a great suggestion, but it offers you also an opportunity to loop back to the opposition you were creating between authenticity and performance. Mm -hmm. Because mm -hmm. Mark's example from Tupac of going in and performing mm -hmm. something which is what channeling is from the voice, mm -hmm. we have a number of really interesting examples of not actors or students performing, but poets who, for whatever reason, recite someone else's work. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. It could be because the poet is sick, has just died. Uh, it could be political. When Stefanova was in the US, and this was at Berkeley, right? There was an event, and she read Tony Starink in this poetry. Mm -hmm. um, so it was a, a gesture of solidarity um, and wanting to bring out someone else's books, Belarusian, but still. Uh, at this moment of Russia's engagement. Um, there are lots of really great examples of that. And um, it, it could be the kind of complement to the memory of being a child and having to embody that. Like mm. It's not just enough that you read the poem, you mm. hold it in your own body. A poet's doing a version of that um, as part of their establishment of also of their authority as poets. Mm -hmm. As part of creating their own poetic community to channel. Yeah, that you, the poet, carry your own library. Yes, yeah. What is it that you hear buzzing around in your head? Mm -hmm. What have you chosen among the many, many, many peers? Yeah. Yeah, and your uh, permission to us uh, a book on poetry and memory and Gulag, uh, uh, mm -hmm. in our poems in Gulag. Oh, uh, yeah, but this is more about. Uh, yes, but it, it, it created like a tiny uh, emotional community actually for those who are harassed, for those who do not have any hope, and they still. They use poetry as parole. There's also the nice work. Evgenia Ginsburg. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Evgenia, right. It's not only like reciting for yourself, it just. Uh, yeah, keep the inmates uh, can be, uh, can share. Uh, Even the, the guard might be. Yeah. That guard is the lovers. <laughs> I mean, it's interesting, so I think so, because I can. Um, so I was reading about the stray dog, and there, everybody's reading other people's poems as well, and like Block never actually recited that, but his poetry was constantly being read there. And so it might be interesting to think about the like, different Good. functions that those have, right? Yep. Where maybe in the modern period, it's more. Like, that's great. What was the recent uh, legend which we discussed on Facebook? And I think Mark, you reflected upon it. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe it was, uh, it was not you uh, uh, regarding a poem uh, written by a Russian Jewish uh, author who composed it in prison. And it, uh, it's definitely legendary. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah, I'll try to find it because it's it's a legend, but a really beautiful legend. Uh, when an in, uh, intelligent, like proverbial um, intelligent, uh, in prison among the convicts, uh, uh, is writing a, uh, is reciting a poem and how it changes them. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah, it's, um, well, um, Shalom of story. Yeah, it's, 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 it's,
So different locations uh, were reciting, uh, performing uh, uh, poems, different functions. Well, well, I was actually going to just note appreciatively that's one of the ways which your in which your essay is already structured. It's not simply that it's chronological, but you really put us in different the the key sites mm -hmm. of performance yeah. mm -hmm. and. Um, the, the one that, you know, is obviously, you know, it's unfinished, but one confluence of sight and technology is the internet. And I think that something probably should be said about the function of readings on the internet alongside maybe the, the sort of visits that function poets have made. Um, I don't know. I don't have an exact example in mind. It's definitely. Swickle is mm -hmm. a cycle of poems. Yeah. Well, yeah. the, the Amherst yeah. uh, pandemic. Uh, well, so yeah. We think yeah, that's true. Could I say another another example, which is politically relevant? So there is the poem uh, during the Maidan Revolution. Uh, there was a poem by a, a Ukrainian Russian speaking poet Anastasia Dmitruk, Nikogda Minibutim Bratime. And then there is a Nikogda Minibutim Bratime, so uh, Russia and Ukraine. And I, I remember being struck by, and she's Russian speaking, right? So it's a poem in Russian, which is against, which sees Russia as a foreign object, right, which we have to uh, kind of distinguish ourselves from. So a very powerful performance of a Russian language identity, which is not about the state of Russia or the territory of Russia, but is actually opposed to it. I was struck by that, uh, right? So it's a different we. Uh, 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 so, and then it was, it became, they, they made a song out of it. So on YouTube, there is a recording of a song performed by uh, uh group of actors and singers from Latvia, I think. So it's uh, in solidarity again with Ukraine. So the act of performance is, is, is an act of solidarity. And yeah, it's just there on YouTube. It's like a song, but also the recitation is, is part of it. And it's, it's, it's a gesture. It projects a particular kind of public sphere, right? Where we are speaking up against uh, Russia, while in Russia, the only people who are allowed to speak up are uh, the voices of the sovereign, right? In that sense, the court poetry, right? You can, you are only supposed to speak in the name of, okay, we are doing everything right. And here you have a different kind of community of speakers speaking up against that, right? And it is Russian poetry in the sense that it's poetry written in Russian. And that's great. Yeah, that would be a way of kind of bringing Kathy's point on the internet. Yeah. yeah, I think that's excellent. And Kirill's example makes uh, almost your orator kind of poet. But you could also ask the question to go back to another one of your binary acquisitions around the possibility for intimacy, mm -hmm. paradoxically, on the internet. And so Kathy's example of the Amherst readings, or I mean, there were tons of readings that suddenly happened during the pandemic, huge numbers of them. And it did create a sense of bond and community and connection to people who were so isolated. That's not distinctive, I think, to Russian poetry. Um, I went to them in English language poetry. Mm -hmm. yeah. But Russian poetry was ready to go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Plenty yeah. of people. But, uh, but yeah. uh, the, our fantasy about English professor will recognize that. Mm -hmm. yeah. but, but also, I suppose it's kind of like, um, even though, as we've said, there are those things that are super specific about how poetry performance is so much in Russian culture, but then, like, actually, now maybe there's a sort of drift, you know, like the American tradition of university readings, whatever is and the Russian tradition, they're kind of like quite close together now, especially sort of, um, sort of non unique. Mm. Questions? I would just, I think maybe I'm wrong, is usually very provocative, very aggressive. The audience is way more aggressive. Um, audience? Yes, I would say not the whole also like, right. I, with Bourgeois, whatever, whatever. Yeah. I remember that the audience, especially if it's not like a selected audience of friends, it's very aggressive, and poets themselves can be very aggressive. It's like Russian conferences. Mm -hmm. <laughs> when they're already intoxicated by alcohol. 
Uh, it depends on the photograph. And very rude, actually. Yeah, she uh, really uh, is a thing there that you can see with Brandy on um, North Bernstein's podcast. Mm. He's, you know, some accolade in the audience. So is it characteristic for Anglo-American? I mean, not in my experience. <laughs> <laughs> you can get it in spoken. I find it Absolutely, but it wouldn't be for like the university. And maybe a bit more in some UK poetry circles, actually, than the US. I think there's like a, no, not aggressive, maybe, but more, more kind of um, less formal, perhaps. Uh, that's an interesting point, yeah. Yeah, because I guess I tried to bring in the audience in when I was talking about the rural era, but it might be interesting to think about the audience of the kind of, um, yeah. Uh, yeah. Even in the ministerial care, mm -hmm. uh, when the cross recitation we had in our university, and there were the young poets at the time uh, who performed, and one of the professors expressed his dislike of the poetry. The poet uh, uh, talking like a very oratorial was special one and Suda, something like this. I can't imagine it in the American uh, university. <laughs> but might be interesting to him. So. Well, yes. Um... I, I, I was particularly fascinated by your examples of individual voices in your performance. So when you are, uh, I, I, I would really love to see more discussion there, which is what you plan to do in any case. And I think even the Tahmati emerges as an important uh, figure. Um, there are these very important culturally significant recordings of Requiem, mm -hmm. where she speaks in a way that suggests a kind of a, a it's certainly not, uh, it's a bit like block, blocks, kind of blue koi, monotonous, but, but it's also quite emphatic. Um, and certainly, this is this is very unlike Brodsky, mm -hmm. but certainly not Yvtushanka. So something peculiar is happening there, where she knows she's doing it for the recording, mm -hmm. as a kind of witness, uh, witnessing gesture. And also Nahmatova, um, uh, maybe, and I think maybe uh, Sibylland uh, mentions this kind of uh, in passing, but uh, you could mention as a kind of a, on the scale of privacy, there were these performances where Ahmatova took these kind of select members of the circle on a bench in a park, mm -hmm. a performance that was not meant to be heard by anyone, to make sure that they remember it correctly. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm and checking her memory with the memory of the... Mm -hmm. But it's also a case of perform poetry where performance is important, but it's a kind of a, a performance that was, is designed to be almost inaudible. Yeah, that's, yeah. That, I, yeah, that's a really good example, and I think is... Um, and as you can find it in the digging books, so uh, three volume, yeah. it's all described there. And thinking about just, kind of circulation, like different ways that the so, um, yeah. It's on the, I think the first page of Tchaikovsky is that he's going to Yeah, a very particular kind of performance that's designed to maintain the, to the integrity yeah. of yeah. the yeah. But, but I think it connects very well with the Bashnia, uh, ritual like performances. And here is a different kind of performance, especially considering in a different setting, burning the. The, the piece of paper after reading it mm -hmm. aloud, so that mm -hmm. looks incredibly rich. I was how can you have it all in the <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. No, of course, it's, it's, it's for your next book, it's success. Well, it yeah. is for the next and it's really, really useful. Yeah, and I'm just being on some pizza. Well, we'll have the moment where we should be taking our breaks. Let's reward ourselves. Oh, that's what the university was not even aware of. It was absolutely terrible. The worst school ever seen. I think it was your hero. We are the worst school ever. I don't remember. I think that his last name is Piermon or something like this. Uh, he came to the United States. Some, uh, he uh, commissioned uh, someone to translate his poems into English. He was a deputat. Uh, oh, uh, oh, uh, oh, uh, he had his recitation here, and then someone recommended uh, uh, that the uh, invite him, and Kevin invited him. He came uh, to Uben. It was absolutely terrible. <laughs> and uh, this is the only poet I still remember. 
Yeah. 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 Exactly. Yeah. That's well, what's the whole point? That's the whole point. Yeah. 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 Bad poet? Yeah, but uh, 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 based on social justice uh, issue that was many years ago, uh, but someone noticed, which was quite impolite, that he had really, really expensive uh, uh, work. And uh, uh, they asked him, how can you be able to make your national political position with your dollars? I don't know if it was a platform. And he said something like, he took like very artistic pause, and then he said, прошли времена, когда русские поэты приезжали на Запад с протянутой рукой. Теперь мы сами можем купить кого угодно. Exactly, No, I think that Pratyamnuti Rukoye is a Soviet as well. Sure. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. What is he now? Arrested. <laughs> oh, oh, no, it sounds like he should be fine. Yeah, it sounds like he should be fine. We're not too worried. Yeah. <laughs> И он объяснил нам на примере, почему он предал Немцова. Он сказал, что есть другой путь политической деятельности. Он говорит, представьте себе толпу, которая бежит к обрыву. И только один человек знает, что впереди обрыв, что нужно сделать. Он говорит, если бы это был Немцов, он бы сказал, стойте, стойте, там обрыв, и вся толпа бы его смела, и вместе бы упали в пропасть. Но есть другой путь. Шипнуть кому-то на ушко, что, знаешь, там впереди обрыв. Это человек другому, другому, хотя бы несколько человек как бы отойдут в сторону, и не все погибнут. Очень странная метафора. Очень изобретательная, хороший образ. Нет, ну тут интересно, что как бы... Это сколько лет назад было? Uh, это было 2006-2007. То есть был, уже этим людям было понятно, что мы несемся к обрыву. Вот что тут интересно. Mm -hmm. Именно карьеристам и конформистам, которые зарабатывали, имели фабрики, зарабатывали часы, делали карьеру, было понятно, что несемся к обрыву в шестом году. Yeah, вот это пора yeah. 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 Такой топос, что надо в одиночку спасаться. Нет, ну обрыв, что вот мы имеем. Нет, что не просто сиди, зарабатывай, и все будет у тебя хорошо, а что несемся к обрыв, да, вот это как бы коллективный смерть, мы уже туда идем. Это как бы фантастика. I just sent you a reference. I don't know if you know this, but if you just take case. So. I wonder about either Stevie I'm doing parody readings in the interwar periods if I ever refers to them. And that's all I know about it is that she went to the reading and said, oh, it's a Sibiriani. She kept growing. Everyone came to see them. And I don't know if they must have been in the It's very, very nice. Looking forward to it. Next version.
Yeah, I think that's one of the first reasons we need to option. Yeah, I think that's right. Isabel, I sent you the Thank you. I'm sorry. Yeah. Yeah, the pre-code. Right. Especially if I'm not going to have nothing else. Yeah. Not use that, but it's definitely good. I hope the range is not that. Да, это с 13 год, да, и пока Я вот. И там был длинный дебат о том, можно ли это считать тогда еще, можно ли это считать хорошим стюками. Ну, сейчас, сейчас ты говоришь хорошим Нет, но она всегда есть. Сейчас она стала понятна, что мы не притворяемся, что она как-то естественно. Да? Это, 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 ну, есть политика спуса, есть политика суждения. Ну, да. как бы, ну, с Лигу как-то Ну, именно. Нет, нет, читатели стал просто очевидно, что есть некоторый набор расов. Я ловил, и мне стыдно, что я как бы цитировал что-то. Да, а оказывалось, что в реальности это вообще не обязательно такое, как пушкинская нянец. А я тоже понимала, что это все было. Ну а дальше мы не вспоминаем, So he did it with Я не могу сказать, что 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 я не могу с
And uh, in the US, you need to invite some interaction with people. And of course, you don't want to invite which does kind of have some. <laughs> Yeah, 
The problem is people are also used to Okay, so 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 going in. Going in. Going into the Okay, can we uh you want to see it, but he's there, right? I think it was with the owl, does it work differently? Somehow we always had me look. There he is. Yeah. Ah here yeah. Um, И, конечно, можно или по-английски, или по-русски, как хотите. Мы так начнем с Марта. Thank you so much. Uh, so first of all, I have to apologize. I, I made a horrible mistake, which I um, understood. It. Revealed only today at 1 a.m. when I looked at my text at Dropbox and realized that I uploaded the wrong version of my file, mm -hmm. then edited one. Not that the one that you have now is significantly better, but at least it doesn't have most blatant typos and, and grammar errors. So um, I understand that this text is, is, is longer than it should be. Uh, and uh, I actually can see now where, where it can be compressed. But my problem was that, so to, Starting to think about what is what was to be the uh, Soviet poet, I realized that I'm dealing not so much with performative identities, but with something like stuffing schedule, start mm -hmm. uh, that had been created throughout several decades, and that uh, that was not as as again I, I realized in, in the process was not entirely sort of one-way process. It was not only sort of uh, projected from above onto poetry, there, there were negotiations and I tried to reflect some of them. Um, and for instance, uh, that, that, this is why I dedicate uh, so much space to uh, the debate around Bukharin's keynote at the first uh, Congress, because he, he was trying to revise uh, the, 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 the trends and, and this didn't work out. Um, and uh, uh, of course, I understand that the reductionist approach that, for instance, I, I look at Silivanovsky's uh, book of 1936 and, and sort of try to extract this um, spectrum of poetic identities uh, from it. But that, that wasn't sort of, it was the easiest way to deal with the problem rather than. Uh, going uh, across many other sources. Um, so, so my my point is, and I think that uh, it is. I hope that it is it is uh, seen in the, in the chapter that that these poetic identities they 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 were sort of promoted and solidified and started to melt, uh, but but remained active and. Uh, uh, their, their, their function was, in my opinion, predominantly institutional because they defined, defined the channels for, for the existence of poetry, the, the publication plans, the, the, the journal sort of portfolio, the admittance of young poets into the union of writers, uh, the, the, the system of prizes and, and awards. 
So all, all this, all these things were based around this. It was not a total system. There are, there are holes in it, there are exceptions. Uh, and uh, the further we, we move along, uh, Soviet history, there are more exceptions, right? But, but still the system operates and still the system sort of pushes away those who do not fit it entirely. And we can see, of course, not only in the 30s and 50s, but also in the uh, 60s, 70s and 80s. Um, I, I, some, some things that, that I realized uh, through the process of writing surprised uh, me. For instance, uh, this, this, this presence of the uh, un, undefined uh, but very clearly tangible um, phenomenon of neo-romantic poets. It's, it's quite my term and that they, they rarely use it. It, 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 it is something that, that not only Silvanus can book shows, but lots of other poetic personalities fit into. Um, and the transformation, uh, I, I actually, when I was beginning to write, I thought that I will uh, look at the wartime or frontline uh, poet as a special entity, uh, because of course the entire front generation was, was, was basing their, their their presence in literature on that identity. But then then I I could see that that's just a transformed neo romantic uh, identity with, with with some specific specific elements. And the example of Akujava is is a very bright confirmation to to, to this to this connection. <coughs> Um, so, also, also I want to emphasize that, that uh, very rarely the poet, a given poet, would, would be sort of wearing this, this, sort of, this I wouldn't say mask uh, until, until we, we are coming to Ustushenka, uh, wearing this uh, suit uh, all the time. The, 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 this way then is that, that the poets could, could juggle, could, could shift from, could use for different different uh, texts and different uh, genres. But of course, uh, Ivtushenka, again, I, I never could make peace with, with, with Ivtushenka. I never could figure out what's, what's his role in, in, in Russian history of literature. And I think that this, this typology explains what, what he did. He, he created the meta-Soviet poet who can be anybody right who can can play any any part in this nomenclature but at the same time the the, the ease with which he was switching this these roles made them develop them transform them from some kind of you know statutory positions into paper mass that, that he was swapping um, in one poem or in one book easily right and even in one performance he, he, he could move from, from one and he he was very um, temperamental performer of his of his poetry, and so he could he could shift the gears very very effectively. Um, and and of course from there, there there is a direct link, in my opinion, to to Prigov, who just creates the the, the, the mockery of this meta poet position. And uh, but but the uh, paradoxically, some kind of the um, potential of Prigov is already present in Ivtushin. And that's why I'm inserting this strange uh, quote from Prigov where he speaks about Yutushenka as some kind of the manifestation of uh, the, the performance of, of being a poet and entering any, any rooms, just, just, just breaking something, which Olga Matic confirmed that, that, that when they went to the restaurant, he, he immediately broke some tree uh, <laughs> and caused the havoc. Um, so I, I understand that that, that Lots of things um, are not done here. For instance, in the beginning, I'm saying that, that interesting things would, would appear on the margins of these positions through hybridization, and I never returned to this. Um, I, I really didn't find the place. For that. I didn't know where, where, where to, to, to insert this because I, I went over the uh, word count big time. So, so I had to think how, how to cut chunks of this text and adding, adding more is important, but I, I need to figure out how. So I, I'm very much open to, to, to suggestions, ideas, criticism, etc. Um, yeah, uh, yes, thank you. And this, uh, I mean, 
this is a handbook chapter, but I still have a theoretical question, which I was thinking about when I was listening to you. And uh, uh, specifically, how does this your discussion of masks relate to the formless category of Lirichesky Geroi? Because we think about it as uh, a temporal or whatever, but it's actually very much historically connected, right? And uh, they don't, I don't think there is a 19th century Russian poet who actually had one uh, in, in the formula. So it's basically conceptualizing the death of Bloch, right? It comes out of the, like the Soviet situation, conceptualizing the death of Bloch. So there is this phenomenon. And then we have Nadezhda Mandelstam having this conversation with Tanyanov about how uh, Lirichsky Giroi is a form of developing a mask under the conditions of the Soviet regime. You need to have a role that you play. And for Nadezhda Mandelstam, this is what Tanyanov's theory of uh, Lirichsky Giroi is about. And Tanyanov in her uh, narrative sort of confirms that when he says Mandelstam should do this. So it's basically a form of, uh, of finding your place under, under the Soviet regime. So a lot of that, uh, a lot of what you write about seems to, to kind of to feed into this sort of. Mm. You, you, you know, I, I if, if um, this test produces this impression. I, I would rather sort of add something because because in my perception, it's not about the, the lyrical uh, hero uh, because lyrical hero is 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 the, the internal categories within the intent, right? Here it's it's something uh, uh, like what what Rigoff again used to call for the poet, uh, which is some kind of the meta action, so some kind of the combination of the relation between uh, the poet text uh, societal societal sort of um, context and poetics poetics is a very important part of each of these um, identities uh, because because th there is certain certain range of poetic devices that that, that each of them presupposes right uh, and I was trying to, to, to define them maybe, maybe too briefly so so, so the, the, the Poet Tribune is one thing, and uh, Isian from, from small small letter is a very different spectrum of poetry. It should be folkloric, but was a folkloric, it was stylized. It, it, it basically um, is alien to any kind of formal experiment, while Poet Tribune can kind of force certain, certain formalism uh, with, <laughs> within reasonable limits, etc. cetera. Uh, and uh, the same goes to, to, to the satires, the same goes to to this this function uh, to the function of the uh, women's poet, which which again to, to, to my surprise I realized that uh, women poet appears as a social cultural social cultural function right only uh, in the sixties only after after the sort of publications of Matvey Svitaeva and of course uh, there, there, there was a response coming. From the new uh, response to the to the new generation uh, of uh, poets uh, uh, coming in, in, into literature about that time, but but it was it was some kind of thematic scope. It was the the in, in, not necessarily international, but but uh, formal scope and lyrical uh, character could be different. There is, there is a difference between say um, lyrical ly lyrical hero of Bagritsky. Uh, and Svetlov, this is not the same, and the, 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 they are characterized in different ways. But their relation, sort of vis-a-vis -vis, uh, revolutionary mythology, right, and uh, contemporary life, and their scope of themes, they are concrete. So, so I, I think that's an important point of question, but it, it needs mm -hmm. to be distinguished. Yeah. Um, so, um, I think that. I learned a tremendous deal, and mm -hmm. uh, as a non-specialist, I wouldn't know what to cut. I mean, I had some idea, Thank you. but I wanted to hear what your ideas were. I'm, I'm curious about how you're thinking of compacting this, and at what point you think you're going to um, And one thing I would advocate is um, certainly keeping and maybe even, well, I don't know if amplifying, but, but keeping at its current size, uh, stuff on children's. Mm -hmm. uh, poetry. First of all, because there's nowhere else that the theories in the, in the handbook. And secondly, that I I really learned a lot about what you said about it, that it's not the same human, and that it's regulated by the same rules, and that it's a, a kind of 
not a separate domain. Yeah. Right? And so, um, so I think that 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 should really um, stay. I didn't perhaps learn as much from your incorporation of you know at at the, at the Congress of, of um, the voices from the different republics, and I wanted to learn more because once again, that too is not anywhere else in the in the handbook and that was a very interesting corollary example because you then i think the translation you do examine as a safe thing right on the, 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 yeah, the, the, the position of translation right yeah it's it's some some kind of the loophole so, so right so so that was interesting to me that children's literature was not right and that was a strong argument there and that translation uh you know that we were, we were data confirmed it. so so um i wanted more on that mm -hmm. um there's so, something else i was going to say. so so about about the the, the children, children's poetry of course i i'm citing marina by it's, it's mm -hmm. not my my in the book there's nothing yeah like so so I, I i can expand on that this argument um with, with the national poet uh, first of all, it's it's unfinished uh, segment uh, I have there so to write more about Jambu. I was waiting for for, for the book on Jambu uh, and um, the, the, so some other publications that they didn't have in my possession before. So so I'm going to to, to expand that and uh, it's it's um, it's very easy and very complicated and 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 very dangerous place to go uh, as you certainly understand. So it should, it should be. Written carefully, but for instance, uh, from what I know I know about uh, Jambu now, the the the, um, the overall opinion is that uh, he was mainly the creation of translators. So 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 we really don't know what he was thinking. Uh, but but translators sort of created the, 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 this poet, and that was a very successful enterprise. However, there, there were other cases, right? And at the same time, there were, there were very prominent poets who were, you know, silenced exactly because they were not admitted on the same level as as those, those appointed national poets. Right? Uh, the, the situation with, with Georgian poets was but very different. And actually, the the report from Georgian literature at the Congress is completely different from, from anything that the other represent. It's basically a history of Georgian literature. From Shatar uh, Ustaveli, it, it's as long as I don't know Marshak's keynote, and they, 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 they speak very moderately about revolutionary parties and little segment in the great, great history of the great literature. Uh, so, so they, they had their their very interesting position there. Um, but, but in all this, we can see we can see some 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 kind of matrix dominating uh, dominating the, the presentation and uh dominating poetry i need to look into this i i i, I didn't do it properly yet and that's that's uh, where i see the, the necessity to write uh what i understand that may be may be shortened <clears throat> is the first uh subsection about the discussions in the 1920 and there are, there are i think too many close there it can be compressed everybody knows well, not everybody knows, but I can I can speak shorter about mm -hmm. Rab Perival and Lev and, and, and their, their, their favorite course. Mm -hmm. That was my sense. Yeah. 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 And I remember what I was going to say at the last question. That's about masculinity. Mm -hmm. And uh, whether I mean, we asked about a woman poet, but, but there does seem to be some alignment between at least certain uh, shapes of the Soviet poet with. Mm -hmm. With a, uh, a construction of a certain kind of masculinity, certainly with A. Mayakovsky with a small letter M, right? Mm -hmm. In some ways, also with the Visenian, right? Mm -hmm. But I'm also thinking of this, like, um, kind of the Bagritsky line, right? Mm -hmm. uh, which, uh, you know, is beautiful, right? From Gumilov to Bagritsky. It's, it's, um, and that's certainly, that to me is a particularly Soviet line of masculinity. I have a comment on Prigov that maybe isn't from Mark, maybe it's for the complete anthology. I find Prigov so funny, particularly when he was reading aloud, but also when reading, because he's doing the Pushkinian meter so perfectly that the trained brain lies down in furs. <laughs> and, and there's this kind of Pavlovian response to meter. That, that I don't get from other 
poets of his group as much. And it's it's precisely that expert deployment of of the is there like a neuroscientific mm -hmm. study of the effects of meter and what happens when you pull away from it? Of course, you get the the, the difference is, is more intensely perceived, but I just wonder is is anybody writing on something like that? The Manning House talk we went to in Princeton. Uh, there is a German Institute of Applied Aesthetics that study this, the, the brain's responses to, to, to meter. I, I believe this. Okay. Uh, and Mila, you wanted to add? Thoughts? Yeah, Mark, thank you uh, for your wonderful paper. And when you mentioned uh, the privileges and uh, the things that kind of poets got, right? I wondered about poetry as an institution and whether, for, forgive me if, if I'm ignorant on this, is there any study by a historian about places like the Matvorchestva CDL where poets kind of performed that social role and you know places like Pitsunda, places like Nida, places like Aktebel. I'm asking this because I grew up going to those places and was struck by the fact that it was called Don Tvorchstva but poetry was never read there. So um, it was kind of a, it was a space where you signal where you belong and what class you belong to but um i don't recall a lot of discussions about poetry or literature for that matter so um if you know of any study like that i'm just very curious if anything like that was published there are works of, first of all about the the, the union of Soviet writers um, that yeah I'm, I'm aware of that but i was thinking specifically about Dom Tvorchestva as, a, as an institute. There's a recently published article by a graduate article by, 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 by your student. So <laughs> not, not so many about these places per se, but, but within the discussion of the union, uh, of course, they, they, they talk about privileges associated with the membership. Uh, and um, Dabrianka writes about this as well in his Harmoka, Zavetskva Pisaka, the building of the privileged class out of the writer. Uh, and, and, and certainly I, I, I can cite more of this uh, and can give more references. Indeed, this is an important question, you're right, because this, the, the, this poetic persona that has been created, that, that's why I'm quoting, uh, calling it the staff uh, schedule, because it was indeed the staff schedule in this Ministry of Literature, and uh, privileges uh, were associated with, with this position, right? uh, including even the, uh, as, as we know, for instance, the uh, members of the Union of uh, Subtractors were uh, released from the um, obligatory service in the Soviet Army. Mm -hmm. That they had this, not during the time of mobilization, but, but uh, on in the peace time, so they, they were not uh, recruited, not recruited high school, you please avoid it. Plus, of course, there were, uh, for instance, the, the, the the norms, for instance, for for apartments, and they had more uh, meters, square meters per person. Uh, th there were houses for for writers. So, so th th this was a luxurious position in in society for for poet or prose writer. There was not too much difference, but poet, we, uh, we could understand, for instance, that that the, that the prose writer can can publish a novel and get then republish it and live on honorarium. Uh, the poet couldn't live on honorarium, actually, unless this was, you know, Gimian uh, Bielki, or the publishing several books per year. Right? Uh, but the, the, the privileges allowed them to, to keep a very, very, I would say, fine level uh, with, with one book published per year, for example, because journal publications, lectures, uh, readings, etc. That, that, that all was bringing a uh, certain income. Mm -hmm. I don't know if, if, if I should write about it, I, I can make a uh, paragraph too. Yeah. Actually, to, uh, to follow up, if I may, I, I think it would, uh, it's, a, it's a brilliant chapter, but I think some factual sociological information uh, would be really, really interested, and it will correspond with McCabe's uh, uh, discussion of 
uh, the poetry of the 19, uh, 1840s, uh, 50s, yeah. and uh, 60s. I was also thinking uh, about the criteria of tirage, uh, copyright. Uh, uh, print who print were print uh, print 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 yeah. uh, who were the most published mm -hmm. uh, 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 poets of it, uh, poets as a criteria uh, for the uh, uh, for the title? Was it decide or not? Mm -hmm. I don't know. Yeah, well, because there should be this I information, but it might be interesting to I see how many copies were you know, published of this particular book. And just imagine, because it should be like definitely uh, strikingly more than any poet in England in the United States, with the exception of Shakespeare. Uh, uh, probably Mayakovsky has been dead poet, uh, but uh, it would take the 1970s, for example, right. or uh, the early 80s. Who would be? Who I was? It's, they should, it's a great question. I didn't know. They should be this, uh, 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 this information. Absolutely. Uh, Absolutely. Thank you. Yeah. I mean, and you would cite as an interesting uh, example of uh, kind of perfect Soviet Polish. Uh, yeah. Well, when the Soviet Union ends, he ceases to be a poet. Yeah. yeah. He, he, he moves to the village and starts to produce ham, hands or eggs. This, this kind of stuff. Right. <laughs> He finally makes himself useful. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> oh, really? Oh, what was it? Igor Isai. Igor Isai was <laughs> sort of the official version of uh, Tikha Lyrica, but he was not very Tiki. Uh, <laughs> he, he was also writing some, some um, poems. Uh, so, so it was, I would say, the, the right uh, uh, wing version of Twardowski. Uh, he, he was combining the, this Decenian image with certain social pathos, but the social pathos was uh, pretty nationalistic, and, and he was very much exploiting uh, uh, sort of to, 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 to connect with today the, 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 the wartime period. There, there were some, some angry poems, long narrative poems, it's Michael's character, uh, about the traitors, about collaborators, so this kind of stuff. And he was an epitome of all the Soviet uh, national uh, and avoid it. an extremely uh, popular, but no one read his poems. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> very, very so, so national Russian poet or national Soviet, Soviet. nationalist Soviet, Soviet poet. nationalist. Okay. Yeah. So he's okay, because I thought that maybe national. Oh, maybe it's a label. It's a label. Just the name, because I, I read a couple of poems, but I saw the collection oh. uh, of his poems. National poets is one. Nationalist poet is well, completely okay. different. <laughs> okay. I think it's fascinating to think about Kirkman, but I'm not convinced that that actually helps us understand the performance of the role of the Soviet poet, unless we have cases where there are boasts about Kirkman, where there's competition, blah, blah, blah. So, I will look into this. Yeah, and, and That feels to me like it will get you off. I would be interested in your writing in the timelines uh, right, on, on Soviet and, and some of that and some of that. I'm not sure you could be getting yeah. but maybe we could just help to write a, a sentence about it. I can add a footnote. I can add a Yeah, yeah. I mean, it, it, you know, as Ilya uh, is especially good at doing this, Ilya is especially good at doing it. So, like, a juicy story where print run matters. Mm -hmm. Could be fabulous, well, just, but, I, but seeing the amount of the print run, I've been fascinated to see what the print runs were for crappily, poorly produced mm -hmm. science fiction novels on on bad paper that are now falling apart. And I got for one cent plus mailing on Amazon mm -hmm. that you know two hundred thousand copies, which would be insanely good for somebody in the Anglo American market. We have a student but, doing a dissertation on this. Yeah, it's I think I think it's interesting to see because it it reflects the approval of. The poet all it reflects it doesn't reflect their popularity among readers or well, what people buy yeah. but it's yeah it's like, I mean, yeah, like we have one of the Isabel's uh, paper right the 800 people in the British Museum and then, and then uh, 14,000 mm. in the stadium and so that was very it uh, certainly is very clear readers love numbers I know that they're not too many uh you know. yeah I just it's a small question about privileges, the distribution of privileges, and who would take them or not. I, I, I don't think you mentioned the font. No. Right? Let's say Akhmatova in her the most horrible years was a member of the right. Font and was getting some uh, like medical, I think, services, like buying uh, train tickets 
On the other hand, I think Brodsky never was, mm -hmm. right? And that's why he was going to the edits. Mm -hmm. So this was like a second mm -hmm. way second to distribute. Way. And she and her father never never refused mm -hmm. this. And, and we remember when when Kostinak was expelled yeah. from right. the union, and he, he remained he the member of yes, the, the member of the court, right? Yeah. So <laughs> um, this is a question as much to the editors as to Mark. Uh, I also find that the chapter is really interesting and, and, and very mm -hmm. valuable. Um, but the, you know, I would I in my yeah, written article, I was considering going and including Yevdushek and Bratska, I guess. And then the question the issue is like how many times do we want to mention this in the handbook, right? It, it's uh, sort of it makes it look, but I also feel kind of uncomfortable writing about Yiftushin because he was such an unpleasant person. But on the other hand, you know, he was very symptomatic of certain things. But on the other hand, we want to see him twice in, in, in one handbook. I think. So, I, this I, is the question I, to editors. Yeah. It's for the particular I think, very big impression. That yeah. 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 Well, I think we'll talk about Historians of literature should deal with this. I mean, I would just kind of say that I thought. The, the way Mark handled him was especially useful. Mm -hmm. And um, I just actually got a note from your student, Julie, he wants to go off asking me, but did he looking for material? Is anybody writing interesting? He, he can't believe that he can't find it. I think he just needs a small amount on the yeah. Shinko stadium poet. Mm -hmm. Yushinko was Nitinsky. And of course, my response is I can't think of anything else off my head, write mm -hmm. to Mark. Mm -hmm. um, so <laughs> I think it's, you know, there, there's a little bit of a hole there. Now, whether we also want it in Payama, I don't know, but it's... it's, 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 it's uh, I, I don't know if, if, if my experience of editor of a, a parallel project in the same series, uh, I think that the, the cross-referencing is, is a beautiful mm -hmm. one. And when the same phenomenon appears in different chapters, it, it nice. creates some kind of a 3D effect. Yes, I think that's what we've been thinking about. Mm -hmm. If it's important for your argument, you yeah. don't care it. You're hearing more than one. I think that's true. And also, as we know, people aren't going to read the book start to mm -hmm. finish. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, uh, certainly also one of the goals of the handbook is to expand the number of texts and authors that you've mentioned. And I was thinking, Michael, to your question, um, because your uh, piece is in the fictional forms, I wonder if the it's kind of... What? Mine is a good book. Yours is a good book. Right, right. right. Mine, mine. Okay, yeah, that's a um, that, that you're not as bound to the problem of, well, which one was more important kind of in terms of conception, but, but more in terms of form, right? Well, where do we locate the most interesting experiments? And so that might uh, liberate you from having to do brush the gas uh -huh. and maybe open it up to something that would be a, a more unusual event. I don't know what that would be. Right. Yeah. But I would say that Bratska Gas is an important example. Right. Mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. right. That's probably the, the, the most. Um, can I check? Oh, um, go ahead. Yeah, well, um, you, you, you are. I'll, I'll go last. Um, <laughs> well, um, I, I, I found that chapter fascinating in part because as a compared to somebody who works on, on, uh, on ancient literature, that's exactly how we analyze uh, archaic Greek literature. So, so going back to your question, <laughs> an kind of anthropology of subject positions that imply a particular kind of self-presentation, who is an actor? Somebody who writes a kind of poetry, somebody who lives a kind of life, mm -hmm. somebody who we can imitate in an Acreant of Odes mm -hmm. many centuries after an uh, yeah, lived. So it's a kind of what you're describing really is a system of almost genres, mm -hmm. uh, but you never really say that a, a kind of an emergent, um, institutionally grounded, uh, a very strange system of genres uh, with the kind of a name of the poems. Um, so that just seems very, very true to how I um, um, think of Soviet poetry as a kind of peculiar moment in the history of Russian poetry. But what we think is important is, um, as, as Helen is, is distinguishing between what we call emic and etic categories, mm -hmm. or like phonemic and phonetic. Uh, uh, so those characters that were used by contemporaries, so those that we imposed on them when we described the system. 
So for example, when you say near modernness in quotation marks, I wasn't, it feels as though this is something that you, your term as opposed Absolutely. to something they, they use. So occasionally I, I felt I need more clarity on, the, on this. Uh, or are you uncovering the system that they came up with? Or are you uh, coming up with the, a new terminology? As for you, Toshanka, I feel um, you're quite right that he's playing with different subject positions. But this is not really his invention. This kind of wit, wit, wit uh, I am this, I am that, I am all these things. So it's already there within the kind of a, um, in, in a sense, already there in Mikovsky a little bit, in, in so far as Mikovsky is building on Whitman. So, so in Babiya, where he shifts between all these different subject positions, for example, mm. or in the poem that you uh, use, Pasternak, Yesenin, uh, Mayakovsky, uh, there he's not shifting subject positions, but he's using the forms and the, the meter. Exactly yeah. So uh, similarly, um, also on the on this, in fact, he mentions Whitman right there, mm -hmm. uh, and you mentioned. And I think uh, in terms of the audience, one final point is you need to uh, make it just a bit more because some of you readers would not catch these illusions, say, and you take it for granted that everybody would recognize that this is a, an illusion to the Sitanian problem. Mm -hmm. But in fact, uh, only specialists are going okay. to recognize that um, in, in an also a small fatherland, maybe. Uh, but that's more editorial thing. It probably will also won't be lost. Uh, uh, things like that. And what way? No, you just have some more modeling, but I, I, I'm not sure that would be clear unless you gloss it. But I think it's something for the editors. But uh, in general, yes, a fascinating chapter. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you so much. Yeah, I understand that there is a problem with these definitions like near romantic and near modern. Uh, the problem here is that. Uh, the, 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 the phenomenon was present, but the name wasn't. Mm -hmm. At least I don't know. Right? Uh, I remember how in the 80s, uh, the poets say of, of Tarkovsky's uh, some of uh, brand would be Akushnev for that matter. There was a huge discussion in literature, I can and bring it up if necessary, about lots of, uh, basically about intertextuality of, of this kind of poets that was at first, um, triggering angry reactions, but eventually this discussion that, oh no, it's okay, it's fine, they're, they're good. Uh, and and uh, what kind of terminology was used there? Kulturne poet, that, that's what was said, <laughs> cultured poet, it's, it's, it's absolutely <laughs> crazy. Right? So, so, so I, I, I don't know, I can bring up this, this very much vague uh, definitions that, that basically were trying to say without saying that they are Returning to to modernism, they're, they're, they're trying to restore modernism in the censored censored uh, publications, right? Uh, as as to Ivtushenko, you say I think that there is a difference between the adoption of the other subjects' position, sort of poetic scars, which which which, which we see plenty of, and adoption of the other poets' position. Right? So, so and as I said, this was done. Everywhere, everybody could, could play a little bit of Mayakovsky, a little bit of Vicenin, sometimes uh, here, sometimes there. But he was doing this with, with more prominence and more uh, gusto, that, uh, gusto than, than any other. And this this fragment, of course, from Marit Vapirit Poeme shows that he, he, he directly stylizes. Of course, he does this intentionally. Yeah. It's, it's, it's almost a quotation, right? But, but these are his inspirations. And, Indeed, when we read uh, I guess we, we can see some, some part of the conversations with, with the pyramid are written in, in, in Mayakovsky's uh, graphic style, right? Uh, others uh, are imitating uh, uh, right? the, 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 this very sentimental narrative. Is a crime a dispatcher Sveta, so that, 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 that goes along, along Papi Yar, sort of stylistic. So, so, so this. He, he was doing this, but but at the same time he was using different different poetic persona. I agree that this is kind of genres. Should should I use the word genre? I don't know. I, 
what do you think should it I actually think, going back to my question, I actually think that, uh, and I agree with what what is said, but I think that the the so when you responded to me and you said this is not a lyrical hero because this and this, and I think this is exactly what lyrical hero is about. So lyrical personas, I understand that the the, the term has different connotations, but really emphasizing the aspect that Boria emphasized, lyrical personas that do not that are types of subjects. Right, that are produced that have that are tied to particular kinds of utterances. That is the whole thing. I think this is uh, this is more more uh, applicable than genres is a much more vague thing here than than specifically what the kind of thing that what I was talking about. Pigalov uses I'm sorry, uh, the term uh, the poet's legend, right? In, in, in this article about law. Mm -hmm. So maybe this, this is it, the poet's legend. That's that's what he means by literaturne lichness, right? That, okay, we don't know the personality, but there is an illusion of a personality behind verse and... and... But including that specificity about kinds of utterance seems really important to me. Because one term that is native to the period still is lyricism and mm -hmm. lyric. And how that's being used in the Soviet era seems very distinctly to me. And so maybe being explicit about what the Soviet understanding of a lyric speaker is at all, because it always seems to be being pushed towards something more like social or epic or something. It's a very strange amalgam. Mm -hmm. um, and so being specific about what that sounds like in the culture, that would be very helpful. Mm -hmm. um, the other thing I was wondering, I mean, I, I love this comment for us because it also you're thinking about continuity right beyond this period, so pre and post Soviet. And um, I mean, since I, I, I just asked, Mark, it's about Isaiah, right, who I think would be a really great example to include. <laughs> because, <laughs> well, I mean, oh, we have national, <laughs> Mark was making Sato Voce, uh, a distinction between national poets and nationalist poets. No. And it would be really interesting to try to understand how that kind of nationalist, nationalist. poetic speech develops in the Soviet context. I write about this maybe too briefly in connection with DC, yeah. because yeah. nationalist okay. for me means Russian nation. Okay, yeah. right. Yeah, maybe yeah. being really clear about that, how that's developing alongside the state support of mm -hmm. the other national yeah. 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 Well, it, it, it's a big, it's a big subject, of course. No. Uh, and uh, um, I mentioned the 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 the, the the rise of nationalism in the 40s period yeah, okay. that, that basically legitimized this discourse, which was there before, but it was more or less suppressed. But after the, the anti cosmopolitan campaign, mm -hmm. uh, it, 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 it had been articulated. And although the, the campaign itself was stopped, the discourse was mm -hmm. already okay. free and had to be articulated in, in literature. Mm -hmm. So maybe just a reference to Mitrochin, to no, Ruska Party. Yeah. 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 Um, Lube has been waiting and then you know. Okay, so so one thing is about genre, which I really, I, I love this comment and I love looking at this period as a, as a kind of ancient, uh, an ancient reason. I think that that's also something. Archaic. Archaic. Just archaic. Right, exactly. The, 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 there is a, I mean, that's in part, in, in part the handbooks project is to look from today, but in part it's also to, um, Look at the kind of uh, yeah you know, no that, that it's an archaic um, period that it's complete and that we do exercise a certain kind of distance even if we ourselves can remember that we recited you know a million it's, poems in, in 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 our childhood but I, I thought that if you don't find a way to bring up, up genre right we maybe as editors should at that point and it's an interesting. Um, and it's an interesting thought to develop, right? How a certain, um, you know, a, a certain poetic culture is partitioned, uh, you know, in, in, a, in a certain period. And I, I think, I think in the way uh, Makiev did something like that 
um, I mean, he was more focused on these performed identities, but I think that's what he was also doing yeah. without yeah. saying it. And, and as any person could um, create some kind of a um, narrative around this. But my point that, that I initially made my hand about was this um, quick allusion that you, um, you know, this mention that you just made. Uh, that neoromantic is your category, but the category that you noticed in, in the journal discussions in the 80s was kultur nepayadu. And to me, mm -hmm. it's a very striking and resonant category because, of course, mm -hmm. the status of culture in Soviet discourse or culturedness in Soviet discourse around poetry is a very interesting one, right? We, we think about the revival of modernism and associated with perhaps the more okay, the Tichy poet, the the the, the, Samizdat, the 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 poet of the Leningrad school, but in fact there was a certain cultivation of culturedness, which I think is more characteristic of the post-war period, and that informs what it is to be a Soviet poet, right, an intelligent mm -hmm. poet in the in the second half of the twentieth uh, century, and I think that that's a very important discussion, right, that that culturedness, in fact, is. Yet another way in which the division into official and non-official does not quite hold. Right? And then, um, as I was thinking that thought, Kathy brought up lyricism, and I thought that lyricism is yet another category exactly like that, which which has been completely taken over by Soviet discourse, and which um, became a kind of uh, very general descriptor. I think Kathy mentioned that, or, or was it not Kathy? I'm already confused about this. That you mentioned that maybe it functions more as an epic mm -hmm. uh, category or, or, or something like that. And I think I think it's it's sort of analogous to the way culture or culturedness functions as a, as a positive assessment of something. Mm -hmm. um, but I haven't really thought this through and you, you might um, have so, so 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 th to think upon these ideas, they they, they all incredibly useful. Um, about culturedness, I, I think that that connect very well with. Bukhari's speech because he actually said culture, culture, culture. Right. And they don't and, want it. And they didn't want it. Yeah. Right. And it was sort of culture. Uh, and so the, 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 the thing returns with a vengeance in, in, in this sense. Uh, right. Um, as to the lyricism, indeed, the, 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 this is sort of a poetic signifier. And uh, it's being, being used when, when uh, there is a feeling that. That subjectivity is being so much uh, ossified that, that there is nothing to talk about it. And uh, it was good words. So I, I cited those, those articles of 1953. So it's literally a month after Stalin's death. Mm -hmm. And it's a pretty scandalous article uh, where, where she says that you don't have personalities now, poetry. What this poetry is about is just pure frozen formulas. Right? So, so lyricism starts to appear when there is no. There is no subject, right? Uh, so, so, so lyricism is some kind of indicator of the, the discussion about lyricism. Um, and, and think, I will look into this and I will look into, and I think that, that of course, um, Gilbrook's uh, Alirik in 1964, the first first edition, right, is, is indeed the response to this demand to, to redefine what lyricism is in and, and of course the fact that she engages modernist poets is, is also a very powerful cultural gesture. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think this engages with Boris's comment about unique and uh, categories, right? Because you lift out these categories that are from the period and that are in fact for all their vagueness are incredibly rich. So they're better than 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 invented. Well, you can still call this new or romantic or whatever, but, but I think you know go 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 into these. It's very very interesting. So using the the, the, the term Komsomolsky poet, which basically means the same. I think it sounds more more alienating than no, no, new romantic. But, but but in culture and lyrical, right? yeah, of course, that, mm -hmm. that's terms from the period that I rethought. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah. Oh, uh, Ilya's been waiting. No, 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 I'm not. I uh, yeah, I've heard it. Well, maybe uh, it's a little bit uh, crazy uh, idea, but I was thinking uh, about uh, a related concept of Sovietized uh, poets, which can serve a good purpose uh, for the handbook if we choose, for example, what they did with Pushkin in the Soviet world, right. how they Soviet type were. And it, it worked not only uh, uh, diachronically, but synchronically as well. So how did they so, uh, Sovietize Western poets or Eastern poets? 
uh, even starting from the 1930s, I would say. Uh, I don't know, Lang Sun Hugh uh, or uh, Chinese poets. Uh, so what they did uh, to appropriate uh, certain authors, including the authors which we discussed in different uh, uh, chapters, uh, for their icon painting of the Soviet um, uh, author. Because Pushkin uh, from the 1937 is definitely uh, uh, patent uh, after the uh, uh, Soviet poet, which particular topics of Pushkin's poetry were chosen, how Pushkin is presented during uh, World War II, until Great Patriotic, uh, were as a uh, Soviet poet, uh, the uh, airplane uh, named after Pushkin, Istribitel uh, Alexander Sergeyevich Pushkin, yeah, there was such a, um, but uh, similar things actually, uh, similar things, um, yeah. Holy Ghost uh, 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 happened with uh, Western poets, specific poets, Aragon, for example, uh, in France, although it's a dominant, but it's a very, yeah, it's a very, but I don't know, like, any example, maybe one, two examples, what they did also by Sovietizing uh, those who were not present at this particular uh, moment, but played a similar uh, uh, function, yeah. which is elusive uh, for this very total totalitarian uh, uh, project. Everything which falls uh, within this range mm -hmm. is Sovietized. Yeah, that, 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 that band. Yeah. And it works with the Lenkovsky and Yesenian uh, exactly. getting their small... Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, and yeah, yeah, so right. they, they were projected retroactively yeah. uh, on, on, onto the Russian past. But about Putin, I know, whom to reference. Right. There is uh, John Platt's book about the yeah. celebration of Pushkin's death in 1970. Uh, and uh, there are articles Seth, Stephanie wrote about this. So, mm -hmm. so there, there, there are many. Uh, I, I think there is less about, for example, Nikrasov, mm -hmm. who, who, who was translated into some kind of proto mm -hmm. uh, which he is not, right? But, Mm -hmm. uh, uh, yeah, that, that makes he perfect. actually becomes a mix of Mankowski and Yesenia. Yeah, right? yeah, so that, that could work really nice. Yeah. Thank you. Yes, uh, yes I uh, think of going back to the uh, conversation about genre, so not just to, to Mark, but to all of us, to the editors, if we think about it. And I think kind of going, uh, first of all, I think that cultured poets is a fantastic term for the title. Mm. from the proletariat <laughs> poet to the culture poet. Uh, it's like, okay, what? what? Uh, it has this, this uh, weird list, right? Cultured poets. Uh, uh, but uh, um, picking up the whole idea of genre and specifically with the reference to Lady Ginsburg's book, I think that the, the uh, complicated thing about the category of the genre, that's the question whether we want to bring it in, is that genre is actually a way of uh, re reflecting or interacting with reality outside of literature. It's just not, not just a way of classifying text within themselves, right? So genre has a particular relationship to uh, society, reality, whatever we want to call it, right? A touristic function. Yes, yes. So in this case, if we understand lyrica as a genre, right, which is which might work exactly in Ginsburgian sense, but it's a very ambitious project to develop that argument. And I think that, I totally agree, and I think that this is what Ginsburg is doing. She's developing the theory of lyric as a particular form of producing uh, particular kinds of uh, social historical subjectivities. So lyric as a mode of producing the historical subject. This is what she says. This is the introduction to, and I'm, I, I was rereading this, the, the second edition, so I don't know what the first edition said, but this is what the introduction to the 1974 book says, right? So if this is unpacked, and this is again what I'm trying to do with Tanyana's concept of literary, um, of literary uh, um, hero, not to apply it, but to unpack it all over again, right? If we unpacking formalism in this sense, Tanyanov and Ginsburg, then we might come to a to to the whole understanding of lyrica, lyric as a particular form within Soviet society, not just literature, not just a sub subdivision of literature. But that is something that might be outside of individual of Marx's essay or anyone's essay for that matter. If there's any way Mark could do it a little bit. Um, 
that's a, a very cool idea. And I think it would be another benefit of the handbook. Again, if you think about our colleagues outside of the Slavic field, trying to get them to see, you know, alternative formalists. To, that's what uh, Ginsburg is known, but not for our reading yet. Mm -hmm. So, okay. I think that we should have another collect. Another whole yeah. another, yeah. another one because I, I actually in thinking about this is on the side, but but in, in thinking about this book that I'm writing on nature lyric, I, I I almost imagined it as a rewriting of Ginsburg and as a dialogue with Ginsburg and mm -hmm. uh, and I, I was thinking that maybe we should have a reading group on on and and that would be some kind of uh, mm -hmm. uh, a cluster of articles. Yeah, yeah, some some something. Yeah. But, but as a side even, product, we don't have to produce it. Just, uh, thank you. Oh, it's uh, no, it's, 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 it's a great, it's a great session, but we have to wrap it up because it's inevitably yeah. eating. Uh -huh. So okay. we still have, you know, we still have a good fifty-five minutes. Okay. Should, yeah. should we plunge we in? Yes. Yeah. He's there. Tanya will make. Yeah. Mm -hmm. right. uh, do you no. do you want to rest a bit or can we stand up and stretch? Yeah, yeah stand up and stretch. Yeah. Five minutes. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Martin. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. What is that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, 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 yeah. Мы эту борьбу с ассоциацией не дотянем. Но она не дотянута, мы дотянем. Значит, я думаю, что надо принять на спасибо. Спасибо, давай. Да, да. Пожалуйста, дорогой, дорогой, дорогой. Ну, тогда здесь ты что, блин, меняю просто. Артем просто меняю себе раньше. Я предлагаю мы не входим за что никаким ресторанным баром нам. Я понимаю, что вы не ходите. Я понимаю, что ты еще не ходишь. Очень, очень да. мало. Да. Очень да. мало. Да. А если там будет гулять, гулять. Да. Может быть, ты понимаешь, может, поэтому я и это не делаю. Термин на верхке. Аляй на си. Время для того, чтобы быть один. Это очень важно. Чтобы уже у детей было это время, чтобы быть одним. Да, да, да. Это уже настоящий. Мне нравится тип это время. Да, аляйный тип. Чем нужно? Мне нужно немножко аляйный тип. Вот чатик же это аляйный вот так вот. Они говорят тогда. Это катастрофа отчуждения общественного. То есть, когда все сосредоточено на том, чтобы вот чтобы быть одному, да, чтобы вместе быть вместе. Это интересная обратная сторона построенного социализма. Это чужая совершенно такая Ну, я пожил в Германии, я немножко это понимаю. Ой, немцы очень активны. Я понимаю, но там есть вот это вот как бы. Такая пресистанция, что надо понадобиться. Да, тоже подумать, побыть, походить. Да, да. Знаешь, такой фильм американский, не ночью, не ночью. Приезжает картины идет в Париж следить как там продают грульян и и она вот такая вся ее ее будет такая очень специфическая она все выходит вместе она все выходит там рыбовище и все Вся парень. Вот находится.
Американская культура. Да. Ой, ой, ой. Так. Lynn, what is your kneading project? Ah, I'm using yarn that I liked. Yeah. So I had to think of something. No, oh, it's just, just a scarf. Oh, the yeah, it's just a, it's big, the, a yeah. big, long rectangle. There it is. Yeah. Yeah, yeah it's, it's very, very simple. And, mm -hmm. and um, I used to need the stops. Yeah. <laughs> I find that the same thing. Yeah, 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 exactly. It's like yeah. a video game, but if you end up it's not great. But if you sit in a meeting, it's not a whole day. I but I started so I ran into the the nice young man who's going over the world, either investigating the economics of what happens when no, no, there's a way of the world, or he plunges the world history. He's kind of an economist. I'm going to go with this. Yeah, that's the one. And it's built actually to the same. The city right on the foot of the mountains. So the, yeah. it, the city was designed so that the breeze comes down the word. And so the air is cut around the new building. Yeah. But apparently the edges of the yeah. city yeah. are inhabited by kind of bubbles. Horrible air pollution of the nature. Plastic crap. Yeah. I went to Montia, she gave me some of the It's really Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> 
the grammar is What is in the chat? Is that something? I knew I mean, is it ну все мы 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 опять не мату погрузили Okay. Um, еще раз, для пример, uh, mm -hmm. думаю, что вы знакомы с самым другими в нашей компании, а uh, может, все-таки стоило представляться, чтобы вы понимали, кто присутствует, нет? Может быть, по мере обсуждения okay. уже это сделаем, да? тем более, что я не что? очень хорошо вижу далеко сидящих за столом. Хорошо. А вы меня хорошо слышите? Все в порядке? Все в порядке. Окей. Okay. Тогда можем начинать? Да. Я, я, как и Марк, начну с извинений, даже с двух. Во-первых, я буду говорить по-русски, а во-вторых, к сожалению, я не предоставил участникам свой текст, и это обстоятельство связано, в свою очередь, с двумя причинами. Первое – это то, что называется независимая от редакции обстоятельства, но важнее второе, что я как бы до сих пор думаю над концептуальной рамкой этой темы, которая звучит как поэт, как публичный интеллектуал, потому что вот в такой, в такой формулировке применительно к материалу ну, как минимум половины истории русской литературы, а может быть даже больше, мы рискуем впасть в своего рода анахронистичность. Потому что, напомню, что термин «публичный интеллектуал» возник в конце 80-х годов, в 87-м году, в известной книжке Рассела Джейкоби, и понимается как так сказать, критерий, применимый к той или иной фигуре, получившей свой статус в, в основном в границах Академии, благодаря научным, по преимуществу, заслугам 
И благодаря вот этому своему научному статусу и положению в академию, обладающему как бы правом и, при, и при желании значит, субъекта, правом обращаться Урби Торби с к темам, выходящим за узкоспециальные рамки. Да? А, менее всего этот термин имеет в виду поэтов, а, русских в частности, но, а, так сказать, мутатис мутандис может быть применен и к истории русской литературы. А, 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 однако а, возникает вопрос, как бы, а, объема рассматриваемого материала. Соблазнительно, конечно, считать, то есть, в, 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 что, что значит проблема поэта как публичного интеллектуала. Здесь два центральных вопроса стоят. Это вопрос, кто говорит, да, вот проблема статуса, и вопрос, так сказать, медиатор, медиум, да, через что он говорит, вопрос, проблема медиа, проблема публичного поля. Понятно, что для русской литературы эти вопросы, особенно на, начальных, на начальной стадии ее существования, являются очень болезненными вопросами. Мы знаем, что там, почти весь 18 век русской литературы борется за место под солнцем, так сказать, за получение некой социальной ниши, социального пространства, которого у нее просто нет в, по большей части в большей части XVIII века, да, соблазнительно было бы считать первым русским поэтом публичным интеллектуалом Пушкина, который, вся деятельность которого как во многом направлена на именно утверждение статуса русского поэта, русского литератора. Однако, на мой взгляд, этому мешает то, что Пушкин как недостаточно эмансипирован от как бы властной машины от государства, да, потому что роль публичного интеллектуала, как кажется, как кажется, представляет, требует, вернее, некого взгляда, некого положения извне, взгляда извне, взгляда со стороны, что как бы в свою очередь обеспечивает некую независимую позицию этого взгляда. И здесь представляется, что по мере вот образования книжного рынка, по мере сказать, эмансипации литературного мира от государственных структур, мы можем говорить о возникновении публичных или интеллектуалов в литературной среде, в частности, в поэтической, наверное, все-таки ближе к концу XIX века, может быть, первой такого рода фигурой, ближе всего подходящей к этому описанию, является Мережковский. И потом, по мере появления символистского движения, по мере полемик вокруг символизма и потом постсимволизма, мы видим, как действительно из среды русских поэтов рекрутируются авторы, которых можно, можно счесть публичными интеллектуалами. Это и, и Брюсов, и э, Белый, и особенно как бы, поэт и Параксельянс, Вячеслав Иванов, Блок. А, по преимуществу а, их деятельность, сфера, так сказать, сфера обсуждаемых тем ограничена а, а, сферой эстетической. Некую, это, это касается и постсимволистской критики, когда с такого рода текстами выступают такие авторы, как Кузьмин, да, с такими построзновскими размышлениями о, о бытии, да, как раздумение думение Петра Отшельника, чушья в Неводе или после революции Стружки. Но некоторые, и Мандельштам, несомненно, со статьей Чадаеви с докладом о скрябине христианстве, но акустика этих выступлений многократно усиливается революционными событиями. Да? И здесь, конечно, центральными вот такими знаковыми фигурами выступает Блок, опять же, с его статьей «Поэзия и революция». 
и, и э, интеллигенции революции, простите, и, э, и э, Вячеслав Иванов, э, как один из соавторов переписки из двух углов. Э, дальнейш... Я очень, конечно, вкратце, так сказать, очень тезисно формулирую вот, э, э, хронику, так сказать, вот, этого будущего очерка. А в дальнейшем, мне кажется, э, э, Роль, роль поэта как публичного интеллектуала сходит на нет по мере, по мере усиления репрессий в литературной жизни в Советском Союзе, по мере как бы, сужения публичного поля, публичного пространства. И здесь, наверное, все-таки центральной фигурой противостоящей русской эмиграции является Маяковский в России и в СССР, и противостоящей ему фигурой, на мой взгляд, является Ходосевич в эмиграции, как автора, который активно затрагивает политические темы, темы, не связанные с литературой, темы, связанные с политическим переустройством мира, с политической повесткой. Да. Должны быть упомянуты Мандельштам и Пастернак, как люди, авторы уже вот на, на завершении эпохи возможно, возможного свободного обсуждения каких-то каких общественных тем, выпускающие тексты охранной грамоты и значит, мемуары, значит, как повод обращения к таким темам, и травелок, как повод обращения к таким темам, участие в Армению, а, а, ранее, а ранее тоже мемуары на шум времени, но, в общем-то, в начале 30-х все это заканчивается, и, и, на мой взгляд, тут наступает длительная пауза, вот это амплуа исчезает из русской литературы, чтобы, чтобы как-то воскреснуть уже в период оттепели и первоначально в таком странном, странном симбиозе поэта-редактора. Мне кажется, что если говорить о поэте интеллекту, о публичном интеллектуале в оттепельном Советском Союзе и в постоттепельном, это будет Твардовский который как бы реализует свою интеллектуальную функцию, такую функцию общественную через редакторство журнала, через новый мир. Да? Поэтому, который, на мой взгляд, восстанавливает вот это амплуа в таком классическом виде уже прямо, прямо приближающемся к современному нашему пониманию поэта публичного интеллектуала, был Осип Бродский, но интересно, что делает он это, будучи уже в эмиграции, делает он это на английском языке. Это не значит, что его, эта проблематика и эта, и эта как бы сфера деятельности не волновала в Советском Союзе. Мы, сказать, изучая архив Бродского, мы видим, что и будучи в СССР, он обращался к КС как жанру, однако не видел, так сказать, прагматической стороны этого дела, если, стороны этого дела. Если э, стихи могут функционировать так сказать, в списках, в устном, при, устном произношении, то, конечно, эссеистический текст, прозаический текст э, в этом смысле менее удачен. И, сказать, и, и его и, и явно этой это перспективы не увлекало, и все это оставалось так сказать, в черновиках пока он не увидел реальной возможности функционировать в таком качестве за границей. Но вскоре после отъезда Бродского в середине 70-х годов эта проблема решается по-другому в, как бы в непоцензурном советском или российском искусстве. В Ленинграде создается, сказать, рождается феномен так называемой второй культуры, когда фактически создается вторая культурная реальность, то есть неподцензурная социальная реальность, копирующая во многом институционально, копирующая первую официальную. Да, создаются институции в виде самоздатских журналов, премий. Так сказать, возникает какое-то, какое пусть небольшое, но акустическое пространство, в котором Виктор Каиулин, прежде всего, как редактор журнала «37» и как человек близкий к журналу «Часы», и Сергей Стратановский, как один из редакторов журнала «Обводный канал», вот тоже пристают, пристают как публичные интеллектуалы, обращаясь в своих статьях и к религиозным, и к историко-культурным темам. И здесь же 
уже ближе к, к э, э, середине 80-х, следует назвать Ольгу Седокову, которая выступает с, тоже с таким как бы, классическим в этом отношении э, ж, э, э, текстом, тревелогом «Путешествие в Брянск» 85-го года, который тоже как бы ходит за пределы чисто литературной проблематики. Э, интересно, что э, перестроечные процессы, процесс как бы, либерализации советской системы э, тоже выдвигают поэта э, на первое такое, на, на одно из значимых мест вот как такой э, как такой, э, э, такой символ что ли э, совершающихся перемен под, э, и свидетельством тому э, служит такой интересный визуальный текст это знаменитая обложка журнала «Огонек» 87 -го года, на которой изображены четыре поэта – Евтушенко, Вознесенский, Акуджава и Рождественский. Отсылающая, как так сказать, обложка, этот визуальный текст отсылает к той так сказать, первой оттепели, когда эти авторы значит, были одними из знаковых фигур первой оттепели. Но, значит, соответственно, и, и в реалиях 87 -го года производит очень, очень сильный эффект, потому что как бы через поэта как культурную фигуру, значит, говорящую, выступающую с какими-то радикальными взглядами и на ситуацию, вот проводятся какие-то идеи обновления, перестройки и так далее. Особенно здесь фигура Евтушенко важна, потому что он больше других активен в этом отношении, именно выступая, так сказать, именно как поэт, то есть в качестве известного, национально известного поэта он избирается депутатом, съезда народных депутатов и со съездовской трибуны тоже проводит различные радикальные предложения. Для поэта, для поэта это довольно так сказать, беспрецедентное такое функционирование в социальной системе. По мере как бы, разрушения тоталитаризма, и, так сказать, особенно после разрушения советской власти, когда литература перестает быть вынужденным таким каналом трансляции всяких неподцензурных социальных смыслов, Возникает довольно обширная, обширная продукция поэтов, становящихся публичными интеллектуалами, но она, как и в десятые, на мой взгляд, годы, и нулевые, в смысле, 900 десятые, 910 годы, она в основном сосредоточена, сконцентрирована вокруг эстетической историко-культурной проблематики. Здесь надо, прежде всего, назвать Михаила Эйзенберга, который как бы вводит в, что ли, в обиход какие-то фигуры из неподцензурной культуры 70-х-70-х годов, своих соратников по этой культуре. Вселда Некрасова, который скорее так сказать, пытается изменить иерархию этой культуры и предъявляет какие-то претензии, значит, к тому, как она эволюционировала. Сергея Гандлевского, который больше сосредоточен на историк культурных вопросах, особняком выступает уже упомянутая Ольга Седокова, которая играет как бы такую уникальную достаточно в России роль поэта-академика, да, поэта, с одной стороны, причастного академической науке, и вообще такому высокому интеллектуализму, отчасти и религиозной проблематики, а с другой стороны, выступающего, автор выступающего как публицист. И, на мой взгляд, такой парой к ней служит, не знаю, согласится ли со мной Марк, Дмитрий Александрович Пригов, потому что, несомненно, поэт-интеллектуал – это одна из таких социокультурных приговских масок которая для Пригова, несомненно, противостоит гораздо более распространенной как бы, модели романтического, в кавычках, поэта, значит, русского, как такой традиционной, традиционной фигуре, которую Пригов как бы, и, и, и пародирует, и отчасти как бы, вот, аннигилирует вот этой вот усиленной сказать, гиперинтеллектуальностью некоторых своих текст довольно большого количества своих текстов. 
Одновременно, одновременно продолжается деятельность Виктора Кривулина уже вот в, в, не в самоздатском сказать, варианте, а вполне в, в печатном 90-е годы, который тоже выходит за рамки, за рамки чисто литературной проблематики. Любопытно, что уже в новом веке, в нынешнем веке, по мере происходит, происходит э, 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 та же вещь, которую, можем, которую могли наблюдать и ранее. По мере э, усиления цензурных рамок, по мере как бы, сужения э, э, возможности свободного политического говорения, да, э, э, роль... роль э, Гражданская тематика и обращение к такого рода тематике опять возвращается как бы к поэтам, вытесняя, собственно, проблематику чисто эстетическую. Здесь можно говорить о эссеистике Елены Фанайловой, Марии Степановой, Алексея Цветкова, причем... Для Фанайлова, например, эта, эта эссеистика настолько важна, что ее одна из центральных книг этого времени, русская версия, как построена как сочетание стихотворений и эссе. Значит, стихотворения перемежаются некоторыми сказать, эссеистическими текстами, то есть, что подчеркивает их значимость для автора. Должен быть назван Григорий Дашевский, несомненно, среди авторов нулевых десятых годов, чье значение именно как э, критика, даже не столько критика, то есть формально по жанру это некая так сказать, действительно критическая работа, но э, по как бы, статусу этого высказывания мы видим, что это больше, чем критика, это... это Автор вообще подвергшийся такой очень скорой канонизации после смерти и переосмыслению как такой этический камертон. И, несомненно, его тексты очень, очень, очень важны для нашей темы. Если говорить... Вот э, те авторы, которых я упомянул, значит, э, Ханаила Степанова Цветков, это такой, э, ш, такие, что ли, персональные литературные проекты, э, существующие в такой традиционной парадигме большого поэта, что называется, э, а, э, значит, им не то, что противостоят, но сказать, рядом с ними находятся такие коллективные проекты левоориентированных литераторов, э, такие как «Транслит», где не столь, не столь важно индивидуальное авторство, да, которое тоже затрагивает самый широкий спектр тем, не столь, не столь важно индивидуальное авторство, сколько, так сказать, коллективное. Да. И особняком здесь, вот в этом левом спектре должен быть назван Кирилл Медведев, который, который тоже выступает как публичный интеллектуал довольно активно в десятые годы. И... Говоря уже, сказать, подытоживая, возвращаясь, не возвращаясь, вернее, а подытоживая и смотря на последние какие-то какие опыты вот, как бы, функционирования поэтов в, сказать, в роли не производителей стихов, а производителей каких-то общественных смыслов да, вне своей прямой деятельности, можно назвать акционизм Дарьи Сиренко, очень интересный. И я думаю, что, что война в Украине, несомненно, добавит какой-то текстовой материал, который еще предстоит, предстоит оценить, сказать, зарегистрировать, и который, я думаю, еще во многом создается. Я забыл упомянуть Дмитрия Кузьмина. Это относится, к, наверное, больше к 90-м и началу 2000-х годов, как поэта-организатора 
а литературной жизни, но ну, не только организатора в техническом смысле, а как поэта, формирующего как, какие-то смыслы этого литературного процесса и иерархию его, который тоже, на мой взгляд, несомненно, вот к этой когорте должен быть причислен. Ну, и, пожалуй, пожалуй, и, пожалуй, и все в таком вот перспективном виде. И буду очень благодарен вам за критику и за как общие, так и конкретные дополнения. Спасибо. Здравствуйте, я в Civilian Forester. У меня к вам вопрос о начале о периоде, о котором, о котором вы говорили. Простите, кто? Civil and Forester, извините. Я, 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 я слышал, вы сейчас упомянули а, да, какое-то имя. Извините, извините. Так что, когда я читала именно первые, может быть, эссе, эссеистические вещи, не только Мелечковского, но Хиппиус и даже Блока, у меня появился вопрос, потому что я не занимаюсь журналом 19 века. Было такое впечатление, что они, они как-то вошли на готовое место со своей эссеистикой. Так что мне было бы интересно просто послушать о, о, о том, что было до них, кто писал такие вещи. Может быть, никто не писал, может быть, они совершенно новые, но, но казалось, что это, это уже как будто ожидаемая часть работы в Толстой. На готовое? У меня не, нет такого ощущения, что на готовое, потому что, собственно говоря, те, те органы, где, где они печатались на Северные Вестники, особенно весы, там, Золотой Руной, Аполлон были журналами совершенно нового типа. Такого рода изданий в России не было. В этом смысле, в этом смысле и стилистика, как бы, и формат этих изданий были совершенно беспрецедентными. Да? То есть у них не было предшественников. Ну, конечно, конечно, в России существовали и, и, и до, до Гиппиуса Мережковского литературной критики. Да? Просто, на мой взгляд, здесь э, встает, встает вопрос разграничения, собственно, практики литературной критики и того, что мы можем отнести к текстом, формирующим вот именно фигуру публичного интеллектуала. Мне кажется, одной литературной критики здесь недостаточно. В этом, в этом смысле и общественные как бы, импликации того, что делал Мережковский, Гиппиус и, и далее символисты, они позволяют их, их квалифицировать таким вот образом. Возможно, я плохо знаю, я плохо знаю 19 век, и там есть какие-то фигуры, которые также могут быть сказать, интерпретированы как публичные интеллектуалы. Не знаю, мне пока в голову никто не приходит. Вот там несколько рук я вижу. Здравствуйте, Глеб. Рад, рад, рад видеть вас дистантно. Значит, про 19 век, не то, что я сейчас какие-то новые имена скажу, но, конечно, Белинский, там Чадаев немножко сложнее история, но... Но это же не поэты, Кирилл. Я понимаю, значит, но, кстати, если вы посмотрите, как Белинский употребляет слово поэт, поэтом называют, да, это же как бы тоже, если мы говорим о категориях, которых мы обсуждаем, то тут что важно, почему Чернышевский, опять же, Почему это важно? Потому что если мы говорим о генеалогии этой позы, понятно, что потом люди, которые пишут стихами и в ритмы, начинают вписываться в эту тенденцию. Если мы говорим о генеалогии, то для генеалогии важно вот это как бы момент радикальной революционной традиции, да, которая потом, как вы сами говорите, в начале символизма уходит в эстетизм, но активизируется или не активизируется потом советская и несоветская ситуация. Поэтому важно, эти фигуры нужны не, не просто для полноты списка, а именно потому, что вот эта вот традиция интеллигентской политической мысли как публицистики радикальной, она в эту позу отчасти оформляет. Да, согласен, конечно, да. В этом смысле согласен. Глеб, здравствуйте. То есть, если я правильно понимаю, как бы рабочее определение публичного интеллектуала, 
это как в данном случае поэт, который выходит за пределы чистой эстетической проблематики и, скорее всего, ну, как бы обращается к политической теме. Да, да, это поэт, который, который значит, а, э, так сказать, э, э, работает в, не в собственно, так сказать, присущем жанре, то есть это не должны быть стихи. Э, э, а второе – это выход за собственно литературные, узколитературные рамки, да, каким-то бытийным, так сказать, вопросом. Вот, и, и далее вот, когда вы говорили про про Криву, Твардовского и Кривулина, и Стратановского, как бы журнал появляется как ну, своего рода жанр, как форма высказывания поэта. У Твардовского это, на мой взгляд, действительно вот форма высказывания, поскольку ну, мы можем найти, конечно, какие-то общественно-политические тексты Твардовского, но понятно, что они будут определены так сказать, советским цензурным узусом каким-то, да, и не могут рассматриваться как, так сказать, ну, как какая-то какая не, не, не какая церемониальная речь, что называется. Да? А подлинным, подлинным видимо, его все-таки сообщением так сказать, обществу была, была редактура «Нового мира», и тот, и тот образ журнала, который он формулировал, что было важно, потому что, насколько я помню, Солженицын так сказать, отмечает несколько раз, что важно, что Твардовский был поэтом, да, что э, это не просто какой-то литературный чиновник, да, ведущий журнал, что он был поэтом. И более того, как бы э, этот Теркин, да, который действительно, так сказать, э, текст, который действительно пользовался широкой популярностью и среди сказать, широкой публики, а с другой стороны отличался высоким литературным качеством, он действительно как бы легитимировал его как культурного деятеля. Тогда, если вот я, я с этим всем полностью говорю, тогда почему а, не рассматривать как уличных интеллектуалов Пушкина и Некрасова как редакторов журнала? Да, хороший вопрос. Хороший вопрос. Действительно, 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 про Некрасов я думал. Действительно, с этой точки зрения, с этой точки зрения, наверное, и Некрасов. И, и, и Пушкин могут быть, как редактор современника, могут быть, так сказать, какие-то притечи, так сказать, включены. Да, пожалуй. Это не, не вот, и, и просто еще одно маленькое наблюдение. Мне кажется, вот, когда вы говорите о, о Сервеке, явно не хватает Гиппиус, которая, безусловно, постоянно высказывалась не только на... Да, да, безусловно. Я не упомянул ее. Да, да. Конечно, Гиппиус, как Антон Крайний, так сказать, и другие всегда не мы... Как, как публицист, несомненно, важно. Спасибо. Как раз продолжение вопроса Марка насчет, насчет Пушкина. Ну, Во-первых, это все совершенно потрясающе интересная, очень важная и инноваторская глава, но насчет Пушкина и Пушкина центризма я бы немножечко остерегся говорить, с какой стати мы будем считать Пушкина поэта публичным интеллектуалом. После смерти Пушкина его же ближайшие друзья, разбирая его рукописи, удивлялись, что Пушкин был умным человеком. И, конечно, аргумент, который предложил Марк, работает как издатель журнала «Современник», но «Современник» не был успешным проектом. То есть в данном случае... Да, я не думаю, что Пушкин был... Все, Пушкин – это наше все, но что публичным интеллектуалом он был, я сомневаюсь. С точки зрения дефиниции, очень трудно найти первого публичного интеллектуала поэта, кроме Семеона Полоцкого, который был и ученым, и астрологом, и он как-то наполнял какими-то своей поэзией геологически. Может, нам и не нужно искать первого, а рассматривать это как относительно новый культурный Карамзин, я думаю, это можно ли считать Карамзин писал стихи. Как сказал Пушкин. Да, Карамзин писал стихи, но к тому моменту, когда он стал публичным интеллектуалом, он не воспринимался как поэт, он воспринимался либо как прозаик, либо как автор. Там на самом деле, я согласен с тем, что вы говорите, там такая про переход. Карамзин консервативный публичный интеллектуал, и Пушкин поздний пытается работать в этом же роде, у него не очень получается, я согласен, что нет. И парадокс состоит в том, что у позднего Пушкина момент издания журнала совпадает с моментом придворным. То есть он одновременно делает журнал и хочет при дворе быть, и это не получается. Это все разваливается. В этом смысле я согласен, что это не срабатывает. Ну, то есть, ну, я, я об этом пытался сказать, когда вначале сказал, что сказать, Пушкин, несомненно, борется за свой статус, но это статус внутри 
придворного ряда, да, так сказать, он не стоит вне. И, несомненно, конечно, он хочет быть новым Карамзиным, это понятно. Но что касается... Что касается вопроса, то я, в принципе, согласен с вами. Единственное, что, на мой взгляд, успешность, коммерческая успешность медийного проекта не может в данном случае служить критерием, потому что подавляющее большинство, если не абсолютно, большинство интеллектуальных медийных проектов русских были коммерчески неуспешны, начиная с современника. Новый мир не входит в это, поскольку это была советская экономика, да, сказать, другая история. Но начиная с современника, заканчивая журналом Аполло. Вот, поэтому, поэтому здесь, это был, на мой взгляд, просто не критерий. В данном случае он нерелевантный. Не но, но, но в принципе, вот действительно с вашими соображениями насчет Пушкина я соглашусь. Поэтому у меня и были какие-то резервации вот, вот, э, э, в его, э, при, при рассмотрении его фигуры. Да. Ну, логично, если абстрактно искать, где может быть первый русский поэт э, это надо искать э, либо э, в романтической э, э, традиции, э, когда поэзия действительно выражала некие политические, идеологические проекты в поэтической э, э, форме, либо еще раньше, в 18, 18 веке, но все равно не получается как таких убедительных примеров, как те, которые вы приводили, более поздним. То есть, может быть, можно да. сделать так, что это относительно новый... Человек, безусловно, человек никакой не... Хомяков. А? Если говорить о тех, кто прям стихами пишет, то Хомяков. А по ну, а, В меньшей да, степени, да. потому что Хомякова есть четкая да. политическая адженда. Что и специальная. Правы. Да, да, да. Я да. просто Вы, простите, плохо слышу. А, это Люба Вольман, а, мы с вами только Привет. теперь мы познакомимся. А, насчет, а, то, то, что вы сказали, очень интересно, что а, поэт, публичный интеллектуал должен быть кто-то, кто, кто а, это, эту интеллектуальную деятельность а, проводит не в стихах. Да? И да. тут вот, мне очень интересно, потому что сейчас как раз обсуждение о том, что некоторые фигуры именно в стихах это делают. Да? Um, и с одной стороны, мне ужасно понравилось, что в вашей статье, как ни в одной другой в нашем хендбук, будет описана эссеистика поэтов. Да? Это, это как бы такая история вот этой традиции, которая очень интересна. Но с другой стороны, uh, правомочное такое разделение между uh, публичной, так как бы для, для такой вот очень ограниченной, сложной публичной сферы, uh, между тем, что происходит в эссеистике и тем, что может происходить а, поэзия. Ну, несомненно, это, сказать, это, это ограничение во многом искусственное, да, то есть это то ограничение, которое мы сами вольны принять или нет. А, я как бы это ограничение а, веду из, собственно говоря, из того термина и того понимания публичного интеллектуала, которое ввел Джейк в 87-м году, потому что, насколько я понимаю, там речь идет именно о том, что это так сказать, так сказать, сообщение так сказать, субъекта, который выходит за рамки его непосредственной компетенции. Да? То есть, что это какой-нибудь там знаменитый физик, условно говоря, будет там не о физике рас рассказывать со страниц журнала «Тайм», да? а там о войне и мире. Да? Вот как бы, но слушать его будут, потому что он знаменитый физик. Как бы, ну, условно говоря, Ноам, Ноам Хомский. Да? Да. 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 Яркий пример. Да? Он же так сказать, великий лингвист, но мы же его слушаем так сказать, или не слушаем. Так сказать, не, не лекции о лингвистике, да? а там лекции про там, войну и мир. Да? Ближний Восток. Не знаю. Вот, так сказать, в этом смысле я подумал, что если, если сказать, транспонировать эту, это определение на поэта, то ну, берет, надо брать поэта, но вне его поэзии. Да? То есть, как сказать, поэта, выступающего не в своем основном амплуа. Да? Но, так сказать, фундирована его речь, 
его поэтическим статусом, да? что обращается к вам не просто там, НН, да, которого вы непонятно почему должны слушать, а обращается к вам автор стихов таких, которые вы знаете, любите, так сказать, да, и, и вот поэтому вы его слушаете. Вот. Вот, и, так сказать, такова природа так сказать, этого, этого ограничения. Вот. Но, с другой стороны, второй момент, мне кажется, почему, мне кажется, это ограничение может быть конструктивным, потому что иначе мы все-таки рискуем раствориться в материале, да? потому что все-таки мы многократно умножаем материал, непонятно, где он начинается, где заканчивается, да и как, так сказать, отделять, там придется, несомненно, пользоваться какой-то ценностной рамкой, да, это плохие стихи, это хорошие и так далее. В общем, это немножко не то, чего хотелось бы. Ну, еще я просто добавлю, что мне кажется, что очень продуктивно, что вы начинаете с этой проблемы, что где, собственно, этот публичный интеллектуал и насколько это такой термин, который нам помогает что-то увидеть, но при этом его трудно примерить к чему бы то ни было. А, так что, да, мне кажется, полезно некоторые такой умелый комментарий, с которого вы начали, и в статье самой Ой, тоже. Мне кажется, что методологически это наиболее такая рискованная тема из всех, так сказать, тем сборника. Потому что, собственно говоря... Я не, я не знаю прецедентов да, обращения к этой теме, так сказать. Я, такой, не, не я эту тему сформулировал, но я, я, я не знаю, да, случае, мои поиски не дали мне ответ. На, то есть никто, я никаких исследований на такого рода тему не нашел. Вы молодцы, значит. Вы молодцы, да. Если нет других желающих, Борис Маслов меня зовут. И я вот хотел вспомнить о разговоре о Чучеве, который у нас был, которого непонятно как а Во многих отношениях для вас это такой, мне кажется, совсем интересный случай, потому что вроде бы он хотел быть интеллектуалом, не хотел быть поэтом, и его авторитет как... Вот, проводника некоторых идей одиозных, может быть, с какой точки зрения, не связан с его авторитетом поэта, потому что он не хотел быть поэтом. А с другой стороны, те же самые идеи он очень ярко и выразительно и в поэтической форме тоже транслирует. И транслирует так, что для позднейших эм, деятелей, поэтов и эм, публичных мигалов это очень важный ориентир. Вот, может быть, вы могли бы как-то, так как все-таки уходить вот, совсем в эту предысторию, наверное, вам не нужно, но Тютча это такая фигура, которая может позволить вам четче определить, вот, а, а, что вы имеете в виду под по этим а, публичным интеллектуалом, как провести эту границу. Это, это, да, несомненно. Это... Даже не вопрос, Спасибо. Но... Я, 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 я думал о Чучеве, несомненно. У меня в фигуре Чучева, насколько я знаю материал, смущает именно проблему публичности. Да? Это другое совершенно понимание публичности, нежели как бы принято нами сегодня. Да? Чучев и как поэт долгое время функционирует так сказать, в рукописном варианте, да? То есть в каком-то кружковом совсем. Да? И как интеллектуал тоже, насколько я понимаю, достаточно, достаточно в узком кругу известен. То есть это какая-то какой другая, другая прагматика совсем, как бы до модерная какая-то. Да? В этом смысле... В этом, в этом, исключительно в этом смысле, вот, в смысле прагматики, это какой-то случай, который не совсем вписывается вот в нашу историю. Но, но конечно, как бы, по, по типу, да, по типу, как бы это вроде бы потенциально оно, да, но, но по типу функционирования реального исторического это не вписывается. Не знаю, как бы, как... Мне, 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 мне так кажется. В связи с тем, о чем, о чем вы только что сказали, по-видимому, важно ввести как бы, такое ограничение, что действительно публичный интеллектуал а, может быть там, где есть модерная зона публичности. Да, 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 именно да, публичный поле, да, конечно. Полоски не может быть. Не, 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 не,
А Карамзин который... да. да. московского журнала и вестника Европы уже э, может рассматривать. Потому что он ориентируется на западную публичную И он не поэт. Как не поэт? в глазах его читателей эссе, он автором либо бедной Лизы, либо, скорее всего, историографом. Да, да. Да, да. Когда он писал московского журнала, это едва ли можно сказать, что это именно Павлович. Здесь даже я сделал не случайно замечание, когда я говорил о авторах на сто лет позже, я сказал, что поэтами по экселенству могут считаться, собственно, Вячеслав Иванов и Блок, потому что и на самом деле и Андрей Белый, и Брюсов, и Бережковский уже воспринимаются во многом как прозаики. Да? Белый, белый как бы все время представляется, и самая репрезентация там идет как автор Петербурга, я автор Петербурга, это автор Петербурга, да, так сказать, а до этого автор Серебряного Голуби. То есть там тоже поэтическая идентичность не первая. Она, она первая у Иванова и у Блока, на самом деле. Mm -hmm. но это еще она, и... там, у молодого Мережковского она первая, но он очень быстро становится романистом, драматургом и так далее. У Гиппиус тоже, кстати, но у Гиппиус больше, у Гиппиус все-таки больше, да, Гиппиус все-таки ну, до начала десятых годов воспринимается как поэт. Тоже парадокс еще заключается в том, что в такой общей мифологии поэзии может ли поэт быть интеллектуалом, потому что поэт эмоций, поэт видения, поэт антирационализм, больше такой в, романтической, в романтическом изображении. Может ли поэт быть умным? Поэзия должна быть умным. Поэзия должна быть умным. Это... Вчера... То есть в какой-то момент происходит переоценка вот, этих, вот этого шаблона. И когда оказывается, да, действительно, Пушкин оказывается умный, но это уже после его смерти. Но это то, то, что как бы вот гипертрофировано, чему гипертрофировано противостоит Пригов, да, так сказать, вот эта маска поэта-интеллектуала, теоретика, так сказать, с автоинтерпретатора, не только автора стихов, но и автоинтерпретатора этих стихов, она, так сказать, она вот, и, и, несомненно, имеет в виду вот этого, так сказать, поэта-дурачка, так сказать, от цехи, от стакана, который, так сказать, вот для, традиционен для истории русской литературы, да, и, и чему вот, а поэт-интеллектуал, значит, он, он уникален, да, и он или очень, очень редок, да, и, и, вот, и должен прийти на смену, ну, смысл проекта, пригласского проекта, да, и должен прийти на смену вот этому вот прежнему представлению о поэте и типу поэта, да. Слой Короленко. Не серьезно. Он претендует на то, что с помощью своей поэзии и Музыки – это интеллектуально, это теория, которую он пытается... Но, он не да, но к сожалению, он, к сожалению, не, мне кажется, не выступает с какими-то текстами, ну или очень редко, даже не припомню. Что, да, помимо песен своих, он как-то ни, ничего не... Он приезжал с лекциями обо всем... Но это устное творчество тоже, как бы, тут нужна все-таки какая-то какая большая публичная активность вот в медийном поле. Ну, что? Быков. Простите? Быков, Дмитрий Быков. Быков, Быков, хороший, да, Быков. Хороший. Ну, Быков, в принципе, при всем ироническом отношении к нему, да, да, в принципе, Быков, Быков это да, типичный публичный ритуал, на самом деле, да, абсолютно. Я, конечно, вытеснил его из своей головы, но был неправ. Да. Быков, это, да. Спросить про организацию вашей будущей статьи. Конечно, это статья про определенную роль. Да, и, и это статья про такую фигуру поэта. А, а, мне также понравилось, что там такая у вас как бы, линия того, а, о том, в каких сферах выступает этот поэт, публичный интеллектуал. Да? Вот здесь, возможно, выступление в эстетической сфере, да? а может быть, не в каких-то других, а тут у нас уже другого выступления. Да? И, может быть, это нужно как-то про, про, провести более ярко, но также мне было интересно и для этого, может быть, совсем нет места в этой статье, да? но тематически или по э, какой-то интонации, что ли, да? или по направлению мысли, да? 
да? есть ли какая-то история здесь, да? описать, а, может быть, даже не в самой вашей статье, потому что, не знаю, хватит ли места, но даже просто в нашем разговоре можно ли проследить какие-то такие нити развития а, чего-то. Да? А, то есть как бы генеративно ли эта рамка, которую мы вам предложили, и которую вы так хорошо как-то продумали, а, для чего-то большего? Моя мысль заключалась в том, что э, вот на, на разных исторических этапах мы видим одно и то же явление. Да, по мере э, либерализации политического порядка, да, когда литература перестает играть э, роль, э, значит, не свойственную, свойственную ей в России роль, значит, значит, канал для политических э, мнений, значит, э, соображений, мнений и, и, и каких-то тезисов, да, э, э, Тогда, собственно, происходит этот развод. Да. Литературное поле занимается своими делами, больше уходя в эстетическую проблематику, а политическое занимается своими. А по мере сказать, обострения радикализации политической обстановки, будь то революция, там, война, какое-то новое цензурное, цензурное угнетение, опять, так сказать, Литераторы и поэты, в частности, начинают э, обращение к, к, ну, сколько, к гражданским темам. Да? То есть происходит, происходит как бы реактуализация гражданской проблематики в, э, в литературном поле. Это, это, на мой взгляд, это происходит и соответственно, вот после 2017 года, это происходит и в, в период перестройки э, там, в второй половине 80-х годов. Это происходит, это происходит с обратной стороны, значит, начиная там с ну, середины нулевых, наверное, уже до путинского управления, там, ближе к концу нулевых годов начинается, и, 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 все, и все возрастает. Поэтому сейчас, конечно, вот нынешний период должен дать какой-то урожай в этом смысле. Другие вопросы к Лебу или... Уже, кажется, заканчивается. Да, 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 Спасибо. Спасибо. Спасибо вам за, за дополнение и замечания. Спасибо. Русский поэт, в России поэт, больше, чем поэт, а на Западе интеллектуал. Когда они приезжают, читают лекции, всегда говорят о том, что... А, должно быть что-то больше, чем поэт. Да, 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 конечно. Или кто-то взял должен быть минимум. Совершенно не понимаю. Он думает, а вот как это у него будет? Он думает, а вот как это у него будет? Он думает, а вот как он думает? Он думает, а вот как это у него будет? Он думает, можно ли Пушкина считать первым мужчиной? Нет, конечно, нет, потому что у него не получилось. Да, но он не всегда так. Ah, 
in a weird way, you and the Gibbs will end up with these really difficult tasks, uh, more than the other performances, which I think are more obviously coded, or they're like slotted in our brains into the notion of performance. Because mm -hmm. there really is such a thing as a woman poet, and there really is such yeah. a thing as a poet intellectual. And so it's like we need to somehow interrogate the category, mm -hmm. was pushed back against the category and still preserve mm -hmm. the usefulness of the term. Yeah. No. Yeah. No, exactly. Very delicious. And yeah, yum. Everyone would like to be called book intellectual, but nobody would like to be called a woman poet. I don't know about that. And actually, right, I wanted to say to you, you that Panayla, even when now, was that? With that I was, it, was the, it was the one that you wrote the introduction for that um, Palupina and Weissport, I want to say, edited. Mm -hmm. And I, they I sent it to me to evaluate. <laughs> and <laughs> her forward said, why on earth are we doing this? And I said, why on earth did you invite her? And actually, I, though, but if you look at her statements, yeah, she's very more than many others. She's very explicit in saying, "Of course, I'm a feminist." Mm -hmm. Right? No, it was just that one episode which really surprised me. I think it might have been not something about the invitation itself, but mm -hmm. I, love, uh, I mean, uh, Polukina, mm -hmm. maybe. Yeah, I don't know. I just remember saying, "You should get Stephanie Salmon or introduction." She really knows something about women poets. I think she's also a really interesting counterexample for Gip, who wants to mm. say mm. you have to keep poetry and prose separate. Mm. Um, mm -hmm. They yeah. have to define it as the essays because in her like the mm. last three years of all of this poetry about the war, mm. she's really using the format of the poetic text mm. as a way to make it's very strong, which is very demanding. Because with the public intellectual, you really, and yes, you want an intelligent intellectual reader, but you don't necessarily require a reader who can handle the poetic aspect. And yet I, I see poem after poem now in Russian about the war, mobilizing all the emotional power of the poetic meter. And, and very effectively. Do you have a chapter on pre modern poetry, medieval? Mm -hmm. There are all these kind of uh, interesting forms. <laughs> we don't. And at one point, we were going to call it the yeah. Handbook of Modern Russian Poetry. And mm. we pulled back from that because we didn't want to get involved in defining what counts mm. as modern. And mm. I think we wanted to be able to sneak in over stuff when we could. Yeah. Yeah. Do you think that that's a mistake not to have had it or? I think that's a very specialized. How could, how could you, could it not be a mistake? <laughs> Given that there are all these sort of old believers chants, not to mention I love the terrible liturgical poetry. How is it not Russian poetry? I see. It seems that it's kind of inevitably should. Be. It's a kind of a, an exclusion that is quite marked. If it's not there, then we're uh, guilty of strictly not... speaking. Yes, even even folklore. Right. I'm just going right. to say we're guilty of not having sought out somebody to do. Folklore. Well, folk poetry, it's not hard to find sources. I mean, the first thing I found when I tried to Google just now Bloch's article about Paetika Zagovarov was Andrei Tvarkov's article about it, not Bloch's article, Tvarkov, the folklorist, talking about it. I feel very knowledgeable. Mm -hmm. It's just, just, oh. yeah, it's just such a huge handbook. So, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. excluding certain things that are particularly striking. But I think it's it's a sign of the field, right? Where, where the American, Latin America 
and driven by American. Oh, it's an Anglo American. Yeah. yeah, I mean, it's Oxford University Press. So, but it's, you're right. It's, but all the editors are. All the editors are located in the US. Mm -hmm. Not all the contributors. No, not all the contributors, not by a long shot. I mean, the question is so there are a lot of ways to do these pen books. And Mark is one of them. And I think many of them are simply, I should say this is if it's lesser, it's not, but it's just a list of articles. No. There's no commitment no. to a kind of Coherence argument, yes. thematic organization mm -hmm. or anything. But once we committed to this, these rubrics, that also built in a certain structure. So this whole conversation about genre I found incredibly interesting because we ended up with no essay on genre. Mm -hmm. um, we have four, four but it's not yeah. the same thing. I, so. I um, bracketed genre in my little chapter because of the, the trivia. Mm -hmm. I think it's kind of an underlying principle in the, in the other. Um, Parts of the handbook where is there an article in the old or the L, you know? No, 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 they come into there. Was going to be a chapter on L, you know, but then we decided to not do that. Yeah, so they come into the handbook. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. 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 it's possible that at the very beginning when we first approached you and we had table of contents, you probably saw it. Can you say that? Yeah, elegy, elegy was going to be a mm -hmm. and that dropped out. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you, you were going to. Right, but that was also because we got down. Yeah, right. Utility, it feels wrong. I love the idea of a, new, of a handbook where you can sort of have the bolded word, the reference to the other chapter that you didn't expect to be relevant, and in fact go there and find, mm -hmm. find things that broaden your mm -hmm. versus just a list of articles. Which would be a whole lot less work for the editors. So I feel very guilty listening to you say that, but I think that you are quite right. And when Irina, Mark, and Andrew and I did the Oxford history of Russian literature, it was a very it was very important to us to have a serious attention to the older period. And we ended up actually adding because it was going to be medieval to early modern, then it's going to be 18th century. And we had this huge, I mean, our, at that point, it was already too long and we were dying, but we had this huge conversation that we have to actually pull out the 17th century. And this is this mm -hmm. interesting theory. Yes. And so we ended up with a separate section. Mm -hmm. So I intellectually, I have much sympathy with that. But we also did, did a lousy job with folk. Yes, but when you say literature, yeah, folklore is literature, then folklore so is not right. part of it. When you say poetry, mm -hmm. then folklore is part of it. Yes. So in my in my in my assessment, literature is that what is primarily written. And so we kind of use it to contrasting with folk. But if it's a handbook of Russian poetry, um, well, I think the, the exclusion of folklore is less, is less, is less kind of dramatic than the exclusion of Ivan the Terrible as the great kind of writer of the world mm -hmm. and the first public intellectual poet. <laughs> but um, it's, um, I mean, it's a, it's a kind of challenging ch chapter to write. Mm. Should I should more about it. Mm. You know? But how come Palku, Malini, the new Zatochny, the even works, and then, then the um, well, the most well, 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 you could read Russian poetry, it's Russian poetry, it's Russian. But, yeah. but it's such, such a kind of a it can be part of a Ukrainian I teacher, I refer to it in or Russian article. teacher, literature, but it's. I refer to it in my article. I mean, I mention it, and there could be a footnote saying, "Go read." I don't know Horace Lanton. Sure, but but it's 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 kind of um. There is not going to be a handbook of Russian poetry. It has to be part of either Ukrainian handbook or Russian handbook, right? It's prehistory to either war it's been very, or possibly Belarusian, yeah. but it it's be been very. Attentively treated in a lot of different ways 
that aren't this way. Mm -hmm. And given that the adoption of the um, of the most provided kind of mm -hmm. version of slova is in the most wide world, mm -hmm. that we owe, owe the preservation of the power to, to what have happened then in the most wide world. Mm -hmm. it's, it's certainly part of that of a kind of a well, it's part of the tradition, absolutely part of the tradition. We have a new, a huge new museum in Oslo, the National Museum just opened in Oslo, mm -hmm. in Norway, and they have a wonderful icon, mm -hmm. Norwegian icon, mostly Norwegian, which can travel outside. Soviet mm. Union early on, and mm. were possibly sold. Mm. And then they made an interesting choice. Maybe that was actually this year's decision to put the little information mm. snippets mm. about, say, an icon representing Boris, Boris and Glass, mm -hmm. put it in English. How do you write it? Mm. And so they decided that it should be Baris Igli. Mm -hmm. Wow. For Novgorod, well, Novgorod, yes, these yeah. are these are kind of old Russian things that the uh, princess. This is Novgorodian icon. Mm -hmm. So, and mm -hmm. then using modern yeah. Ukrainian yeah. forms, it yeah. just seems kind of a. Are they sure they weren't using it? Novgorod. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Interesting. And then given that now I've spoken to, to somebody from here who found it particularly absurd. <laughs> somebody who is a Russian speaker in Kiev, who, who thinks who thinks of Kiev as a Russian speaking city. So it's a kind of a hard to make that argument, and uh, it's um, but it's just it's just an extreme example. Um, kind of difficult to I guess. Well, maybe we should make sure that think about this one, think about Well, actually, um, so the most unstable part of the handbook are the contributions by poets mm -hmm. we've used for all kinds of reasons. Mm -hmm. And we've actually just added another one. Okay. So one idea you can think of a contemporary poet who could address this topic, so we could speak it in that way. Mm -hmm. And who the form do you have there? Who did you invite as a poet? Um, well, there's who we invited, and then there's who we think is going to write. Right. Yeah. There's a smaller subsection. The war has mm -hmm. really been really correct. Which have it with this part. Um, so, Yudin Mikhailik, Maris Stupanova, Olga Sudakova, Maristua Vuvorsky, Sugita Vyala, Vladimir Vinusman. I need to see. They're about eight or nine. It's a wonderful selection. I would buy it just to read them. I think they're shorter pieces. Uh, maybe Kuzmin, maybe Skidan. So they're mm -hmm. up in the air. And uh, thereby you're transforming them into public Aha. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, or at least the no. scholars. They're working in the Several of them already are. are. Somebody never submits a contribution, you can make it that kind of performance and empty. <laughs> page. That's right. Here's the performance from. 
you get that sometimes in the introduction. We were hoping to have an article from blah, blah, blah. <laughs> but. What has happened with the poet part? People, I mean, mm -hmm. having committed amendments early now, it's yeah. Well. yeah. Um, but the first thing I co edited, we had two very prominent scholars who both said, you know, I'm going to be late, but I'm going to get it to you. And then they never did. And I never wrote to say, why the hell didn't you? Because I was a baby professor right. and had tenure and so on. But one of them got asked to review the collection. And I thought, this is so tacky. Really? I can't say, you know, it's too late. The review just came out. She was uh, supposed to write for it. Yeah. Huh. And the only man we had with Beard so it was an all women's performance. You know that we are being recorded to the end of the line. No, I think we're just being microphoned. No, it's no, we're oh, being is recorded. it recording? Yeah, we, we failed to turn it <laughs> off. We, we did the same thing yesterday. I'm going to turn it off. It's wasting resources. Um, the only reason not to do that uh, is that we won't remember. It, well, and also uh, it might mess things up in terms of the storage command that they've given. So I would leave it alone. Uh huh. Yeah, we, so, uh, we did it that way, at least from the Mm hmm. So the, only, the only use of the recording is going to be to go back and make yeah. sure that we get comments to everybody. So probably Kathy, mm. Kathy, you're, I think you're the only one who looked at the Anderson one, right? Yeah. Maybe so you can just skip over it. You just skip forward. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Although maybe our conversation up at <laughs> Yes, that's true. For you, but if you're listening, mm -hmm. we have, we have <laughs> ideas for, for you. <laughs> that was very satisfying. There's something about and good rice, the veggies, and veggies. It's very luxurious arrangement to invite mm -hmm. all the contributors mm -hmm. to, to discuss from around the world. It is luxurious. We're very lucky, Mark. And that Mark's not even, you know, it's not even his project that he was really supposed to. Actually, the, the two times I was invited to the Minister before what were in the worst workshops. I've been here for several things, all very different. Translating South Slavic prose. <laughs> oh, overlapping. That's the way I met Igor Shevchenko, mm. the great Ukrainian slash Russian scholar. What was that? I think it's really defined at Harvard. Mm. The founding father of us. It was extremely old fashioned. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. I have a memory of meeting, but I can't stay mm -hmm. there. Uh -oh. I heard an academic folklore that Gary was founded when a Ukrainian. Businessman sent his lawyer in to endow a professorship. And with, the guy was sold away to a million dollars and said, I don't have it, but I'll come back. And he came back the next day with a check for a million dollars, which at that point endowed a lot more for it than a professorship. But who did I hear that from? It's not true. So the Harvard got has three endowed professorships in Ukraine, mm -hmm. um, as well as the Institute. And that was because the Ukrainian community, I mean, there may well have been some. Um, generous and welcome just to see who was involved, but it's the Ukrainian community. They went from church to church, mm -hmm. and there are wonderful stories. One, they were fundraising of people from Harvard who would get an open. And the, my favorite story is the story of Lisa Crown, who, uh, on top of everything else, apparently had perfect. She learned Ukrainian, mm -hmm. had perfect mm -hmm. Ukrainian, and they would trot her out. Mm -hmm. It was this example mm -hmm. of an American. We could learn it so well. And Lisa, did you know Lisa? No. Yeah. Hilarious. 
so charming mm. and able to be funny in every mm. language. Mm. So, mm. Those are the total strings. Mm. Mm. She's so was so irreverent. But so much about it because when I arrived at Chicago, oh, that's right, but you were talking mm -hmm. about the apartment, she, she was already dead at that time. Mm -hmm. But the Slavic department was falling apart, and there were just these legends about the great mm -hmm. figure who somehow well, was know. everything to the mm -hmm. department. And now mm -hmm. it's a kind of it's, it's it, I had my office in Slavic department for eight years, mm -hmm. and I saw how it was continuing to fall apart. Yeah. Um, I wasn't a member of the department. But yes, and with Robert, uh, yeah, I don't know. Our best student is a blanket graduate student. Best student I've ever taught in Russian. in congregate terms. I mean, I've had students who had better Russian, I've had students who, you know, but all of those things together, and she's applying to Chicago for Complet, not for Slavic. This Everywhere else, we're slow. This is where I was. Mm -hmm. And frankly, mm -hmm. I'm not sure I would recommend going there for Slava. No. She you wants know. to work with Anna Elena Torres, who does Yiddish. Ah, um, so, so works on yeah. Heretz Markishan. Yeah, that, that's, that's, that's the, the new person. Yeah. It was a great department when I arrived there, but I yeah. But it's really a, such a difficult city to, to inhabit. Mm. Mm. My son lives there now. In, a, in at the university? No, no, he's an element. He's an elementary high school. It's a mixed school music teacher. Uh -huh. So quite different. But what, 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 what part of, of Chicago? You know, I don't remember, but he's right off one of the, he's right off the line that goes to the airport. So I see. So the blue line. Yeah, he's off the blue line. But off the, uh, the blue line goes, it's, it's the northern part of, of yeah. the city. So it's a little north of the blue line. In oh. a very industrial neighborhood, but mm -hmm. apparently safe enough. And his his big woe is looking for parking, <laughs> driving around and around. It's a very disparate city, which mm -hmm. you can't really walk. You can't walk in one direction for more than mm -hmm. 20 minutes. Mm -hmm. You have to know where to turn. Yeah. And so New York is such, such, such a pleasant mm -hmm. change. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but really. It's so mm -hmm. good. Unless you're down in the village. Yeah. I read uh, an article that said if you if you grow up in a place with a grid, you don't have as good a sense of direction hmm. as somebody who grows up in a place without a grid. But I tell you, if you grow up with a place with a grid, you can handle the grid. You always know which way you're going, even in the cloudy day. In Cambridge, which is just a mess, uh, and Boston generally is a mess. I, can't, I still can't find out. Mm -hmm. But they claim that the roads are determined by the way that the cows used to walk under the river, and that that's why it's a mess. I mean, there <laughs> it's literally there are two streets that intersect, and one is called Bow, and the other is called Arrow. And I, oh. I thought, well, that's just you know their idea, of the joke. Yeah. But I think it's also was the way that the streets. I never said why would one would take a tram in Boston because it's, it's the, the speeds of these <laughs> machines that are clearly kind of lower than than what's a normal. Yeah. Uh, it really felt travel. like being a hundred years ago and going on that. This kind of museum experience. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I loved it, but it did feel. Are you talking about when, like, when you're on the Green Line and you end up up on the street? So when the subway goes. Well, down in the subway, and the car came around, and there was no protection, and you just stepped right on it. And then they 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 had a thing to lower the car, and a, a guy got on who had to, his mother had taken thalidomide. He had the particular deformity, and there were these two mothers with strollers that wouldn't get out of the handicapped area. And they just didn't even notice them because they were talking. Oh. So the whole thing left a strong imprint. It was in Boston. Yeah. 
Yeah, it's um you live in Boston or not? I was just gonna say I'm still I still I still live in Amherst, oh, so I have a little rather but I hold on to you. And um, it's inexcusable that there's no east west rail. Yeah, yeah. It's just crazy. The volume of traffic makes it clear that there would be a lot of people on those trains if they would just run them. We're so lucky where we are. So lucky. 20 minutes to Philadelphia. And from there, you can go to New York or Princeton or right. Washington. It's wonderful. Well, we may be there. Right. Yeah, I, I assume I'll, I won't live to so <laughs> Well, you'll live to Brian. Yeah, it's not to take it to work. Like it took to do the big, was the big dig 20 years? Mm -hmm. Oh, well, it was hell oh, I think at least 20 years ago. So to do East West Rail, mm -hmm. you know, it would take them a decade to stop arguing about the finance. Well, and then to, to do it, it a decade to do it. Get the property, what is it, public domain? Not public domain. Well, Boston has the worst traffic in the country. Does it really? Mm -hmm. Pam Chester says, mm -hmm. it's not that it's so bad, but everyone expects you to know what you're doing. Well, that's true. If you screw up or you're from somewhere else, that's true. nobody yeah, has any patience. A lot of it's really I'm surprised. I would think it's worse than that. No, I think I'm not exactly how they were calculated. It maybe with respect to how many rude gestures. <laughs> no, there's population frequency. That gets like absurd. It's the oh. it's the traffic. It's the system of roads. Mm -hmm. It's not that there are that many people out on. It's just you actually cannot plan to drive. Right. Mm. And the one way streets. Mm. Well, the one way streets in here should help the traffic situation, mm -hmm. actually. That's one of the reasons why I have it. It feels like the personal, personal. <laughs> <laughs> I want to turn left. And the problem to the birds. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. It's such such a delight not needing a car, being mm -hmm. in Europe and not needing mm -hmm. a car. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. My older daughter lives in Philadelphia and doesn't have a car. Well, we, we live in Chicago also without a car. In California it was impossible. Yeah. But in Chicago it was possible. We, but taking the buses and and and, and the CTA, it's it's just a very demoralizing experience. Um, I would I would are we uh, supposed to start at two? <laughs> ah, no, two 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 thirty. That we get a whole hour. Oh my gosh, whole hour from lunch. You're so pretty. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Remember my ones? But did you see Gamma's No. No, but I was just reading about the blonde colors. Yeah. Actually, you got it. <laughs> I know. <laughs> my friend and my mind, who dressed my two dogs up as a dragon. So what do we say about two? Two twenty. I mean two thirty and twenty. Good. Twenty and over. 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 Twenty and it's a Saturday at all. Mm -hmm. mm. It turns out we didn't need to do it. Overwhelmed by these dresses. I was waiting to see that. Yeah. Yeah, 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 Every time I see her, she forgets something. I know. I'm not important. I don't even know. I, I, I want to say I'm, it's, it's a shame. She should be ready, but I'm actually comforted by the fact that we should be able to do that because I am mm -hmm. uh, very, it's always, yeah, it's always, there's I have really clear memory of my. Mm -hmm. So 
from Harvard. Yeah. Oh, Banger. And a professional man. Actually, that's good. The gods may have given you a better than I do. I last name. I could be from a yeah, I'm back. We were in this um, one of these receptions, and we introduced this question, and, and I find it simple because she just so many times. Huh? I thought, oh, yeah, I just want to I, I don't show you this, but you can kind of have snappish words for my people. Yeah, I haven't thought this before. Yeah. <laughs> well, the karma has been improved. Well, my most absurd conference experience was arriving in the hotel in Chicago. Going up to the room, opening the door, and finding Donald Banger. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, and him in the same room. So he sat there. So funny. Each other bed, waiting for the ring. Oh my god! It's so funny. So that's why I'm in this like casual chat. Don't hang around. Why are you sitting on the bed? It's your room. It's your room. Actually, you know, most of the technology of this was the technical library is coming down, finally rescued from its own. Ugly, you know, fighting, yeah. fighting and stuff on Bill Todd because Bill is so quiet. Yeah, he was so on and looking at the inside. You can get people to find your hard work. Ah, and it's Fanger who had the period with them, and only caring people. Yes, who are not going to be so they're not going to be You know, the only contact I had with Fanger was not in a hotel room. I, I called them up to say I've been offered this great fellowship in Indiana. I thought there's not where we were. Tell them I've been offered this fellowship, and yet, but you know, what could Harvard do for me? Tell them that they can't be doing this. What are they thinking? And then, and then call me back and apologize. <laughs> Sorry, I just this little baby undergrad. I don't know. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. Did you get your glasses? Yeah. Oh. Yeah, my glasses just started disintegrating. Oh, no. Oh, yeah, no. but you know, I had, I had to run home and nice. another pair. I always bring a backup pair. Of right. Glasses, you should have glasses, too, but, but, but I forgot them. So far, so Oh, why do you need? Uh, yeah, exactly. And of course. Well, and I forgot my lip stuff at the hotel. Right. Thank goodness you saved me. <laughs> and lunch was greasy, so we're OK. Ugh. Oh, we will be concluding exactly. <clears throat> I realize that people probably weren't so unhappy that I opened my next. You know, this is this group is different. The other two meetings, we had many more people who wrote further people who submit maybe just an outline or left me up, just didn't circulate anything. Yeah. Um, or with uh, like the frame and a couple of case studies. So I don't know whether it's the timing of it that people are able to work. You shamed all of us. Let's also wait closer to you know, the end of the process. That's true, which helps. Mm -hmm. I forget how, how much time do we have? So you will remember oh, okay. um, because everything is staggered, so I won't be able to recite probably a couple of months. In mm -hmm. January. In my, in my January, probably, but maybe it's longer. <clears throat> okay. Mm -hmm. Well, it would be nice to have this before the topic. So for our, our purposes, the most important is the people who are running the machine. So, just um, only they and they are probably. So Celia will translate this because that because we have the extra step of moving to get the translator. Do you know what translate is? Yeah. Oh, is that is that the deal? It works both ways. Yeah. That's But he writes both.
I love the flavor of the red so much. No, yeah. It's like there's Russian and there's Russian. Right. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's very it's so wonderful. Yeah. You know, I think you're very wonderful to install this side as the history of history because he makes assumptions that we should not have been writing for our movies. Yeah, I, I think and I were talking about it, which would be good. I mean, I, I generally our experience is like that a lot is helped by the back and forth after this. So <coughs> everyone will end up getting a note from us, mm -hmm. which condenses all the comments. And we found that a certain amount of reshaping for some of the essays has really been very helpful. Mm -hmm. And I think in this case, particularly if we don't have a written text, mm -hmm. what he'll get from us will end up actually affecting what he writes because he hasn't written. It. Right, right. Um, well, he has to understand that. Yes, you can say more than just the name that you're supposed to write. Right. Oh, so, but I, I also think, I, I personally, in the world the three of us will talk, but I personally think that people that they, it really can't work just to have a secret name. Right. Um, and exactly. even even if you had a lot of gorgeous clothes about each of them, I don't think you can just right. in that kind of encyclopedic well, approach. Right. Right. blind reader is different from well, precisely. Precisely. So he has these instruments, approach. But <laughs> which can only he can he can just put his image in. So the right. clothes doesn't have right. to be in what kind of the space. Right. But, um, the, one of the things that is intriguing, and he's not yet thinking about it, but it came up in the like, discussion about this discussion of the uh, uh, so He kept saying, well, he wasn't regarded as a poet at the time when he was being an intellectual. And I think that's an assumption that we don't necessarily need to make. No, and it's true of a lot of people. Exactly. So they hit the time and you can see. Yeah, so the example of Sibakova is mm -hmm. in some ways the most she, right. she has not written poetry for quite a long time, right. and yet she still counts. She registers in the right. Well, presumably, these weren't the best that they started as a poet. Yeah, the other direction, uh -huh. the other way around. Although I can't remember kind of the other way around. Kind of oh, yeah. Yeah. yeah, versus starting with the prose writer and then yeah. starting. No, it's always the author. That's what Schiff said started to quote people. No, Turgenev started to say, I mean, there are a lot of, but starting with President and doing poetry successfully. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, I think that. Yeah, yeah. 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 Ye
And obviously, with this, you have more than enough to do. But it's an interesting sort of question about, you know, your topic is yeah 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 performance no that's a really good point and um yeah something else that the forwards about that the last minute was kind of interesting so i've thought about whether poets who sort of maybe mm -hmm. like that it's on the it's and what is you talking about people who are referring to it? Well, I'm kind of saying, yeah, this, well, I think we can read what you're talking about, but I would just well, I'm already reading, yeah. but I would just finish the book about modern to kind of like read modern poetry on the side for this and bit of the hour. So I guess kind of think about how it's very good way of thinking about the form of the other side, and that has. Um, and yeah, no, I just definitely um, I my massage therapist has a picture of a woman who's got to be in her 80s standing by a Yeah, that's no more. Actually, I was just reading about how you might just be looking at the performance from this time. I have like like some books from the time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Yeah, he stayed in Far Rock with the Furyuk. So he had to so go he, across. The yeah, he was, yeah, he was yeah, I think, all the way back. He was here for quite a while. Right. So that was, yeah, that was a really thing. Okay. He's been in the city and he fell out. Anything? Only one of the bosses. And you know, I've gathered the point you made why the people sort of have people in the side of them. Is that the point you were making? Um, no, my point is that she sounds like a feminist until she says in uh, in the same essay, I I, I only like um, sort of a women's society in the in the cases of things way and stuff that she such Amazon look and so on. But then has a perfectly feminist argument against Furioso with the way he's presenting. You said about 
Good job. Oh, so, yes, Irina, well, Irina dying in the, um, more than one serious scholar has scolded her in their study, David Bethea is one of them, the Bergen is another, um, for not being sufficiently contrite about her daughter's death. I would really just not give that. That's a response. I mean, it, it, you know what yeah, I'm saying? No, it was, it was, uh, and it's like, <laughs> no, I don't. Sort of people reading satirical political texts. Mm -hmm. Yes. And well, no, when her biography same. takes over. Yeah. And, 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 yeah. Mm -hmm. There's a fabulous essay by Janet Do you know Greg is still looking at us? Can you just send it? Yeah. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Greg is over the finish. Or such a bit more. Absolutely. You know, uh, <clears throat> Chinese people don't really so much. They think that, I don't know, she was like, you know, you've heard the other features. Yeah. 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 But, yeah. You know, not so bad when you've at least already been. Oh, yeah, right. Right. The ones where you're Exactly. Right. Exactly. Yeah. They sort of change slightly, right? But they do that. Yeah. Whenever you even consider them to be your no, no, I think your idea is not dignified with the response. It's, yeah. it's unfortunately yeah. not doing yeah. that. Adam, no what response. What's the response? I don't know. She probably just went to it, but I not <laughs> dignify it. Yeah. Yeah. It is 25, so you mentioned you wrote down. Yes, yes, yes. Because it gives extra to the writers in terms of the yeah. and the yeah. like, yeah. 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 of the writers, and 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 the like it just seems like um much more so than you yeah, she's the one who gets it, whereas Rilke was kind of drawn. <laughs> no doubt, for reasons of it. No, doesn't yet. No, I got your email. <laughs> oh, you know, I don't know. Why. Well, no, I didn't. Yeah. 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 I checked 
complete of a summary is why you just see like all it why do we buy these sentences like super bad so I call it a word for the one side that say the initial without them but it means that the thing and for me to do other that's why we need some extremely fast that's what we need Yep. I said it no, Потому что поэзия без поэзии это есть некоторые... Ну, это еще и комическая поэзия. И скриминаю, с этим рекордом. Артан, без среда, пародия. Ну, это вообще можно... Паркова можно либертен А вот комические стихи. Паркова вообще не было. То есть он был, но тексты не его. Шакил Ахматова или Ахмат написал не Гомера, а другой старик. Это поэт его. Просто как Анастрион, это тоже тип жанра. Да, да, да. Баркова там драмы. А Оды, это не Барков. Чипсо, Я понимаю, да, если все записывают, тогда все, как бы, поэтому надо избранную только мысль записать. Я написал на одну страничку, все не могу вообще ее найти. А ты какой доклад? Я написал вообще умный. А вообще умный. Лучше умный. Другой тем. Все не могу их найти. А ты не помнишь наизусть то, что ты пишешь? Ну, я могу это восстановить, только по мне обидно. Я лучше не на этом сбор, чем я перестану бакан. Я не очень понял. Я тоже не буду. Я вот сейчас я понял. Я не понял, да, ты маленький. Ничего. Вы не один. Все остальное было совершенно понятно. Любы не дянешь. А любы вы Сейчас придется сказать, что Окса принял решение отказаться от этого сказания. Они отказываться не будут. Но как они будут публиковать, это другой вопрос. Как с ним делать? Они еще не вывешивают. Ну, 
All right, so we can begin. Um, we are yeah, part of that chief There's Mila, and there's Kylie. Are they slow? No, they're not slow. They worked like that. They so we begin with Irina writing about verse two. Right. Well, I want to begin with uh, uh, the thanking our two, three leaders, um, um, Stephanie, Nuba, and Kathy, who invited me to participate in this in this. Um, project and uh, who organized this, well, very intense, but very, you know, interesting and rewarding workshop. And I also am uh, grateful to all presenters and uh, people who will offer their comments, um, who spoke, with, you know, uh, before me, because I already have, I, I, I managed to get many uh, pointers, many ideas of how to, to revise and to, I hope, better fit my piece into the entire project, but of course I will await the comments from our leaders. Um, uh, well, uh, as all of us, I've spent two and a half years, is this two and a half? Yeah. Uh, with my topic, and um, also, I guess, like, at least some uh, um, of you I'm still not quite sure I'm entirely uh, comfortable with what I have shared with you. And I will start with, with the term, uh, what, what I'm actually, uh, you know, discussing. Um, uh, and that, that's, I guess, the title of the essay. What, you know, what, what term is best? Fixed forms or verse forms? I kind of like fixed forms more because for me, it determined, but that emphasizes, it stresses the fact that these points are supposed to follow uh, established rule, rules, fixed, well, some fixed rules. So I, I would like to hear what, what other people think about it. Uh, um, what, well, substantially, what you have read is perhaps kind of historical sketch of fixed or verse forms in Russian literary tradition. And, um, and the first question here is what actually constitutes a fixed form? Mm -hmm. Well, the first question is whether this historical or somewhat historical overview really fits the rest of the, it should be you know, kept or somehow rearranged. Uh, well, then the second question uh, is, what actually constitutes fixed form? Um, there are many um, phenomena on the kind of margins that would be included or excluded. Let's say the allergy, like the classical allergy, of course, I guess, the fixed form, right? Mm -hmm. uh, whereas in Russian tradition, the allergy never really was fixed form. Or the, or the old, same question. Uh, and look like the magical, I guess there is no doubt that it should, like, well, I, at least I didn't have any doubt that they should not be included in the mm -hmm. Russian tradition. There is no rules. It's not like Chaucer, Russian kidnap is their Chaucer. It's just a complimentary little point. But I ended up not, not discussing allergy and all uh, 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 as well. Uh, you know, I, I hope I it was not an error, it was not a mistake. Uh, on the other hand, is the contemporary sonnet uh, still fixed form? Um, um, uh, is it fixed in form anymore? Uh, um, the since the uh, um, since the uh, 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 beginning with with nineteen uh, seventies. Uh, um uh, the uh, uh the, the, i lost my oh uh, yeah beginning with 19, 1970s the very essence of writing sonnets became 
reconstructing them. Mm -hmm. um, and as Natalia Azarova writes, Sonnet was принимает как идеальный объект деконструкции. Само присутствие слова сонет в заглаве предполагает семачек, семачку отрицания твердой формы. So uh, uh, it, it is kind of disintegrating, but um, uh, I definitely, the, 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 well, I, I am not ready to exclude the uh, uh, contemporary sonnet because in order to deconstruct it, we first need something very, you know, firmly established. So I, I think it still qualifies uh, uh, as, as a fixed or form. Um, on the other hand, or, or third hand, I'm not sure yet already, um, the list of the fixed forms I, I in my essay can be questioned. Maybe it is too inclusive, like quintets and set, set tets, are they really fixed forms? Um, I guess Gleb Garbowski would uh, say yes, because he used these forms extensively. One of the few people who did really use it very, um, uh, very um, uh, often. Uh, but perhaps this list, actually the list is not complete. For instance, um, just recently I discovered what seems to be an emerging fixed form called pirashki, mm -hmm. or sometimes spelled erashki uh, with sharp. Um, and, and there is, of course, a website with uh, Pirashki, and uh, I, I quote from the site is Pirazov представляет собой четверостише, написанное четырехстопным ямбом по схеме 9898, без рифмы, без знаков припинания, и строчными русскими буквами. And the, 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 this form has history, it has, you know, the, the first person who invented it is known as Vladislav uh, uh, Kungurov, um, who just he died in May of this year. Um, and uh, the Spirashki, it is not only on the internet, there, there are several volumes published in, in book form. I'm not sure what publishing out that they, they went to, maybe they were self-published, but they, they exist in book form. And some of them are really, are really kind of nice. I, I like them. I outside one, my favorite. Мое колечко потускнело, его я чистить понесла, а старый мастер вдруг заплакал, достал такое же свое. So you know what do I do? Do I include it? Uh, it's an emerging form. I mean, not the particular form, but the form itself. And maybe if we are really, you know, kind of. Not, not starting with the with the you know well, but focusing on the closest time to us time. Maybe it would be good, like interest to my topic, uh, to 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 talk about uh, the fact that the forms are still alive and still like uh, produce new examples. On the okay, what what hand for? I, maybe there are other forms that I just did not happen to, I mean, emerging forms that I haven't looked to discover. So if anyone knows about it, please tell me. Uh, well, I, I guess uh, finally, uh, this, well, somewhat historical uh, overview um, does not focus on maybe the, the most it's not, not important, but maybe idiosyncratic and thus um, um, interesting practitioners like Alexey Rzevsky in the 18th century. Uh, he experimented with, with sonnet form and he um, uh, wrote sonnets on pre selected rhymes, three way sonnets, but he also um, composed very idiosyncratic and actually intricate. It, it, really interesting rondas. And for the 20th century, uh, such figure, maybe even more interesting, was Alexander Kondratov, a uh, linguist, a biologist, mathematician, and a poet, who wrote like, like almost probably in every, every form. Mm -hmm. uh, Rwanda, the ballads, the, like, it's very intricate, interesting, difficult form, uh, pretty, 
um, Arctic poems with an envoy and a very complicated rhyming scheme. He also wrote Terzurima, Ghazal, Stanka, Haifu, everything. And, um, uh, it, you know, but do you, well, Mikhail Gasparov knew his work mm -hmm. and, you know, cites him often probably for the same reason I am interested in it because it's so, um, so interesting, but on the other hand, who else, you know, knows him and whether it is, you know, even necessary to, you know, bring him into the canon. Um, and uh, the, 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 the Rzewski, wonders were dismissed by Gasparov. He, he read, um, he interpreted them as the disintegration of, of this intricate form. Even though I believe that Rzewski knew the form and he just was playing with it in, in pretty complicated and um, consistent way. The, the, the forms are different, but within the form, it's everything is very consistent. Ah. So, right. So, you know, should I, like, I don't know, crowd out a little bit Brodsky and Stepanova and include Kondratov and emphasize, I don't know, Rzewski? Um, well, I suppose my, this, well, sort of history of fixed form, sketchy as it is, probably would be useful for graduate students. <laughs> um, but I haven't found uh, how to treat these forms, well, theoretical, general ways, so how to, make sense of them, um, how to define them even. Mm -hmm. um, um, and and I, I've looked for works that would offer some theoretical discussion or at least some definition of the form. I, of course, I, I failed to, to find them. Maybe I did not look to, you know, if you know anything, I would be very grateful for the pointers, but usually what you, have is a pretty simplistic description, and then and then like a list of like um, uh, Oxford Dictionary Dictionary of Literary Terms, a general term for uh, any given arrangement of metrical verse verse lines into a poem sequence of stanzas or a sticky form along with its its rhyme scheme, if any, and then examples to follow. Kvitkovsky, uh, like the same, твердой формы стиха, условный термин, установившийся за такими стихотворениями из трофической формы, как сонет, руанда, триолет, сектина, сектина большая, и пр. Okay. <laughs> so I would say that maybe the most theoretical approach can be found in Igor Severianin and his mm -hmm. theory of versification, where he uh, puts uh, all this, discusses all the forms under or my stylistic care, which introduces a new territory, but at least in some, yeah. Um, so if you, if you have some suggestions for me where to look and what to read, I will be definitely grateful. Mm -hmm. So um, um, to, start, to sum up, here are the questions I still need to, to, to think about. Um, how, how should I look at that fixed form? Can they be seen as genre? Um, can fixed forms be understood as compositional form? Do I need to look at them as in, in the context of theory of versification, like, um, uh, like Severianin or Yuri Arlitsky, who it, it discusses them in his very useful book, but again, he does not discussed and what they are, he just goes through the history and, and inserts it in, in every period he discusses, inserts some discussion of fixed form. Um, and, um, uh, and maybe uh, even more importantly, how can we interpret the code's, code's desire for additional, additional to the rules of, you know, the writing poetry already? requires a more restrictive rule, like this is an additional set of rules that is imposed on poetry. Um, looking at 
uh, the poetry that adds rules to, you know, initial rules, we, we can name like pat pat pattern poetry. Maybe there I can, although, you know, I read books that I, I'm not sure it would be useful, but at least it is, you know, somewhat similar um, uh, phenomenon. Um, so at, then if there are additional rules and we want to impose more rules, then how we account for the simultaneous relentless impulse to resist this rule. Mm -hmm. It starts in the 18th century, like Tudikovsky establishes the ideal uh, sonnet and so Morocco starts, uh, uh, um, starts like uh, well, of deconstructing but changing and disregarding these rules. And of course his argument is that, well, if these rules are not good rules, my rules are much better, but still the impulse is there, and it continues as I as I as I mentioned. Um, so I guess I'll stop here and ask for your comments and and yeah, and you already yeah, I, I hoped you will. <laughs> yeah. So um, I have a suggestion. Uh, thank you so much. This is really a great question and. Um, um, one suggestion is there is an article by Barry Sher from 2006 called Structural Dynamics in the Onegin Stanza. Um, and for him, what he is looking at is this tension between how you split the stanza according to rhyming, which is four, four, four plus two, versus how you split it based on syntax. And there is tension between these two. Um, so he does it using generative constraints and kind of, you know, generative, a little bit optimality theory style analysis, but it's really comprehensible in that article. But what he builds on, that analysis is built on insights from Leonid Grossman from 1924. Uh, from Bayevsky, and I think Bayevsky worked a lot on that in, in kind of computational terms. So he has a bibliography and there is Stankiewicz. Anyway, I think Tomaszewski from 1958. So working all on that same issue of tensions. Um, so I think, oh yeah, Kirill Postautinko worked on this as well. So, um, I think, you know, that article may kind of be a nice theoretical right. start with, whether you take, you know, the constraint type style of analysis or look at his predecessors. Right. Thank you. Well, I, I know um, uh, Grossman's work. It's not not useful. It's <clears throat> like very, there's not, you know, he's practitioner and he mostly like, you know, say, includes his, his son. <laughs> refers to his predecessors, but without much analysis, but yeah. And which, but, is I, why, which is why Barry departed from that and yeah. wanted to bring some new theory to it. But I think it was kind of like an initial point for him. Um, anyway, you. you're welcome. Okay, three quick things. I love the idea of including PhD. I think even if it's a, a novelty genre, if people are writing in it, thought number two, you write in a genre, you're partly participating in a game, you're interacting with Pierre Ronsard when you read a sonnet, because he did, even if or you mm. barely know that. Mm -hmm. And I think the sonnet in particular, as, as you said, people are breaking it apart because it's maybe the smallest complex poetic structure where you can immediately look and say, okay, that's 14 lines, I see what they're doing. But I also I wanted, to, wanted to ask you about whether you would consider, and maybe you don't need to, a poet who evolves a restricted genre and imposes it on himself like Yudhiyomian, mm -hmm. who has mm -hmm. these mm -hmm. rusty mm -hmm. In the beginning, they rhyme and they're more formal, and then they stop writing, but the eight lines continued, I think, to the very end. Mm -hmm. Thank you. This is, this is great. Yes, I yeah, I, I'm happy to include Pirashki. And the games, you're absolutely right. Well, 18th century, I guess, uh, um, it's less playful except for Revsky. Mm. Right, but and 19th century, which is there, the many, 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 many sonnets and other 
forms were produced in, in 19th century, but it, in general, it is the least, least productive period. Mm -hmm. um, although some, like Catanian, for some reason, like sometimes you, you wrote se several rondas in his later, yeah. later years. Selling this song. Right. Mm -hmm. At least two, maybe mm -hmm. more. So yes, and then uh, of course the Silver, Silver Age, the games and um, uh, like exchanging uh, for the writing of the sonnet, and then you you have to respond to it in the same rhymes and so on. Yeah, games are very yeah. Okay, good. Yeah, well, um, thank you for the paper, and I think mm -hmm. actually you know it's like yeah, extremely useful for a graduate student or even non graduate student yeah. just in terms of having that history, which, um, yeah, we learned a lot. Um, in terms of, I don't know if this is useful, like what you're thinking about, but um, it's interesting what you said about the, you know, these forms having kind of more and more rules, um, sort of like adding rules to poetry, and yet it seems that um, in some ways it makes it easier, right? And so I'm just thinking of remembering and like, grade school when they make you write high cues or something. Yes. So it's just like an easy way to generate poetry. And I love that example you had about the online um, mm -hmm. high cues. But uh but but then just thinking more generally about kind of like the role of imagination or um in in together with these forms. There's a Robert House has a book called A Little Book on Form, which mm -hmm. is kind of like all these different fixed forms and he talks about it in terms of kind of imagination and mm -hmm. instincts interacting with those rules so maybe as a different kind of um sort you know uh reading material that mm -hmm. might be okay thank you i'll thank you oh well, yeah, a couple of different comments one um barry share also has an article on sonnet i'll send you the, the, the mm -hmm. reference it's actually very useful um, mm -hmm. but one of the things he does i believe in that article <clears throat> and i believe also in the Heine against Stanza article, it, it is to show that the um, sonnet and the Heine against Stanza are different things. Um, yeah, and I, I, yeah, they 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 really are different things. And among other, but among other things, um, what what I don't think comes out in, in the essay, but maybe it doesn't. I just missed it. Um, or you, you mentioned it, but it's uh, I think in a sort of fleeting way, which is that the Shakespearean sonnet. Made almost no inroads into Russia, and it would be interesting it, yes, to know yeah, when it first right. appears. But I, but but Pushkin almost certainly didn't know it existed. That's the best well, reason she, for saying that. There's... She he wrote, you know, three sonnets. I, I, I know very well. Yeah, they do. Did you see that they just discovered that the Korean translated version of his sonnet? I saw. No, I did that. see that. Oh, yeah. And, yeah. And, and and it was published. Uh, it's it's just, just, I think. I I, I, I also and just came across it. And then it was a broken link, and so I yeah. Not. Yeah, yeah, I saw that. I saw that also. Maybe but. it was a mystery. <laughs> 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 it was on the ceiling. It was an oh, well, the panola. She gave us a link to go to, and then and and we, we, we could work all But you could probably yeah. write a lot. Uh -huh. and she but but anyway, the, the the point I was making was simply that there's absolutely no indication that Pushkin was aware that the Shakespeare and Sonnet existed before he wrote the ending and stands there. And I, so I think it's mm -hmm. that as a source of ending and stands. Okay. Sounds ridiculous. And this idea of the Pushkin Sonnet, which I also have found online, seems to have been invented by some American hmm. sort of enthusiasts rather than scholars. So I, I think it, if you want to say, you know, sometimes misleadingly labeled which mm -hmm. the Pushkin okay. Sonnet is fine, but but I, I don't right. think it, if, if you look closely, there's really okay. no reason that that was the source. And the more con con convincing Explanation, in my opinion, is that it comes from the Bodic stance, but mm -hmm. just adding another side. Mm -hmm. um, that was uh, Shakir. Oh, there was a I, I can't remember if there's an article on it, right? Yeah, right. there's an article on it. But it's pretty No, Shak yes. So Shapir found the exact equivalent of a Anagin stanza minus or plus two lines in a late 18th century ode. So the exact right. rhyming, but plus two. But, but someone also found the actual. And you can stand in an 18th, completely obscure 18th century poem, but that's just a coincidence. Yeah, yeah. I mean, there's yeah, no Nabokov, way that Pushkin would have known that. Can you send me the, the, the permission? The yeah, 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 Shapir, yeah, I haven't, yeah, I have to find it. Yeah, I, I, I remember reading it 20 years ago. Yeah, oh, right. yeah, yeah, but, but it exists. But yeah. Find it, but yeah, yeah, but anyway, so, so that's one thing, but, but the other, just in a completely different direction I, that I want, again, as sort of for the editors, um, rather than um, to the, you know, because the, I, just, I just don't know, but uh, um, if there's no discussion elsewhere, 
Dawood expands it in this entire handbook. It seems weird to be talking about Gazals and nowhere mentioned. That there's an Odic stanza, right? So as, as long as it's covered somewhere, that's fine. But but I would say that at least it, it would be nice to see something about the 18th century and the insistence on strict forms, that, that the normative poetics. You know, maybe one doesn't need, you know, a huge thing, but if it's not in the handbook elsewhere, it seems like it should it should well, be somewhere. So Hans Müller was writing his ah. timelines where time, in timelines we think about periodization and her charge was to think about the categories of classicism and enlightenment and how they were misaligned and aligned with the history of poetry. And so of course, once you think about classicism, you think about form and right. you know, the, the genre. Right, when you have, if you have her, uh, as there's not in that kind. Okay. Maybe you can, you know, send me if not in diary, but it's, yeah. it's it. and if you know I'm convinced about the Anegan Panza, it would be easy to maybe yeah insert that and then connect. Sure, it, it wouldn't even take a lot of words. Mm -hmm. yeah. The mention of the uh, old stanza from the native language, right? Ballad, 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 to say, yes, they, well, ballad, because of the genre, who is like no more new art. <laughs> <laughs> so it's one of the most important genres of Russian poetry. <laughs> uh, <laughs> the next picture. <laughs> yeah. mm -hmm. <laughs> what? I think. Okay. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah I was happy. Yeah. It does sort of go um, piggyback on some of the things that were just said. So I was just thinking, you know. How how might you otherwise structure the the essay? Um, and uh, you yourself sort of start telling a story about the Sunny mm -hmm. when you know you, you, you notice oh there really isn't much writing of sonnets until Silver Age. Why is that? And then there's this explosion. And um, so uh, I think that there's something in what uh, uh, Simona said about play, and there's something important about the fact that Kuzmin is taking on this weird mm -hmm. project, mm -hmm. which is that maybe there's this um, sort of paradoxical turn to critical forms as a way of reinventing poetry, right? It's this moment where you're, you know, certainly at the level of meter, there's a lot of, Mm -hmm. New stuff going on. It's just as a as a right. as a way to push mm -hmm. forward the, the right. invention of new forms. It, it's you know it's pretty clear that um, uh, these you know fixed forms or whatever I try I always attract attention when people are thinking about formal formal um, aspects of poetry. Like mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Um, so in you know, he was you know, playful, but playful, but, but he, he was thinking about it. And it, 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 of course, the symbol is the silver age is very much interested in, in form. And the present, like, I don't know, beginning, like late, um, 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 uh, um, what, what was the previous age? 20, <laughs> it is, uh, uh, Century, 20th century, there is again uh, uh, interest in form, right? mm -hmm. and, and particularly now, and the form uh, is changing from more traditional to much, much less traditional. Maybe the, the construction of these fixed forms are you know, also connected to this um, interest is in, in reforming, reforming mm -hmm. poetry. Yeah, okay, thank you. Yeah, uh, a couple of points. Uh, first one is that there are some fixed uh, forms in a parallel world of literature, in folklore, in contemporary folklore, they change. Chistushki, for example. Right. Or Sadiski Stishki, which mm -hmm. have a, a really distinct. Um, yeah, uh, they're very strict. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so it's like Limerick. Yeah. Uh, and Limerick actually uh, is good. More and more popular. Oh yeah, yeah. 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 It's like parallel mm -hmm. uh, um, um, uh, suggests. And uh, another point is: Can we think of monastir as a fixed form? Because yeah, there is one requirement. <laughs> the only one. This is the one line. Mm -hmm. 
But yeah, there was a dissertation. Well, yes, yeah, there was a dissertation. Well, then, uh, then, uh, there were collections actually of um, the monastic. So it is an artifact. Well, I don't know. What do you think? <laughs> <laughs> I, I think this is minimalism. I, I think that's crazy. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Not a lengthy discussion, a, a discussion um, precisely in proportion to the length of the poem. Right. Yeah, or maybe just moving from longer poems to shorter, 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 with the vice versa, from modest things to the other thing can finish with the zeros. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. See, yeah. But there is a five each one. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And uh, and I think it's completely like uh, stylistically uh, quotations, hmm. also poetic, which are interesting. That's what made Gaspar's book. Uh, uh, so we just these examples, uh, just delicious, uh, like the feast of uh, fixed forms. If, if he speaks about fixed uh, forms, just a couple of really, uh, yeah, uh, poems. With the discussion why, for example, uh, this poem is so characteristic of the age of modernism. Just to historicize and then. Or where the fixture and where the breakdown. So some kind of a texture. And in terms of uh, 18th century or early 19th century, well, I know that uh, Graf Mitri Vanch Pastor wrote all this, ran to us. Uh, um, Ballad, uh, uh, sonnet, of course, sonnet, uh, some of his sonnet, 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 sonnets, fables, which uh, are all uh, uh, structural uh, uh, requirements. He was obsessed with it. So there is some kind of obsession with poetry, which is manifested uh, by this fixation on uh, fixed uh, forms, as if you test uh, what you can do by subjecting yourself uh, to, the, uh, uh, to the rules, and if you can transcend them and to create an original poem by many my stuff. Yeah, it's, it's, yeah. It's, it's, exactly. And um, yeah, what I was just thinking, um, and thank God you talk a lot about the fact that so many of these forms were kind of through translation. And I wondered mm -hmm. whether that um definitely in terms of like Silver Age, right? That's kind of yeah. one reason that they become so common through so um uh and just thinking about the priest of monastic as well like wasn't that there's some story where that was just a translation he started and then kind of couldn't be bothered to keep on going so um mm -hmm. but i don't know how true that is mm -hmm. uh but yeah it just seems that was the antiquity that you would find this thing you know fragments of verse so why not just start laying out all right well I, I have to think about honesty. In order to have rules, you need some secrets, right? Mm -hmm. So if there is one rule, one line, then help stick to this. Rules can also be generated and verified by a tradition. So as long as you have a tradition, I mean, if you, if you can have an anthology of Munosti, then you have something. It would be that way, is it? Right, I yes, yeah, but like, this is different. This is yeah. I keep thinking about your question about you know, yeah. first of all, I want to say that I think fixed forms, even though it's not maybe a usual category that we accept, is actually, I agree with you, it's much better than verse forms. Because when you say verse forms, the expectations yeah. are rather broad. Right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And and then um, and then there's a kind of disappointment and yeah. what you're given and the laundry. <laughs> right. uh, whereas with fixed form, you understand yeah. that this is a particular angle. Um, and so what is this an angle on? Um, I think what the handle can, you know, the way I I like to think about it is that it's a historical experiment. We never leave this. In the beginning uh, of our conference, um, an experiment in thinking how to write history specifically of poetry. Uh, I think history of literature and history of poetry are slightly different things because poetry historicizes itself mm -hmm. different mm -hmm. through, um, you know, a different contextual imagination, mm -hmm. through a different adherence to form. Mm -hmm. And so I think, in fact, your piece aligns with that problem. We don't, I don't think we have in the history of prose, but I might be simplified. 
but I don't think we have such an, um, an incredible commitment to fixation. Mm -hmm. And within it, experimentation. 